Good morning. I would like to welcome everyone to the 11th annual uh, Specialized Care of the Young Athlete Sports Medicine Conference, Current Concepts in Sports Medicine. Uh, this morning, um, and actually into the afternoon a little bit, we have a lot of great speakers and we're very excited to bring this conference to you. Um, this is something we've always liked to do annually and then last year, of course, we didn't get to do it. We wish we could all be together because there's a lot of great conversation and collaboration that usually happens at our conference, but we're hopeful that um, through the chat, we can still have a lot of really great questions. Um, and most of us will be here throughout the day to answer those questions, you know, as a group like we normally do, which I think will be really great for um, everyone who's tuned in. So um, I want to just uh, give a couple of thank yous and shout outs. Um, our conference coordinator this year was Dr. Randon Hall, who many of you know, and he's done the conference before. So I wanted to just thank him for all the time that he's put into getting uh, CME taken care of and just putting um, all the, the conference together. And then um, I also just wanted to uh, thank Megan McDaniel, our administrative assistant, who has really done a lot of the behind the scenes work to get everything uh, kind of taken care of, um, to get things going. And then lastly, um, Matt Martinez, who is our IT guru, who um, hopefully will get everything uh, going smoothly for us uh, this morning. So just so that you are aware, all of the talks have been pre-recorded. Um, this usually decreases a lot of IT issues and other things that we can have throughout the time. So um, if you um, have questions, please, please just type them into the chat. Um, I will be moderating the first half of the morning. Um, and then after that, Dr. Hall is going to take over and kind of finish off the conference for the last few talks. Um, we are going to try to have question and answer after each talk. Um, Dr. Bowman, unfortunately, was not able to join us today, but he does have his talk. And so we'll still do the Q&A for him. And then if there are any questions that um, one of us don't know, we'll go ahead and forward those on to him and get back to you. So uh, please put those in the chat as the presentation goes on and as we wind the presentation down. Um, there is a... Um, updated schedule, uh, just so you know, as we looked at kind of timings of presentations and other things, uh, we went ahead and got that together. Um, and then lastly, all of you should receive an email after the conference with the evaluation. Please fill that evaluation out. Uh, for those of you who are providers, that is how you're going to get your uh, CME. Um, and um, so as soon as you fill that out, we'll be able to send that back to you and get that taken care of. Um, with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, let uh, Dr. Bowen's presentation roll. Good morning. My name is Eric Bowman. I am one of the physicians here at Phoenix Children's Sports Medicine. Thank you so much for attending the conference. And uh, let's get things kicked off here with a talk on heat illness. So when it comes to addressing heat illness and, and problems associated with heat, why do we see these things keep happening? I, I think the, the issue is, is that oftentimes uh, our athletes and our young athletes are expected to push too hard or too long or spend too much time in their uniform or, or they get out there too soon, especially here in Arizona with some of the summer heat for, for fall sports. Um, and, and, and quite honestly, they don't have uh, sufficient time to recover. So uh, we see these things uh, weighing on them and having them uh, become injured from that. So uh, one of the big questions that, that comes up is, are there differences between children, adolescents, and adults when it comes to exercising in the heat? And, and perhaps there is. Uh, 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 the old school of thought was that, you know, young people had a greater surface area to body mass ratio. Uh, they produced more metabolic heat per mass unit. There were lower sweating capacities and required a greater core temp to start to sweat. But, but the AAP came out with a statement in 2011 that actually said, you know, children can tolerate and adapt to exercise in heat as well as similarly fit adults as long as adequate hydration is maintained. The statement that came out in 2000 said, actually, we think some of these other issues that I mentioned a second ago might be a problem. And so kids should, should definitely not uh, participate in heat quite as much. But, but again, recent research has shown that children and adults can have similar physiologic responses when exercising under the same conditions. So again, looking at fitness level and hydration though is a big component of that. I think other things that we have to take into account are pre-existing conditions that can contribute to heat-related illness. Now, this list is a fairly extensive list and what you're gonna find is there are some very you know, adult listed things on here, but there are also some, some pediatric specific things on here. And I just wanted to touch on a few of these that, that can affect, right? 
Um, we know that unfortunately some of our population have eating disorders or anorexia. We know that that can absolutely uh, contribute to this. Uh, dehydration, which I'll elaborate more on here in a moment. We also know that if you're coming off of some sort of a febrile illness or, or a GI issue with vomiting and diarrhea, that's going to affect your fluid and electrolyte balance. A lack of fitness, which unfortunately is, is a real problem. Um, and then other things like sunburn, right? Uh, we just aren't able to regulate that heat loss quite as effectively. Um, and similarly with that URI, we're not gonna be able to regulate with some of our um, uh, hydro or our, our fluid loss through uh, respiratory droplets. So these are things that I think are important to, to kind of figure out ahead of time if someone's dealing with. I also think it's important to understand that there's certain medications that can contribute to heat-related illness. Now, some of these, again, don't seem to apply to a, a pediatric population that much, but, but I think you'll have to know if any of these are on board. You know, for example, alcohol. Our, you know, our population, unfortunately, we have adolescents who, who are maybe consuming alcohol before legal age, as well as you know, collegiate athletes who, who are consuming that alcohol as well, and that can definitely relate um, to some heat illnesses, potentially. Uh, things like antihistamines are a big player in there as well. So, um, and then some of our antidepressants. So those are things that are important to, to recognize and remember. So let's just do a very brief physiology review here, kind of 101 here. Again, heat regulation. So early in exercise, what we know happens is that we have heat production that is greater than heat loss. So that is increasing our core body temperature. And in the process of doing that, the hypothalamus will sense that and stimulate the sympathetic response. That will then lead to sweating and increased skin vasodilation, which help us with heat loss and to dissipate our heat. Now, when we talk about heat loss, there are two different types or main types of heat loss. There's non-evaporative heat loss and evaporative heat loss. Non-evaporative heat loss, again, is kind of demonstrated here. So that's the convection, right? That's the way that we have uh, the, the, the wind blowing by, the air movement, right? That's one of the ways we can, can lose heat. Conduction, right? For example, water is a great conductor of heat. So at direct contact through conduction. And then there's just true radiation. So feeling that, that sun, feeling that uh, heat coming off of something, that's our radiation. And so we can feel the radiation of heat off of someone if, if they're really warm. But then we also have the evaporative heat loss, which I think we rely on quite a bit. Uh, and again, this is heat that's transferred by evaporation of sweat and respiratory moisture. Now, it's important to remember that evaporative heat loss is indirectly related to humidity. So knowing the amount of moisture in the air is very helpful in determining how much evaporative cooling you can count on. Now, what are some of the physiologic effects of heat? Well, what we know happens with heat is we know that we can get an increase in core temperature. We can also have an increase in fluid and electrolyte loss increased carbohydrate use. We also know that it takes less time to get fatigued when we're, we're working in heat and we have a decreased performance in heat. Now, these changes, these effects will lead to potential risk of heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke, which we'll talk about more in a little bit here. So what about the effects of progressive dehydration, right? What if we're not keeping those food levels up? Well, similarly to heat, we see that the heart rate will go up and the core temperature will go up as well. We also see that we get some increased fatigue. So as you can see, dehydration and heat, very similar uh, in the body's response and, and how it responds to both of those things. I think the big question that I get a lot is, is water enough, right? Should we drink in water? Do we need to be drinking other things or is water enough? Well, I think one of the things that's important to see here is that Water sometimes isn't enough. And so this is just a quick little case example here that I, I wanted to kind of show you. Uh, I, I'm using a 175 pound offensive football lineman here. Now, I think unfortunately we know that uh, 175 pounds can be small for some of our offensive linemen nowadays, right? I think a lot of our high school uh, linemen are 225, even 250 or more. Um, and so some of these numbers can just be even higher than this. But for this case, we're gonna say 175 pound offensive lineman Let's just say his sweat rate is 2.1 liters per hour. And let's say his sodium loss is at about, about 3,090 milligrams of sodium per hour. If he does a four hour practice, either all at once or two, two a days that are two hours each um, uh, with practice, he'll lose a total of about 8.4 liters of sweat and over 12,000 milligrams of sodium. Now, let's say he's trying to be really good about his hydration intake and he's drinking up to a liter per hour, right? of his Gatorade, right? That's gonna get him about four liters of fluid and 3,200 milligrams of sodium, right? He's being really conscious about hydration. 
if he, even drinking four liters over the course of four hours, he is still gonna have a deficit of 5.5% of his body weight and over 9,000 milligrams of sodium. So when we have extended workout periods, we can see how water may not be enough, right? So when we look at these estimated hydration needs, basically we're looking at about one milliliter per kilocalorie, okay? Now, one of the things, again, in addition to water are, are, are sports drinks. That's, I think, the common thing out there. And when we look at a sports drink, we want to make sure that we focus on well-balanced diets to maintain electrolytes and carbohydrates even before we start having a conversation about sports drinks. Making sure that these young athletes are eating appropriate diets. They're not living on McDonald's and Taco Bell and soda and that sort of thing, okay? We wanna make sure that they're really getting a good balanced diet in there. We also need to understand that sports drinks really are only used during exercise. I think one of the things I, I, I give credit to the marketing departments of sports drinks is that they've marketed themselves as healthy. And so I have a lot of young people who come in and go, yeah, I drink three or four Gatorades a day. But when you look at the amount of carbohydrates and sugar in those Gatorades, oftentimes you might as well be drinking a soda because they're getting so many calories with that. You know, I think the important thing to understand is that these sports drinks are really only needed with about an hour or more of exercise. Anything less than that, water's still going to be our main thing. We don't need the sports drink. So want to make sure that we get that message across as well, because I don't want these young people getting sports drinks because they think they're healthy and getting a bunch of extra sugar they don't necessarily need. But as we look at the sports drinks, we also want to see that they're going to be about 50 to 70 calories with about 13 to 18 grams of carbohydrate per eight ounce serving. The nutrition label will read roughly about six to eight percent of the carbohydrate needs um, per serving. The other thing that's out there to replace fluids and electrolytes is Pedialyte. Now, traditional Pedialyte's been around for a really long time, and a lot of athletes have taken advantage of that. But some of you may have noticed in the last year or so, we started getting the new kind of Pedialyte sport. And I'll talk about that in a second here on how those two compare. So as far as hydration goes, what do we want to do? Well, first of all, we want to avoid dehydration, right? This has an effect on our performance, right? And again, this will vary with training intensity, climate, uh, uh, an individual's sweat, intrinsic sweat rate, uh, and their acclimatization to exercise. There's no specific research in athletic children for optimal standards. So what we know across the board, the absolute best way to maintain adequate hydration is what we call the way in, way out method, right? Now, if you're at a facility or a collegiate program, for example, that has access to specific gravity, that can be utilized as well. But way in, way out is definitely the best method, which I'll talk about more in just a second. So the complaint I get a lot of time when it comes to hydration is, Doc, I just don't like water. It's boring. It doesn't taste good. I'd rather drink something else, right? And so I think ways we can try to help promote hydration is to increase that desire to drink is, is to make it more appealing, right? So add flavor to the water. Now, I'm not necessarily adding a bunch of these, these artificial sweeteners and that sort of thing. I'm going to try to add, you know, natural things. So I'm going to add grapes or strawberries or kiwi or cucumbers, things that people like the flavor of, right? Try to help that. Um, you can also consider doing a water-based uh, homemade ice pop, right? Throw a little fruit in there, a water-based type pop, and that's something that can be refreshing, especially on a nice hot summer day. And then looking at, you know, utilizing fruit that's really high in water content. I think the number one thing that comes to mind for most people is watermelon. Uh, if you can get them to eat watermelon, that's a great, you know, sweet treat for a lot of people, but still has a ton of water in it. So here's a table I just wanted to kind of present with you guys to look at, you know, the various different types of, of kind of sports drinks or, or electrolyte rehydration options that are out there. You know, and there's, there's several options here, and these are all per eight ounce serving, which again, it's important to remember that most of our bottles of, of Gatorade or otherwise are, are going to be closer to 16 or 20 ounces, so double these numbers. Um, but, but again, the common ones I think people are most familiar with, Gatorade, Pedialyte's kind of in the middle of the chart there, and then I added at the bottom the newer Pedialyte Sport, which again, if you compare it to the traditional Pedialyte, it's a little higher in sodium, a little higher in potassium, roughly about the same on carbohydrates and calories. And then, you know, just for reference in here, one of the old uh, things that were recommended was drink some pickle juice, right? So I just kind of threw on there uh, what, what a dill pickle juice serving eight, oun eight ounces shows, you know, with sodium and uh, uh, potassium and otherwise. So just kind of so you have that reference. So dehydration, right? Uh, by definition, it's a loss of water and electrolytes from the body. What are the main causes? Oftentimes it's exercise 
or not consuming enough fluids or getting enough fluids into the system, right? Remember the human body is 55 to 65% fluid, right? So what's lost in sweat must be replaced in order to perform optimally and safely, right? And that's the key, right? We gotta make sure if it's lost, we gotta get it back in there. So dehydration is a major risk factor for other heat illnesses, such as heat cramps, heat exhaustion and heat stroke. So that's the other reason why dehydration is such a big deal. So one of the other things I think that's really important to remember is we wanna prevent dehydration, right? We don't prevent dehydration by chugging a bunch of water at our athletic event or our competition. We need to prevent dehydration by preparing for that earlier that day, day before, two days before. It's really important, right? So we really need to educate parents, coaches, and athletes that we need to make sure we're matching our fluid intake with our sweat and urine losses on a daily basis, right? Um, we wanna prehydrate before that activity. Again, we wanna keep that, that urine a clear to a light yellow color, right? I'll jokingly tell my patients, you know, hey, if your urine's the color of apple juice or, or you know, even Mountain Dew, not okay. You gotta get that water intake in there even higher, right? And again, as I mentioned before, we're not focusing on hydrating with the sports drinks or Pedialytes. We focus on hydrating ahead of time with water. We want to avoid sodas, caffeinated beverages, energy drinks, alcohol, drugs. These are all things that we know can lead to higher rates of dehydration and other conditions. And we want to make sure we eat. Eating will help us to maintain proper fluid balances and electrolyte balances and that sort of thing, right? So that's going to be the big thing that we want to see there. So, Again, we prehydrate. That's our best way, the prevention. But what do we do during activity? Well, it's important to understand that sweat rates differ for everyone. And it's hard to suggest a fluid intake to make sure that it satisfies everyone's needs. So a recommendation that you'll hear out there is to consume about 200 to 300 mLs of fluid every 15 minutes during exercise, right? That'll get you just at about that liter mark, maybe just a bit shy of it, okay? Now, that can be great and that can be helpful, but as we saw in our case earlier, it may not be enough, all right? So what's the goal? We wanna drink fluids according to the amount that's lost through sweating, right? How do we tell? Well, I talked about that weigh in, weigh out method earlier. That's what we do. We weigh before practice, we weigh after practice. And the difference between those two recordings is how much water weight is lost during exercise. So our goal is to hydrate enough during the exercise that that number beforehand and that number after are as close as they possibly can be, right? With only minimal losses on the way out. So how do we rehydrate after activity? Well, again, way in, way out determines how much we've lost through sweat. What we then wanna do is we wanna make sure that we drink enough to replace what was lost before the next practice, right? So this is where, for example, two-a-days with football can be very challenging. So if we have a practice in the morning and a practice in the evening, we need to make sure within that day we're hydrating enough, right? Uh, if practice isn't until the next day, it's a little easier to do and we can still achieve it, but we got to make sure that we do it. So what we want to do is weigh in again before that next practice and compare those numbers to the previous way out. Basically, if there's greater than a 3% difference, the athlete should not practice until that uh, difference returns to a pretty much equal way out to weigh in number. And the goal on this is we want to maintain less than a 2% weight change on successive days. The other thing that's critically important here is I think it is just so vital to relay the message to our athletes that preseason and two a days is not the time to try to lose weight. I have, I have especially offensive or defensive linemen who come in here and go, yeah, I'm just, you know, kind of, kind of lazy over the summer, but I'm going to use oh, preseason, man. I can drop my 20 pounds, right? That is not the time to try to do that, right? We want to make sure we maintain that adequate hydration. So let's talk about some different conditions that can come about from heat and fluid and electrolyte imbalances. So first of all, I just want to talk about muscle cramps, all right? Um, these are also sometimes called heat cramps. These are sudden, painful, involuntary muscle contractions, right? These are caused by dehydration and electrolyte imbalances and, and neuromuscular fatigue. Some signs and symptoms, again, muscle cramping, we'll see some evidence of dehydration. Patients will be thirsty and will oftentimes be fatigued with this. So what's our treatment for muscle cramps? We want to remove them from play. We want to stretch the affected muscle groups. We want to rehydrate them and we want to ice for some soreness. 
Also, right, we want to make sure that we, we talk about potentially some salty foods, right? Um, especially if we know we're salty sweaters. And those people typically know who they are. Those are the ones that as they're sweating, that salt is just crystallized on their face or on their arms. And you can see that salt just sitting there. So, um, you know, that's the other idea too. But the best way to prevent heat cramps is proper acclimatization and prehydration, right? And so that's the key. And that's the conversation I have with football Friday night athletes is I say, hey guys, we want to make sure that you're hydrating days in advance. Don't try to do it today because you're going to cramp up, okay? All right, so the next thing is heat exhaustion, right? So what are some things we'll see with this? Well, we'll see decreased cardiac output, tachycardia, tachypnea, maybe some orthostatic changes. We're going to see profuse sweating, and we're going to have some mild mental status changes. Now, looking at temperature on this, typically what we're going to see is a temperature greater than 38 C, but less than 40 C, right? So kind of that 100.4, but less than, than a... 104. Uh, you're also going to see fatigue, headaches, nausea, vomiting, okay, cramps, chills, goosebumps, those sort of things. Basically, this comes from a combination of dehydration and exertional heat stress resulting in adequate, inadequate heat dissipation. So again, those evaporative and non-evaporative methods that we rely on just aren't working as well as they should. What do we want to do for treatment? Obviously, ABCs and vitals. That's the key on everything we do. We want to focus on that first. We want to move that patient to a cool and shaded environment, get some air circulation going around them, get those fans going, that sort of thing. We can put them in Trendelenburg, which can help some of their cardiac uh, issues as well as a uh, mental status. Uh, oral rehydration is, is definitely uh, a must. And if you have access to IV rehydration, that can be effective as well. Just not many of us you know, have access to that uh, right away. What we're really trying to avoid is this exertional heat stroke. That's the big one, right? So what are our signs on exertional heat stroke? We're gonna have a rectal temp greater than 104. Now, the key on that is rectal. It's really important to understand axillary, oral, temporal are not reliable methods for this. It must be a rectal temp. We're gonna have impaired cognition and cardiac output. We're gonna have profound mental status changes, and we're gonna have diminished peripheral cooling. And again, it's that anhydrosis or not sweating versus sweating. So if we have a situation where someone's hot and sweating and then all of a sudden they go to hot and not sweating, we're really concerned about heat stroke kicking in at that point in time. Other things that we're gonna see are fatigue, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, cramps, chills, goosebumps, all those same things you're gonna see with heat exhaustion. So it's important to be able to determine when they've crossed over or if they've crossed over from heat exhaustion to heat stroke. The pathophysiology with heat stroke, what's happening here is we've got denatured proteins and it's gonna disrupt cell function. That's going to release inflammatory cytokines, which is ultimately going to damage vascular endothelium. We know there are some predisposing factors to heat stroke, right? Some people have a genetic predisposing factor, uh, dehydration, lack of acclimatization, and a negative sodium balance over time is going to be one of the other things that we see associated with this. This is an emergency call for help, right? ABCs, ABCs, right? We've got to make sure we get these people taken care of immediately. Uh, we want to get them out of that hot environment. We want to get their clothes off, strip them down as much as you can. We want to do vitals and core temperature every five to 10 minutes. And again, it is a rectal temperature. That is the only accurate temperature that you can use for treatment of heat stroke. Uh, you want to do rapid cooling. And you're going to do this through either immersion in water or ice water. You're going to do wet, wet them down with cool sprays, fans to help you know, take advantage of some of that evaporative and convective cooling losses. And you're going to use ice packs for their neck, their axle, their groin, really take advantage of that conductive cooling, right? As those major blood vessels can be cooled with those ice packs in those areas. So let's talk about the prevention, right? So what's the prevention of heat illness, right? Well, we want to adapt athletes to exercise in heat gradually over about 10 to 14 days, right? We want to make sure we check environmental conditions beforehand. We want to avoid practicing during the heat of the day. We also want to plan for rest breaks, especially, you know, during practices in warmer temperatures. And we want to make sure we have an adequate supply of fluids to maintain hydration, right? Always make sure that there's plenty of fluids on site. What we know about heat acclimatization is that if we do this properly, we will find that with activity, we have a decreased heart rate, a decreased core temperature, increased sweat output, but decreased salt in the sweat, decreased fatigue, and increased performance. So all those things that we see happen with heat physiology and dehydration can be reversed with proper heat acclimatization. The AAP came out with this policy statement in 2011, which I referred to just a moment ago. And basically they want to talk, they talk about acclimatization being a main factor on this, making sure that we have proper hydration, modifying practices, monitoring cooling, and education of adult and youth. 
it's really important to understand it's on the adults in a lot of these situations to make sure we, we help our kids and our youth. ACSM also had a very similar policy statement that came out a few years before, focusing on pretty much exactly the same thing. Now on the right side of this, as you look, they just talk about some equipment and things that you would have available for heat related illnesses in, in the event that they should arise. So oftentimes mass participation, you know, events, uh, you know, triathlons, half marathons, marathons, you'll see a lot of these things on site for that. Are high school teams following these recommendations? Yeah, most of them are doing uh, acclimatization. They may not fully uh, be doing weight changes or that sort of thing, right? So not quite hitting all the marks, but overall we do see that they are making some of the changes there. The NATA also came out in 09 with a guideline on how to uh, do this acclimatization. Now this is pretty familiar uh, to those of us in Arizona because the AIA uh, also has a acclimatization protocol that, that matches up with this uh, pretty evenly. And so um, I'll allow you for to kind of read this on your own, but you can see here the, the options. The last thing I kind of want to touch on, I think the important part of this is heat index, right? The heat index is basically the temperature the body feels when air temperature and relative humidity are combined. So humidity is going to decrease that evaporative sweat from the body, right? Makes it harder to cool down. So high humidity and high temperatures increase chance of heat illness, right? We tend to think about that deep south area, right? Arizona, we get those high temperatures, but we don't always have the high relative humidity. Um, we also need to take into account wind and direct sunlight because we know that those can affect our cooling abilities. Here's just a, a heat index table that you can look at for reference as well. Uh, it talks about the different risk categories in here. Anything in white is considered a low risk or no risk. And then the really pale yellow is caution. The brighter yellow is extreme caution. The danger in the orange and extreme danger in the red. So, you know, again, uh, looking at your air temperature across the top and your relative humidity down the left side, find where those two boxes combine and you can look and see what your uh, risk category is. And again, this is kind of how we look at that caution, possible uh, issues, extreme caution. You know, we can talk about the more severe stroke, uh, heat stroke, heat cramps and heat exhaustion. Uh, and then the danger uh, is very likely. And then extreme danger, those red categories, we really should not be doing anything because it's highly likely. These are some resources that you can look at for heat uh, awareness and heat management. So between uh, the AAP, the ACSM, which I referred to both of these, NATA, and then the AIA policy. And I included that on here as well. It's a little bit small, a little bit more difficult to read, but I put this in here for your reference. This is the policy from the AIA regarding heat acclimatization and heat illness management. Um, so I think this is a really great resource to have right here in our state to kind of take a look at um, and to be able to evaluate and help our patients out. Uh, so I just wanna say, here's a list of references you can refer to as well, take a look at. I wanna say thank you so much for uh, listening to my talk. I apologize, I won't be available for questions afterwards, but I know Dr. Hall will uh, help us out with that. So thank you so much for your time. Have a great rest of your day. All right, that was a great uh, kind of summary of heat-related illness in pediatric patients. Um, I just wanna um, go ahead and put your uh, questions into either the question and answer or the chat, um, and we'll get to those. So go ahead and put those in. I just wanted to um, make a couple of announcements. I just did mention that um, in the chat that one, um, the slides as well as the presentations will be available to all of you for um, the next six months. So um, if you miss something or you want to go back and catch something or you want to be able to, you know, kind of take notes or update, you know, policies or procedures that you have, um, that'll be available to you. The other thing is um, it was hot off the press. And so it was not available for Dr. Bowman when he put his recorded his presentation a couple of weeks ago. Um, but the AIA heat policy has been updated. So um, I will put in the chat in just a minute the link to the new policy. Um, so I would encourage all of you to look at it. It is much more comprehensive. Um, there are also recommendations sort of made on wet bulb globe temperature um, rather than using heat index and some suggestions. Um, along those lines, I will mention that the um, SMAC is currently supporting a research study to actually look at um, how helpful using wet bulb globe temperature is in our climate, um, particularly all over the state. So we actually are trying to get um, some athletic trainers uh, to do data for us um, in different uh, climates all over the state and to see if that really makes sense for us in Arizona, because it's, it's really hard when we look at what measure to use sometimes uh, 
um, in an arid, in a more arid climate. Although the last couple of weeks, I think we can uh, compete with the South with our humidity levels. But, um, but yeah, so those those are some of the, just the things I would say there. Um, if there are any other questions um, on Dr. Bowman's presentation, I think I have actually all of our faculty here. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, Dr. Bowman is based primarily in our two East Valley locations. So he is at the Mercy, the new Mercy Gilbert office that's been open for about the, almost the last eight months. And, um, and then at our East Valley office. So that's where he sees patients. So any of you that are out in the East Valley, um, he's a good resource and contact for you. And I'll introduce the other faculty as they talk today too, and let you know where they're based as well. Um, he also is a DO, so he does um, OMT as part of our practice as well. So, um, and, um, and yeah, so if you have uh, patients or people that need that as well, that's another great resource that he provides to our program. All right. Any questions or is there any other comments from the rest of the panelists that you guys would like to contribute or? I'll make a couple comments, uh, Dr. Wilson. Um, one of the things that I would mention in the preventative portion, I think, was uh, having the having shade in that area. So a lot of times, um, you know, you're out on the field and the nearest shade is the locker room. And so making sure that there's some type of tent or cover there. Um, one of the reasons for that, too, is if you have someone who's suspecting to have heat illness, you don't want to send that person away. You know, you don't want to send them to the locker room to get shade because you don't know what's happening in there if they're decompensating. So uh, if you have a suspected individual, you want that person out of the heat, but you also want them close by um, so that you can make sure that they're not progressing. Um, another thing, uh, if you do have to uh, put somebody in the ice bath, uh, I had a, not personally this, but covered a, a race that we had to do that. And you could see immediately uh, when we did not stir the water around, uh, the, the, the temperature wasn't dropping. And then some smart person was like, hey, stir the water. And, and you could see a precipitous drop. So uh, they kind of get walled off um, if, they're, if the water's not moving. So that's another uh, feature if you do have to uh, immerse somebody in the, in the, in the water tank. Both great points. So thank you for bringing those up. The um, other thing I was going to say is a lot of times you'll see out on the field, you've got a cold water immersion tub that's available, um, but it's right out in the blazing sun. So much to his point about shade, if you've got that shaded area, make sure you put your cold water immersion tub there as well um, to get them out of that heat exposure um, right away. So, all right. I think there is another question. Oh, yep. That's just, that's just actually a general question. So I can answer it though, too. Um, there's a question about CEs for category A approved at the BOC for athletic trainers. Unfortunately, um, that we're not going to be able to offer category A, um, CEUs for the athletic trainers, um, for this year, but we have done that in the past and we do plan on, uh, continuing that in the future. Um, we just weren't able to actually get that approved for this year. Any other questions about heat related illness or? Um, all right, I don't wanna to jump too far ahead because I know that there are some people who are sort of tuning in based on talks this morning too. So um, we'll I got to ask a question there uh, as well. Um, you know, one of the things we did in fellowship that I kind of was conflicted about was uh, for college was, was IV hydration. And, you know, I'm, I'm still conflicted about that. You know, my thought is pre-hydration, if we're needing to IV hydrate someone prior to a game or practice, uh, that's probably a failure on our part to properly hydrate the person in general, right? Like if, if someone really needs IV fluids to begin a game, what have they been doing for the last 24 to 48 hours kind of is my question uh, there. I think um, there may be some role for performance at halftime, uh, although I, I wouldn't be the one to do it, but I think that there, there may be some role for performance because if you have uh, more than 2% dehydration, there is some studies that, uh, there are some studies that show that can affect performance. Uh, I think it, it's definitely hotly debated but I, I just wonder if 
someone's needing an IV, have we missed something on our end in trying to diligently keep them hydrated orally? Uh, that was kind of an ongoing debate. Hey, Rand, and I had a couple of questions, if, if that's okay. Yeah. So one, um, salt, or excuse me, ice bath, <clears throat> when have you found an indication to use that? Is it really outside those temperatures that Dr. Bowman mentioned? Is the first uh, question. And then the second is, in your experience, when I've got an athlete on the field that, you know, keeps coming in with uh, the with different heat cramps, what has been most successful to you? You know, rehydration, getting electrolytes. I know the things that Dr. Bowman mentioned, uh, it sounds like prehydration is obviously the bigger deal, but to get them back on the field or get them to kind of get out of that where they keep having those heat cramps and, you know, and stopping the game and somebody's out there stretching them, what has been the, really the most effective treatment that you've uh, found? So I'll say for the, for the ice water immersion, um, if I have someone who is altered mental status in any way, um, I'm going to get them in the tub, but I think it's tough because, you know, you're putting a 200 pound person who appears altered in a water tub, right? So you got to keep that person up. So what I've seen is putting a towel underneath the armpits and behind them and that, and there's a person holding that towel so they don't slip down. Um, and then there's someone stirring the water as well. Uh, that's that's the situation now where where I was covering uh, the marathon um, in Cincinnati. You know, we we had the rectal temperature to do it right then, and you could you could see the temperature dropping. But uh, you know, that was the technique that that we used and, and worked well. Um, you can you know use I th I think the schools that I work with uh, we suggested just like a, a baby pool or some type of blow up pool uh, there on the sidelines. Um, I think, you know, I have a, a high amount of personal experience with heat cramps uh, that I was a salty sweater, I would say guaranteed to cramp at least once a game um, during the, the preseason and early games, even cramped. I can remember uh, anybody's from the East Coast, we'd go to uh, friendlies after the game. And if I moved wrong, I was on the floor stretching my hamstrings and quads, but I don't think there's really good evidence here. You know, the things that that anecdotally was, you know, some of my coaches had me drinking like straight salt water, like ocean water type salinity fluid. But I don't know that there's any evidence to that. Once it starts in the game, I, I don't really think there's anything but like getting into that refractory period that that can help. Um, you know, people argue that IV fluids help. Obviously, we're not going to do that at the high school level. But some people also argue that maybe it's not even an uh, electrolyte issue. Maybe it's a uh, kind of a hypersensitized, uh, not nervous system, but uh, response. And, you know, because, you know, I can have instances where you can be doing like a, a repetitive workout and have a cramp in your arm, and that shouldn't be related to, to electrolytes. So I think there's more questions than answers, but I don't, I don't think there's anything evidence-based that you can do and say, oh, you know, we, we got them back out there quickly other than just hope for the best. And I would just add to that really quick. I'm a huge water pusher. Um, all of the all of the kids who know that, like from games that I've covered, they also know that if they are, you know, in those first couple of games getting pulled out, like I tell them ahead of time, there is no reason that we should be on the field stretching you. You should be drinking, drinking, drinking. And I, most of them really do a good job of, of like hydrating in advance. I think what Dr. Bowman said about really making sure that 48 to 24 hours before their game, they're really drinking a lot is huge. Um, I think that makes a big difference on even a lot of our salty sweaters. So usually the second game, because I give them such a hard time at the first game, um, they are much better. And if we have a problem, it's not until like late in the fourth quarter versus like, you know, some of those kids are already starting to cramp in the first and second, you know, quarter. I think there's also a component of preseason conditioning too. Um, you know, the really deconditioned athletes who are coming in who have not spent a lot of time preseason, I think have more trouble with muscle cramping. So I don't think it's just always a hydration issue. I think that there's also a deconditioning issue that plays into that. So that some of the kids who spent more time in the weight room the next year um, definitely makes a difference and they don't cramp up nearly as much. Um, but yeah, I, I think, and then the, you know, um, I think there was the other, the other part just about, um, I just lost what I was gonna say. Um, just, you know, like with 
um, cold water immersion. The other thing Dr. Hall was mentioning, you know, it's not expensive to do cold water immersion. You know, you can, there's a, you know, the 45 gallon Rubbermaid like container is what most of the high schools have. And you can get it for like under a hundred bucks. Um, and it works really well. You know, there's not really any high school athletes that are usually, you know, bigger than that, but you can get them in enough and they've got to be completely submerged except for their head sticking out. So, and that's always, I think the hard thing, like Dr. Hall mentioned, just with position and stuff. So, um, it's good. All right. Um, oh, and then somebody had just asked actually about privacy assessment tents, um, like sidelines for the pros and college games. Are they available at the high school level? Um, usually they are not. I don't think mo I, and most of the high schools, I would say, usually do not have privacy tents, which does make it a little bit hard with rectal thermometer thermometry. Um, I, I would also say, you know, I've worked with several of the school districts um, on heat policies because, as Dr. Bowman mentioned, I think it's really important to stress a rectal temperature is what you really need to have. Um, and so you've got to do it. I, I, it's just, it's one of those things. This is a life-saving measure. Um, this, you know, there are kids who un, un, sadly still die from heat related illness um, and no one wanted to do the rectal thermometry. Um, and so, you know, that me altered mental status as Dr. Hall was kind of alluding to, it can be a cardiac origin. It can be a heat related origin. It can be a head related or origin. And so when that, that having that thermometry measurement is huge because then if you're, you've got a kid who's like 105, you're like, this is easy. Like put them in the cold water immersion. We don't have to worry about other things. If we're not sure, you know, the kid took a big hit in the game earlier. Is this a head injury? You know, you can just do that, do that rectal thermometer tree. And so, um, it's just, you know, kind of framing it in that respect, I think is helpful. All right, perfect. So I am going to, uh, we're going to go ahead and move on. Um, our next talk is actually going to be by Dr. Jeff Vaughn, uh, one of our sports surgeons here at Children's, and he's going to give a talk on femoral, uh, femoral acetabular impingement in athletes. This morning, I'll be speaking on femoral acetabular impingement in athletes. Femoral acetabular impingement occurs when there is an abnormal contact between the femoral head neck junction and the acetabular rim, causing hip pain and dysfunction. This abnormal contact may eventually lead to degenerative changes and osteoarthritis. Athletes are especially at risk for femoral acetabular impingement and joint damage because of their extremes of hip motion, higher forces, and the repetitive impact that are in inherent in their sport. There are two main types of two main types of femoral acetabular impingement: a pincer type, a cam type, and there can be a mixed type when the two of them when the two occur together. Pincer impingement occurs because of over co coverage of the femoral head by the acetabulum. This can, this can occur because of overgrowth of the anterior edge of the acetabulum, ret a retroverted acetabulum, an os acetabulum, patients who have a deep socket or a prior rotational osteotomy can lead to pincer impingement. Pincer impingement, or during pincer impingement, the prominent anterior acetabulum crushes the labrum against the neck of the femur with hip flexion. Repetitive microtrauma then can lead to uh, labral and eventually adjacent articular cartilage damage. Cam impingement occurs when there is a prominent femoral head neck junction. And this is often referred to, referred to as a pistol grip deformity demonstrated in this uh, diagram. The bony prominence of the femoral head then engages with the articular cartilage of the acetabulum with deep hip flexion. This prominent femoral head neck junction causes a shear force from the bony prominence contacting the articular cartilage of the acetabulum, delaminating the articular cartilage. This eventually also can lead to labral damage. Pincer impingement is more commonly seen in females, uh, male, or, whereas cam impingement is more commonly seen in males. However, we definitely see both of these types of impingement in males and females. What's the etiology or what causes this femoral acetabular impingement? Pollard did a study in 2010 where he looked as genetics as a possible cause. 
the way he did this study is he took 64 patients or looked at 64 patients with femoral acetabular impingement and then compared those radiographs with the radiographs they took with the patient's siblings and spouses, he used as their spouses as controlled and as controls. And when he compared these uh, radiographs with the radiographs of the patient's siblings, he found that in siblings, there was a 2.8 times risk of pincer impingement and a two times risk of cam impingement. This could lead us to, to uh, determine that genetics is a, uh, put, puts the patient at a high risk for femoral acetabular impingement, although it could also be that the siblings participated in common developmental activities that put them at risk for, for femoral acetabular impingement. Other causes are pediatric hip disease, such as slipped capital femoral epiphysis, healing with a prominent femoral head neck junction, uh, the abnormal uh, structure of the hip uh, that results from leg calf perthes disease or from hip dysplasia. Repetitive activity or repetitive athletic activity is also possible, it was also, is also considered to be a possible cause because the intense physical activity may lead to a premature eccentric closure of the physis at the femoral and head neck junction. Sports that involve vigorous hip flexion and rotation should, such as basketball, football, hockey, soccer, and ballet uh, um, also put the patients at, at, at risk for femoral acetabular impingement because of the the deep hip flexion involved in these sports um, causing, excuse me, causing a, a abnormal contact or a higher contact would be between the femoral head neck junction and then that would be seen or then would be seen in a um, non-athletic population. Patients present with femoral acetabular impingement, they also often dis, uh, use this C sign to describe their hip pain, placing their hip or placing their hand on the lateral aspect of their hip and pointing towards the anterior aspect of their hip as the area of hip pain. Their hip pains also are often a deep, described as a deep hip pain and where they'll point deeply within their hip describing, describing the pain. Other presentations can include lateral or gluteal, or tro excuse me, tro trochanteric or gluteal pain. Pain is all often worsened with activity um, or with prolonged sitting uh, or activities that involve revolve hip flexion. Excuse me, that involve hip flexion, such as getting in and out of a car or leaning forward. Similar to where patients present with. Um, like for example, a meniscus tear in the knee will complain of mechanical pain. Uh, patients with a labral tear or femoral acetabular impingement may have uh, similar mechanical pain within the hip. Physical examination for femoral acetabular impingement involves reduced internal rotation. Uh, a log roll test will often, will often cause pain, especially with uh, internal rotation. An impingement test um, for uh, where we're trying to make contact of the femoral head neck junction against, against the acetabulum is performed by flexing the hip to approximately 90 degrees, adducting and internally, ro internally rotating the hip. This will often uh, cause or reproduce uh, hip pain um, from, the femoral, from femoral acetabular impingement. When someone presents with uh, with hip pain, and we're thinking they possibly have femoral acetabular impingement. Other uh, differential diagnosis to consider includes hip flexor tendonitis, snapping hip, femoral head, excuse me, femoral neck stress fractures, apophysitis or avulsion fractures of the pelvis, sports hernias, and osteitis pubis. So, briefly, some of the things that might differentiate these. Um, are on a snapping hip, the patient will often present with catching, snapping, or a sensation of instability. A uh, snapping hip with, uh, that comes from the iliopsoas is often localized to the anterior aspect of the hip, 
where the iliopsoas tendon is snapping even, either over the iliopectineal eminence or the femoral head. And, um, excuse me, in an external snapping hip, uh, the patient will localize the snapping to the lateral aspect of their hip from as the iliotibial band snaps over the greater trochanter. An internal snapping hip can, can be reproduced um, from placing the patient in a flexed abducted externally rotated position and then extending in, uh, the hip with internal rotation when, you, when we perform this maneuver, the snapping may, uh, we may be able to reproduce the patient's snapping. An external snapping hip uh, is, um, is diagnosed with an Ober's test with a patient in a lateral position and then adducting the uh, superior hip uh, the, and taking it from a flex to an extended position. Snapping may recur, reoccur or the patient uh, may complain of pain. A femoral head, excuse me, a femoral neck stress fracture is more common in runners. This occurs from repetitive loading of the femoral, uh, excuse me, of the femoral neck. Uh, the patient will often present with a history of overuse or an increase in their training regimen. Their pain, they complain of pain with, with impact that improves with rest. Uh, physical exam may be benign. Um, radiographs are usually negative unless the uh, femoral neck uh, fracture is, or is the stress fracture has been there for a sufficient amount of time to start for the patient to start developing callus. Um, an MRI is a the uh, modal imaging modality of choice demonstrated in the uh, MRI uh, uh, on this uh, with this on this diagram. Um, apophyseal avulsion fractures can also be a or excuse me, are also a common cause of hip pain in athletes. This occurs from a sudden forceful muscle contracture, often during a takeoff and a sprint or a kicking motion. The patient will complain of feeling a pop uh, when performing this motion with, uh, with a sudden onset of pain. Um, they'll be able to, excuse me, swelling may be associated with this, with this injury. They'll complain of decreased range of motion, inability to bear weight, um, and increased pain with, uh, with um, a, a stretching of that musculature, such as taking a long step. Uh, these are most common in mid-teens or as patients are approaching skeletal maturity. We see them more common in males than in females. Locations for apophyseal avulsion fractures occur uh, commonly near the anterior, or from the anterior superior iliac spine, the anterior inferior iliac spine, the ischial tuberosity, the iliac apophysis, or the lesser trochanter. And then finally, sports hernias. Uh, these are often a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, the patient presents with uh, groin pain um, that could be acute, but often um, that occurs over, over time. Uh, these are small tears in the abdominal, uh, or excuse me, the rectus abdominis that is, as it attaches to the pelvis or excuse me, to the pubis, or um, can be from the adductor longus. Uh, they're diagnosed with uh, on physical exam with inguinal tenderness or pain with resisted uh, uh, sit up or resisted hip abduction or perf while performing a Valsalva maneuver. Um, imaging uh, to diagnose these is by MRI. So imaging for femoral tabular impingement, what are we seeing on this? Um, we perform an AP and lateral radiograph to uh, help us diagnose femoral tabular impingement. Um, on the AP of the pelvis, we're looking if uh, we're able to see the patient's uh, physial status. We're able to measure the center edge angle um, and look for a crossover sign. The center edge angle is measured by, by drawing a line parallel to the long longitudinal pelvic axis to the center of the femoral head, a second line is drawn from the center of the femoral head to the edge of the acetabulum. Less, uh, an angle less than 25 degrees is concerning for developmental dysplasia. Uh, a angle, an angle greater than 40 degrees is uh, concerning for, uh, for, excuse me, for pincer impingement. From the uh, anterior uh, pelvic radiograph, we're also able to determine uh, the patient's acetabular version. A normal acetabular version is 20 degrees. 
on the IP radiograph, you can see this line extending um, more horizontally towards the pubis. This is the anterior acetabulum. And then the line extending more uh, vertically towards the ischium is the uh, posterior wall. These two lines should come together at the edge the, of the, uh, at the sorcel or the edge of the acetabulum. They should not cross each other. Crossing, we, when they do cross each other, we call this a positive crossover sign. Um, and this uh, indicates abnormal version of the acetabulum. When uh, looking at the posterior wall, the posterior wall should cross through the center of the femoral head as it does here. If you have a positive crossover sign with the um, posterior wall passing through the center of the acetabulum, then that indicates anterior overcoverage common to uh, or concerning for pincer impingement. On the lateral radiograph, um, we could, well, I should say we could obtain a lateral radiograph in different, different ways. Once by doing a frog lateral, which we commonly perform, there's a view called the Dunn view and then a cross table lateral. Each of those will give us a good lateral of the hip. Um, in a study out of JPO in 2015, they found that when we perform a cross table lateral or to perform a cross table lateral involves increased radiation doses. And so we prefer either a frog lateral or a done view. On a lateral radiograph, we're able to measure the alpha angle, which indicates where, um, where the femoral head neck prominence in cam impingement is occurring and what is the risk for the prominence to come into contact with the edge of the acetabulum. This is measured by drawing a, a line along the femoral neck to the center of the femoral head and a second line from the center of the femoral head um, to where the, the femoral head neck prominence begins or where the severe sphericity of the femoral head neck, uh, excuse me, where the sphericity of the femoral head ends. A, a, an angle greater than 50 degrees indicate, or puts the patient at risk for cam impingement or again, for this uh, prominence to, be con to come into contact with the femoral, or excuse me, with the acetabulum with uh, hip flexion. Um, just this year, a uh, study in JPO looked at, looked at the alpha angle to see if a larger, af as or excuse me, a larger alpha angle indicated a greater risk for damage to the soft tissues within the hip. They looked at the lateral center edge angle, the alpha angle, and the patient's, uh, um, and excuse me, the patient, patient reported outcomes. They found that there was no difference, despite a larger alpha angle, there was no difference in severity of preoperative symptoms with a greater lateral, uh, lateral center edge angle, um, that there was no difference in uh, uh, patient reported outcomes, but they did find that with an increased alpha angle, there is a higher risk of acetabular labral tears. Interestingly, uh, we normally would put um, the, uh, the cartilage of the acetabulum at greater risk for damage uh, with a larger alpha angle even prior to an acetabular labral tear, but on this study, they found that the labral tear was um, uh, was an increased it was was found more commonly with an increased alpha angle rather than or at least more commonly than damage to the uh, acetabular cartilage. Um, besides radiographs, we uh, use MRI to diagnose uh, articular cartilage damage as well as damage uh, as well as chondral damage. Um, and we have a choice of getting a uh, just a standard 3T MRI versus um, an MR arthrogram. We frequently use the MR arthrogram because of the increased sensitivity of an MR arthrogram to diagnose uh, damage to the patient's soft tissue structures, especially uh, to visualize a labral tear. When performing a 3T MRI, there's a 61 to 66% chance that you're going to be able to, uh, that you're going to be able to visualize a labral tear but a 90.5% chance to visualize a labral tear with an MR arthrogram. So again, we frequently perform those 
especially if we see a patient in clinic that comes in and has had a previous MRI, is having hip pain concerning for um, label damage or femoris, from femoris tabular impingement. Um, and, so, and at times where it's been, uh, we're showing that they did not have a labral tear on a regular or conventional 3T MRI, we'll see that um, on an MR arthrogram. Treatment, uh, it's important first to know that we see femoris tabular impingements uh, in, uh, frequently in asymptomatic individuals. So if we have an MRI that, or excuse me, if we have radiographs that show signs of pincer or cam impingement, um, that may not be the cause of the patient's pain or a patient may present for, for another reason and though and, and the femoris tabular impingement is not causing them symptoms. In a systemic review of 26 studies over 2,000 individuals, uh, they found that 37% of, of these uh, radiographs um, showed signs of femoris tabular impingement in, in asymptomatic patients with cam deformity. 67% um, of these patients had signs of pincer impingement, but were asymptomatic. And even 60, in 68% of patients had um, asymptomatic labral tears. That's often a concern when we have patients come in um, and, they, and they might have a small labral tear and are having hip pain. And it may just be due to, for example, hip flexor tendonitis or a snapping hip syndrome. And it's hard to convince them that at times that they don't need surgery for a small labral tear, that that's common in asymptomatic individuals. So very important that patients understand that, that it's just different than, for example, like a meniscus tear, uh, where we often will recommend uh, surgery to repair, repair that structure in a labral tear where it's on the edge of the um, joint is something that may not, need, may not need surgery and that may not be the cause of their pain. Among athletes, uh, there's even a higher um, prevalence of uh, asymptomatic femoris tabular impingement. When looking at a, um, 134 college players, they found that 94, 95% of these 134 players they looked at had, had asymptomatic um, cam or pincer impingement. Another study looked at uh, elite soccer players and found that 72% of uh, men and 50% of women had asymptomatic uh, femoris tabular impingement. Why does this occur more common in athletes? Uh, it may be a combination of the hip shape, their activity level, or the type of activity that they're participating in. Treatment for femoris tabular impingement. Um, Non-operative treatment is the initial treatment choice for all patients. One, because we discussed that uh, we can have femor that, that femoris tabular impingement is often asymptomatic in patients and it can often be treated um, and the patients can often become asymptomatic by non-operative treatment. Uh, patients that we find uh, that are successfully treated non-operatively are usually minimally, minimally symptomatic patients patients that are not having mechanical symptoms or that have a small or partial thickness labral tear. Often labral tear is another thing to consider is on an MRI, sometimes a small labral tear, or excuse me, just the uh, sulcus between the labrum and where the bone starts of the acetabulum can sometimes be misdiagnosed as a tear or it can be a location of a partial tear. Treatment, uh, non-operative treatment occurs, uh, or consists of rest, anti-inflammatory, physical therapy, and activity modifications. If those don't uh, improve the patient's symptoms, their next step is usually a steroid injection. The steroid injection can be both uh, diagnostic and therapeutic, and is often required. <coughs> excuse me, and is often required by insurance companies prior to proceeding with surgery. When um, we, in, in a couple of our sports medicine, uh, non-operative sports medicine physicians um, perform these uh, injections frequently um, in their clinics. So when I have a patient that's failed physical therapy um, and um, it's still, you know, or so are they're still having pain, I'll refer to one of, uh, to one of our uh, sports medicine, primary care sports medicine doctors and they'll perform this injection. And if the injection, intraarticular injection, provides the patient with pain, or excuse me, with pain relief, 
um, then we'll know that the uh, pain is coming from within the hip joint and maybe due to, for example, a labral tear. Um, now, often this uh, combined with continuing physical therapy will uh, resolve the patient's symptoms. If, on the other hand, their symptoms resolve for a short time, but uh, after the injection uh, wears off, they continue to have pain, then again, we'll be able to confirm or be more confident that the uh, pain is intraarticular, and that will help us make the decision that uh, surgery potentially will be beneficial to the patient. Uh, this study looked at uh, methods or how or what makes non-operative treatment successful. Um, and they looked, uh, they did a systemic li literature review and they found that um, physical therapy should incur, uh, should include core strengthening, should include active rather than uh, only passive modalities, and it should be supervised, supervised rather than just at home physical therapy. When they compared core, active, and supervised uh, physical therapy, um, they had better results than patients who did not perform core activities or they performed at home or unsupervised activities. And uh, active, again, like I mentioned, was, um, was more successful than passive physical therapy. Surgical treatment, if the patient ends up needing surgery, uh, we were able to perform that uh, using arthroscopic techniques. Um, I perform uh, the, the surgery in a supine position. It can also be performed in a lateral position. We use traction with a well-padded post to protect the, perine uh, protect the perine perineal area. Um, usually it's done through three arthroscopic portals, an anterior and anterior lateral and a posterior lateral portal where we're, they, we're able to see all the structures within the hip and then treat both any, or both, con or excuse me, then to treat any chondral damage, labral tears, or um, the bony, uh, the cause of the bony impingement, whether pincer or cam. This is uh, some arthroscopic uh, uh, pictures demonstrating treatment of cam impingement. Here you're seeing the acetabular labrum being elevated off of the bony prominence, as you're seeing here, off of the bony prominence. The uh, high speed burr is then used to, to uh, remove. Um, uh, the bony prominence and bring the acetabulum or to um, or bring the acetabulum down to a normal size or remove the prominent edge of the acetabulum. The labrum is then reattached to the um, normal uh, normalized acetabulum. And then uh, and this shows the uh, sutures reattaching the acetabulum to the uh, recontoured bone. Um, in this study, looking at patients with, um, with that had acetabular retroversion, showing that this can treat, be treated successfully arthroscopically. These are 48 hips with 38 uh, females and uh, representing 30, 38 females and 10 males. These are all young patients with retroverted acetabulum. Um, and then after surgery, they showed a significant improvement in patient reported outcomes at two years postoperatively. Only three patients went on to uh, needing revision arthroscopies and no patients uh, needed an open procedure. Cam impingement can also be treated arthroscopically. And then uh, after, uh, excuse me, after we uh, perform an arthroscopy of the hip and treat any uh, intraarticular damage such as chondral or cartilage damage or labral repairs, then we move into the peripheral compartment here you're seeing the femoral head. This is the acetabulum. This is a probe uh, filling the cartilage there. And then as we come to the femoral head neck junction, which in this patient was prominent, you can see some da the damaged articular, damaged articular cartilage here. That's removed. This shows the cam lesion of the prom prominent femoral head neck junction. The high speed burr is used to recontour the femoral head neck junction to a normal uh, concave. Um, uh, into a normal concave femoral head neck junction that wouldn't impinge with femoral head neck or with femoral, uh, or excuse me, with hip flexion. And um, this is the recontoured femoral head neck junction. This is some of the vessels that we're seeing and preserved. And then the patient's able at this point uh, to flex their hip uh, without impinging against that uh, uh, cartilage of the acetabulum. Surgical treatment uh, has been is is very successful with uh, with um, hip arthroscopy for femoral acetabular impingement. 
This shows 172 cases, or this study looked at 172 cases of femoralized tabular impingement. Uh, 141 of the patients had cam lesions, 22 combined and nine isolated pincer impingements. This is a variety of professional and college and high school athletes. And in this study by Tom Bird in uh, a sports health uh, journal um, in 2010, 90% of those patients were able to return to sports. Philippon uh, is very, uh, very well-known arthroscopist out of uh, Vail, Colorado. Um, he looked at 45 professional athletes and 93% of those patients after surgery for, after arthroscopy for femoral tabular impingement were able to return to their sport. This study, again, by Philippon, uh, looked at uh, adolescent athletes. So these are patients 16 years of age and younger. Um, majority of those were females. Uh, pincer, uh, cam, and then combined impingements. Um, se several had labral uh, tears that were repaired as well or debrided. And they showed a 35 point improvement on the modified Harris HIP score and a 36 point improvement on a HIP outcome score. So, a very good improvement with other symptoms with HIP arthroscopy. Another study uh, more recently by La Trenta in the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics looked at 81 athletes, um, uh, 81 adolescent athletes, uh, 61 females and 20 males. These are uh, players or participants in track, soccer, dance, baseball, and basketball. Um, all has to, excuse me, all these patients had a statistically significant improvement of their hip pain with hip arthroscopy uh, at a two-year follow-up, and 84% 84, 84 of them returned to their sport. And as far as surgical, then as far as surgical timing, um, you know, certainly as we mentioned, as I mentioned. Non-operative treatment is the initial choice for all patients. When we looked at, when this study, however, looked at patients um, uh, as to when they had their hip surgery compared to when their symptoms started, they divide those patients into three groups. Um, so those who had surgery in less than six months of the onset of their symptoms, those who between six months and three years, and those with who, had, who waited or whose surgery was delayed for more than three years from their onset, onset of their symptoms or they didn't have surgery until uh, they've been having uh, symptoms for more than three years. And they showed significant better, significant better outcomes when the surgery is performed in less than six months from their onset of symptoms. So um, now that's not always a choice for us when a patient presents and how long they've been having symptoms. Sometimes they'll come in and they've been having symptoms for several years or uh, you know, at least several months, but um, still we're going to try non-operative treatment first because that's often successful. But, um, but again, it's important that if uh, once those things fail, they may, it should, this study showing that they're going to have a better outcome if we're, if we treat their symptoms um, surgically in a shorter amount of time. So the summary of neurosis tabular impingement or in summary, uh, one, it's important to uh, remember, explain to patients that um, the femoral tabular impingement uh, or radiographic signs of that uh, femoral tabular impingement will commonly be found in asymptomatic individuals and even, even small labral tears that uh, can be found in asymptomatic individuals uh, that, um, that will see femoral tabular impingement more commonly in athletes compared to the general population. Um, if femoral tabular impingement is left untreated, it can uh, eventually lead to premature osteoarthritis, especially in athletes. Uh, there is no indication to correct the radiographic findings of femoral tabular impingement in asymptomatic individuals. Physical therapy is the first line treatment. Uh, surgical treatment is, is, however, effective at improving patient's symptoms and a high percentage of athletes are able to return to sports after sur surgical intervention. Thank you for your attention and I'm available to answer any questions during the question and answer portion of this uh, conference. Have a good day. All right, thank you, Dr. Vaughn. That was a great presentation. I'll give everybody a couple seconds to kind of unmute themselves and show their bright and smiley faces. Um, all right, and then I'll just give you guys a couple of questions. Please put your question answers you have for Dr. Vaughn um, in the question answer uh, section or even in the chat. Either one works for us. 
Um, I'll just get things started. I actually, um, I think the study, and I'd seen that study too, about uh, kind of timing of when surgery is done and less than six month group. So I think a question um, that's good is, you know, for most of our conferences, yeah, athletic trainers and primary care physicians, is there anything when these patients come in or when they first kind of present and describe their symptoms, like in their history or on their physical exam, that you would kind of lean more towards having that patient sent to see sports medicine, you know, sooner rather than later versus, you know, the kid comes in with hip pain and the primary care physician sends them to physical therapy, which is, you know, the mainstay of treatment as you discussed anyways. And then if they, you know, aren't doing well, sending them into sports medicine, is there anything like indications that you would be like, I want to see this kid sooner possibly? That's a good question, uh, Dr. Wilson. I, I think some of it for me ends up being a little bit on their history, how severe their pain's been, and um, also on their physical exam, whether the, the symptoms they're having, like for example, when we perform that flexion, adduction, internal rotation, or Bader test, if they're really symptomatic to that or jumping off the table, or that's something that's really hurting them, a lot of times uh, it will indicate, or at least in my mind, will indicate that these symptoms are, are very concerning, that they're having either impingement or potential labral tear or chondral damage. And a lot of times those patients where it's really affecting their uh, activity, even sometimes they're just normal daily activity, I'll try to refer them sooner over to uh, Dr. Kelly or Dr. Hall for an injection, for example. I find, at least in my experience with those patients, a lot of times don't respond really well or uh, to physical therapy, sometimes just because they can't tolerate it. Um, and so if we get the injection started, sometimes they'll do better. And, and then again, right after the injection, we'll get them into physical therapy. And, uh, and, and hopefully those patients will become asymptomatic or will have success. Um, part of the other thing too is, is, and that's what I was trying to allude to in the uh, discussion is that it's hard with patients. And I could see that with, if it was my kids as well, or myself, if you come in and you're like, okay, I had an MR arthrogram and I was diagnosed with this labral tear and, and you're expecting, okay, I need surgery for this, or, you know, this is something that's torn in my hip. This isn't normal. And, uh, and therapy is not going to heal that. And, that's that to an extent is true is therapy is not going to necessarily heal their labral tear but if we can get their hip positioned so that the you know femoral head neck junction is not impinging against the edge of the edge of the acetabulum if we can uh, uh, get them in a position or a point where they're not symptomatic that's not something that's going to potentially you know cause them problems in the future that we don't expect that every one of those patients are gonna need surgery and that can be challenging. But I think if they have a good result from the injection or just with the physical therapy and understand that they don't necessarily need surgery for that, then um, you know, then if, if they buy into that discussion or understand it better, I think they do well then. And uh, a lot of those patients can go on to uh, non-operative treatment and get back to their sport without surgery. And I think that's a really great point. And that leads to sort of another question. And then Dr. Kelly actually put some questions in that kind of tag along with this too. Um, you know, is your, you know, I think that the mental expectation part of things is huge with a lot of these patients of, you know, like I always, always many times when I'm, you know, ordering MRIs for even shoulders or hips, kind of the same idea couch that there may be a small labral tear that we see, but we still need to do the physical therapy or have the injection with the physical therapy. And so would your preference be um, that these patients, if the, you know, the private, the primary care provider is feeling that they're going down that road where they think imaging is necessary, that they just send them into sports medicine for us to have that discussion and then order the imaging or, you know, do you want them to come in actually with the imaging already done um, and sort of have that piece of knowledge that they already know? And then Dr. Kelly had just kind of added to that, you know, as far as ordering MRIs, do you have a preference on 3T or MR arthrogram for the advanced study of choice to evaluate the hip? And I think you mentioned that in your talk, but you can just emphasize that too. Yeah, so both good questions. I think, um, you know, I'm okay either one if they come in with an MRI done already, I, I guess. Uh, you know, if I'm, I'm going to say I want a, an MR arthrogram done, and that's my preference, and I know that's not not the same throughout the nation. Some people are very, uh, or have a big opinion on, yeah, I don't need the arthrogram, and some feel like they really do. And I, I think, you know, the one study I mentioned, and just also with having patients come in, that sometimes 
a labral tear, for example, might be missed on a 3T MRI, um, but found on the MR arthrogram. I kind of prefer those, um, but uh, I, I guess I'm really okay either way, whether they come in with the MRI done before or not. Um, and we tend to make sure though, I, I think we see it better on an MR arthrogram of the hip rather than just an MRI of the pelvis. And that's, I don't think we get as good of a view and if it's not focused necessarily on that hip. And then I do like how you mentioned Dr. Wilson that I think if you're ordering one, whether you're the, the initial treating physician, primary care or otherwise, that you say, hey, we might see, for example, a small labral tear on MRI. And those small labral tears are common in athletes and, you know, and especially in a sport where they involve repetitive hip flexion, if they know that ahead of time and that the ones that are usually symptomatic and that potentially would require surgery are usually kind of medium or large size tears that the small ones, again, are more kind of just, you know, they, they tend to go along with those sports and those don't typically need surgery. And they, those tend to respond very well to physical therapy. And so, and I think they know that ahead of time that they'll feel good when they get that to say, okay, hey, okay, I just had that small labral tear. This is probably something I'm not gonna need surgery for. And, and so I think that can be very helpful to set patients' expectations. And is as much as, and I tell this to patients as well, is as much as I'm a surgeon and I love operating, but I certainly love to see them not need surgery. And, uh, you know, our, our biggest thing is, is that we care for our athletes and we want them to be able to participate in sports. And, you know, and there's so many benefits to that. And we don't want them to have to go through surgery and recovery if it's not necessary. And, uh, and so um, and I think those ex expectations are important. And, and again, I, I just to finalize with Dr. What Dr. Kelly mentioned, and um, you know, I know, and it actually probably would have been beneficial point to have kind of a, you know, his opinion or partial lecture from him on what he sees from his practice, because he does a, you know a lot of the non-operative treatment and really I think all my injections when I when I send them out. So, um, you know, it'd be interesting to see his his experience with you know does he really care for the MR arthrogram or not? But in my my experience, my practice, I I like it. I think it's important. Um, we won't repeat it if we can see the labral tear on the three T image. Um, we weren't obviously not going to repeat it to confirm that. But if we don't see it, sometimes we end up with a second test. All right. So there's there's been a couple other questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to move on to our next presentation. We will in the background answer some of these and put them in the chat so that you guys have um, those answers. Um, but our next talk is actually um, going to be by Dr. Randon Hall, who is primarily based in the West Valley, um, but does spend a one day a week at main campus. His talk this morning is going to be on the, an evidence based approach to medial tibial stress syndrome or shin splints. And with that, we'll let that go ahead and roll. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Randon Hall. I'm one of the primary care sports medicine physicians in the pediatric orthopedic department here at Phoenix Children's. Thanks for joining us this morning and afternoon. My talk is called Evidence-Based Approach to Management of Shin Splints. I'm really gonna focus on the management part rather than the diagnosis part. And I think that this will be a talk that you really get something out and can actually apply it to clinic, training room, physical therapy office. Objectives for today are to discuss the underlying pathophysiology of shin splints, review criteria for diagnosis of shin splints, and discuss risk factors associated with development of shin splints, and discuss evidence-based treatments supported by the research. Really what we're gonna focus on is those risk factors and the evidence-based treatment that we can correlate to those risk factors to help come up with a treatment algorithm. Just as an aside, shin splints are also known as medial tibial stress syndrome, and I will use those interchangeably and the acronym MTSS. So why talk about shin splints? Shin splints or medial tibial stress syndrome has a high prevalence in both recreational and competitive athletes. So it doesn't matter what type of sports or athletes that you see, you will see this diagnosis. Athletes can have a significant loss of participation and even more importantly, can develop an aversion for sports, especially in the novice athlete. It's applicable to many healthcare providers as the diagnosis is straightforward. The underlying pathophysiology is not fully understood and treatment is generally anecdotal and lacking a basis in evidence. 
Pliske et al. showed high school cross-country runners incidents of medial tibial stress syndrome occurred in 15% of athletes in a 13-week season. Bennett et al. showed 12% incidents of shin splints in high school runners in an eight-week season. I think that's important because there's not a lot of studies that show in your general everyday athlete an incidence as far as adolescent and pediatric patient. A lot of the data is in adults as well as in military recruits and cadets. Those same studies showed an incidence in females noted to be 21% and 19%. So that's certainly a risk factor, female gender, as far as developing shin splints. A systematic review of three prospective studies reported an incidence range of about 13 to 20% in runners of all ages. So a little bit about making the diagnosis. In my clinic, I have a certain set of criteria that I'm looking for. One is that it's activity-induced leg pain along the posterior medial border of the tibia. So a lot of times patients will come in with pain over the fibula, pain in the knee. That is not going to be consistent with shin splints. It's typically going to be in the distal to middle one-third of the tibia, but it can be diffuse. So many times I'll palpate up and down the tibia to see if they have any pain and not exactly have to be one exact spot. And they may have some palpable nodules along the tibial border. Initially, it will subside when exercise is over, but it can persist after activity and may be present at rest. Severe cases may cause limping or difficulty with simple walking activities. Here's a video depicting how I'm going to palpate along the patient's leg to determine if they're having symptoms and if it's in the right area. So here you'll see the examiner palpating along the posterior medial border of the tibia. And so you'll be looking for pain in that area. Then you want to use that thumb to really dig in there to identify if you can see if they have pain. If a patient has no pain on exam, I'm not going to proceed with any imaging. If it's a recreational athlete and they have pain on exam, and they're willing to rest, then I'm gonna give them an option. Let them know, hey, I think this is shin splints. We can get an X-ray, but it probably is not gonna show us anything. And sometimes anxious families wanna proceed, and sometimes families wanna say, okay, I'd rather not do that. Let's see how the treatment works. If an athlete is unwilling to rest, or they're a high-level athlete, I will proceed with a two-view TIB-FIB X-ray. And there, I'm just looking to see if there's any obvious signs of a stress fracture. If it's severe pain, even at rest or just with simple walking activities or limping, I will request that they do a complete shutdown, many times put them in a boot and restrict their physical activity. If an x-ray in that case is negative, I will consider proceeding to an MRI to look for a possible stress fracture. I think it really depends on the athlete's situation. If they've got a significant competition or tryouts or something coming up that they can't miss, I think I'll be more aggressive about the MRI. But if there isn't something significant in their schedule coming up, I may wait and just treat because the treatment is pretty similar when you're comparing shin splints to a stress fracture in terms of rest, but the length of time may be different. So this is really where I want to focus on is that pathophysiology and this traction theory. So this is really dogma. Pain is going to occur secondary to traction on the periosteum by the strong pull of calf muscles. So in other words, the calf muscles attached to the bone, that bony outer rim called the periosteum is pulled by the calf muscles when a patient is running or participating in activity. That's going to cause inflammation or periostitis, and that's going to lead to the pain in the shin splints. So we want to first look at what are the associated muscles that would cause the pain in this theory. Soleus, tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, and flexor hallucis longus are all theorized to cause the pain. If we look a little bit more in depth, there's been multiple cadaveric studies that have been performed in order to characterize 
these anatomic attachments. So as you can see on the diagram here, the soleus is off on the medial aspect of the tibia, as well as the flex flexor digitorum longus muscle. The tibialis posterior and flexor hallucis longus are more on the lateral aspect. So even though there is some dispute, the primary muscles are thought to be soleus and flexor digitorum longus. Keep in mind, there is some anatomic variation as to the exact site of attachment. So many times the soleus can be attached a little bit more laterally, the flexor digitorum longus can be attached a little bit more distally, but see in this picture, there is no significant attachment at that distal one third, which makes you start to worry and call into question this traction theory, because this is where the pain typically is characteristically described. There also is some conflicting evidence on if there's inflammatory cells present at that periosteum. So they've done some histologic studies that really haven't shown significant inflammatory cells at the periosteum. There are some studies that have showed some mild reaction, but not significant, which would be counter to this traction theory. On the other hand, there's a bone tension theory. And that theory states that subtle bending of the bone due to repetitive impact and muscle pulling can cause stress to the bone, and that stress can lead to shin splints. So forces are greatest at the junction of the distal to middle one-third of the tibia, which is the narrowest part of the diaphysis. So what happens is initially you have this load that's applied to the bone, you get some micro damage, the body repairs it with the osteoblast, and then the patient goes on and continues to physical activity. However, shin splints occur when that threshold to repair is exceeded and the body can't keep up and therefore they develop pain. Now, an important aspect of this theory is muscle strength plays a role in that weak leg muscles have less of an opposition, have less of a strut ability to keep the bone from bending. And that may be something that causes shin splints or at least reduces the ability of the body to resist that pain by not protecting and supporting the tibia because the muscles are weaker. So this is a diagram showing that, that you have the body weight superiorly and you have the ground reaction force coming up from the ground, which is causing a tension over the anterior aspect of the tibia as seen here. And that's where your shin splints are gonna develop. So that's what the bone tension theory shows. Now we have two theories that are in conflict. So this traction theory is thought to be an inflammatory process due to excessive pull on the periosteum. So how might you treat that? Anti-inflammatories, ice, stretching those tight muscles, massage, rest, arch support. But on the other hand, you have your tension theory, which is a mechanical stress of the bone due to impact and muscle tension across that bone. So in that case, as we talked about, maybe muscle strength rather than muscle flexibility is your treatment. Compression sleeves, if there's no infla inflammatory process going on, maybe acetaminophen rather than an anti-inflammatory. And then if this has to do with the way your foot strikes the ground, maybe running and body mechanics are your focus rather than simply just resting. So some of the major risk factors that have been shown to be evidence-based in the literature are dynamic foot pronation. So the way that foot pronates or folds in when it hits the ground can affect your landing mechanics and can affect the tibia rotational component when you hit the ground. Increase plantar flexion range of motion. So increase ability to push on the gas pedal, pedal can affect your landing mechanics, can affect your push off. So that again may be something that's counter to the traction theory because you would expect there to be limited plantar flexion or limited dorsiflexion with range of motion in someone who has tight calf muscles. Female gender, they might have a leaner, less lean body mass, less bone mineral density. There's evidence to show that hip external rotation is increased with patients who have symptomatic shin splints. So eight to 12 degrees was shown by Byrne et al. to have an uh, patients were shown to have eight to 12 
degrees of increase of external hip rotation. Muscular strength. We said that the muscles of the lower leg support the tibia. Two studies show that that may be true. Lean calf girth is one to 1.5 centimeter less in symptomatic individuals. And then another study showed that heels ra heel raise repetitions were significantly less in patients with medial tibial stress syndrome. So this is an example of a calf to lower leg angle. And basically this angular deformity or this valgus collapse of the ankle is a risk factor associated with foot pronation and can lead to either abnormal stress when the foot hits the ground or overstretching of those muscles causing that traction on the lower leg. And this is a more static picture and this is a picture showing it more in a dynamic function while the patient is running on the treadmill. Another important test to look at is the navicular drop test. This is a test that has been shown by evidence in the literature to be associated with medial tibial stress syndrome when patients have levels greater than one centimeter. So take a look and see what that test involves. First, palpate your patient's navicular tuberosity and mark it with a pen. To the test, have your patient sitting or standing and bring the talus into neutral position. Then, measure the distance from the ground to the tuberosity and mark it on a piece of paper. Now, ask your patient to bear weight on the foot and measure the distance from the ground to the tuberosity again and mark it on the same paper. With this test, we are talking about excessive navicular drop or overpronation with a difference of at least one centimeter. And as you can see, Andreas is right. Okay, so that's a good example of what the navicular drop test is in a patient who had a drop of over one centimeter. So all of those navicular drop, that uh, calcaneus lower leg angle are associated with dynamic foot pronation, which in multiple sh studies has been shown to be associated with shin splints. So one study showed that that angular displacement or valgus uh, angulation during running is significantly greater in a shin splint group, as well as that that angular displacement at heel strike is higher in a symptomatic group. The navicular drop was looked at in 125 high school runners and showed a mean of about seven millimeters in the shin splint group and an uh, average of about 3.5 in the asymptomatic group. So not quite one centimeter, but certainly trending in that direction. There are some prospective studies that did not show any increase in navicular drop distance in patients with shin splints compared to asymptomatic runners. So treatment, what we wanna do is we wanna look at those risk factors that we talked about before in the context of the pathophysiology to guide the treatment. So treatment one, increased foot pronation alters lower leg landing mechanics, which can cause greater forces across that tibia. So this is utilizing some of the thoughts from the bone tension theory to say that there's some alteration in landing mechanics, which will create a greater force across that tibia. So there's some weak evidence that custom orthotics have limited effectiveness in reducing symptoms, but anecdotally runners do report some improvement. So you may wanna consider a trial of over-the-counter foot orthotics or medial tibial stress syndrome taping or kinesio taping as an adjunct treatment. There is no clear evidence that shoe type plays a significant role in prevention of treatment or prevention or treatment of medial tibial stress syndrome. So a second treatment, improved muscle strength can oppose that tibial bending force associated with ground reactive forces. So Again, studies have showed that decreased leg, lower leg girth and increased ability to, or decreased ability to do calf raises are associated with shin splints. 
You want to consider a lower leg strength program either prior to or during the season, building up to three sets of 20, potentially two, two uh, times a day. Also want to consider a compression sleeve that may help support the musculature as well as bone in the lower leg. This has been done in studies in the Netherlands that have shown some benefit to using compression sleeves. There is no clear evidence that stretching programs have significant roles in treatment or prevention of medial tibial stress syndrome. Treatment number three, improved bone mineral density can allow lower leg to withstand the tension forces from running. So there are some imaging studies that show that there's decreased bone density at the symptomatic aspect of the tibia in patients who have shin splints. So you might wanna consider a gradual progression of running to allow bone adaptation. So in other words, if you gradually increase your running mileage or intensity, the bone has that micro injury, it repairs and then is able to withstand more stress over time. Consider plyometric training. So we know that strength training or plyometric training does increase bone mineral density. And if we add that to the preseason or off season, that may improve bone mineral density and therefore decrease our risk of shin splints. Consider supplementing calcium and vitamin D as that has been shown to reduce risk of stress fractures. And we know that stress fractures are believed to be on a continuum with shin splints. So that potentially has an effect on reducing your risk of shin splints, but has not been shown clearly with specifically looking at shin splints. And then consider dry needling as an adjunct therapy. There is some thought that you can do this periosteal pecking. So you take your dry needle and you kind of go up and down that medial, posterior medial border of the tibia to stimulate those osteoblasts to build bone and either respond to uh, the stresses when you have the, the injury or from a preventative standpoint. Treatment number four. Increased range of motion at the hip and ankle appear to play a role in developing medial tibial stress syndrome. So the biomechanics aren't quite clear. So we wanna focus on in-range strengthening of both the hip and ankle. So for example, here, you have a patient doing a single leg squat with a counter force in a orthogonal plane. So they're doing a single leg squat in the frontal plane but that they have a counter stress on the lateral aspect of the knee, which helps to build hip and gluteal strength as well as stability in multiplanar, in a multiplanar situation, which can certainly help as a hip and gluteal stability. And then you can also do some tr treatments with ankles as well using a BOSU. These are just some examples. I know a lot of you guys will have much more extensive exercises that can be used, but the point here is to work on hip as well as ankle strength in patients who have uh, medial tibial stress syndrome. Treatment number five, reduce impact loading on the tibia can potentially reduce bone stress and improve symptoms. So there is some thought that stride frequency alters tibial impact. So the more strides you take, within the same period of time, you decrease the ground reactive force. So if you can decrease, or excuse me, increase your stride frequency, you can decrease your ground reactive force. And studies have shown that an increase in 10% can show a substantial decrease in the ground reactive force. Easier said than done, but certainly something worthwhile trying. And then the obvious, modifying your training, including mileage, intensity, and duration as well as cross training, including pool workouts or bike workouts to try to keep that uh, cardiovascular fitness if you're not able to put as much weight on the legs or as intense exercise as you'd like. There is no clear evidence that running surface has a significant role in prevention or treatment of medial tibial stress syndrome. So grass, track, concrete, asphalt, there's no clear study or evidence that shows that it plays a significant impact on developing shin splints. So what are our conclusions here? Medial tibial stress syndrome etiology is not definitively understood. 
and therefore treatment and prevention are generally not evidence-based. We can utilize these proposed theories and evidence-based risk factors to guide our treatment. Literature shows study supporting or refuting almost all interventions for treatment and prevention of medial tibial stress syndrome. So just to repeat that, the literature shows that there are at least one study refuting or supporting all of the treatments that we've talked about or that you might know. And so that's important to say that there is no clear evidence on what to do, but we've got to do something. And an individualized plan using trial and error is the best option. So no consensus doesn't mean it won't help a specific patient. It just means there's, there's not clear evidence that it's going to help, but it's worth a try in many cases. So here's my recommendations. When you're in an off season, you really wanna focus on hip, gluteal, core, and ankle strength, rather than simply running all the time and doing all this cardio. You'll be able to get yourself cardiovascularly fit, but you wanna use your off days and downtime and put some time in there to really work on your functional strength, hip, gluteal, core, and ankle. Even something as simple as a home calf raise program or simple plyometrics can be beneficial in terms of preparing for the season. When you're in the preseason, you wanna use a gradual progression of running. Usually it's recommended 10 to 15% increase in mileage per week. The thought is that you get that bony adaptation over time that isn't overwhelmed by a significant increase in, in intensity or mileage so that you don't develop the shin splints. If a patient has history of shin splints or a positive navicular drop or foot pronation on exam, you should consider an over-the-counter rigid orthotic or taping. In a season, in season, a lower extremity rehab or strength program is definitely beneficial in lieu of running every single day. It doesn't really make sense to run every day or run 10 miles when your competition distance is two miles. Use that time to do lower extremity rehab, lower extremity strengthening to help support the tibia as you go through your running activities. Now, when you have a symptomatic patient, you can consider some symptom-based treatments such as ice, over-the-counter medications, and stretching as we typically would prescribe, but we want to know that these are not your primary treatment strategy. In my opinion, Based on the evidence, these do not treat the underlying cause. They simply treat the pain, and the patient's going to have that issue when they go back to running activity. On the other hand, modifying intensity and mileage, stride frequency, as well as cross training may be a more prudent strategy for managing pain. Consider treatments such as compression sleeves that might help in stabilization of the tibia and lower leg muscles, as well as dry needling such as that periosteal pecking technique that we talked about that many physical therapists can provide. That's my talk for today. Hopefully it was helpful. Here are my sources that you can utilize to, if you wanna evaluate that evidence for yourself. And then lastly, I know that this talk is live for some of you, but also is on demand. And so if there are some questions or general clarifications that you have for me, please feel free to email me at rhall1 at phoenixchildrens.com for any questions or comments. Thanks a lot. All right. Um, any other comments from the panelists? I think that's all of our questions. I was just going to say, I agree with what you just said, Randon, too, for rolling out. I feel like it's not going to do any harm, but that shouldn't be your only treatment strategy. So as long as you're doing it in conjunction with the other things we talked about, I personally don't have anything against kids doing it. Yep. And then I am, as most of you know, I actually introduced myself at the beginning, but I'm, I'm the medical director um, for our program here. Um, and then I am based primarily in the Northwest and centrally at main campus. And so that's where I live. With that, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, my name is Christina Wilson and I'm the medical director of pediatric and adolescent sports medicine and sports physical therapy at Phoenix Children's Hospital. 
Today, I want to talk about something that I think has become increasingly important as we come out of the pandemic. And that's really about how we encourage all kids to be more physically active, particularly since we already saw many athletes starting to become less active even prior to the pandemic. So today's talk is called Getting Kids Off the Couch and Into the Game, a practical approach to promoting a physically active lifestyle. I have no relevant disclosures. At the end of today's talk, I hope that you will be able to describe the current state of physical activity in youth and youth sports participation, to be able to counsel your families on how to build physically literate children, to be able to describe the United States Olympic Committee athlete development model, and also to be able to provide your families with tools to help identify sports that meet their physical activity goals. I'd like to start the talk by just giving a few definitions of some key terms and concepts that we'll talk about in this talk. The first is fundamental movement skills. Fundamental movement skills are the basic movements traditionally associated with human physical activity. These are skills that provide foundations for children to be confident and competent in physical development that allows them to develop sport specific and complex movement skills. These are things like balance, locomotor skills such as hopping, skipping, running, jumping, object control skills such as striking with a bat or hitting or throwing, and also um, rolling a ball, such as with bowling. These build what's called physical literacy, which is the ability and the confidence and desire to be active for life with an emphasis on fundamental movement skills. It is believed and has been shown in research that when kids have strong and good fundamental movement skills, that they are confident and enjoy sports participation and more likely to remain active for life. Every year, annually, the Department of Human Health and Services releases recommendations on physical activity. For children, it's recommended that they participate in 60 minutes or more of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity each day. In addition to that, three days per week, they should engage in activities that strengthen bones, such as running or jumping, or activities that build muscles, such as climbing or push-ups. When we look at the current state of where we are and if kids are meeting these guidelines, we're not doing the greatest of job. Uh, so in 2016-17, that served as the basis for this data, those numbers are found in the parentheses. When we looked at the data again to see where we were moving in 2018 to 2019, unfortunately in all of those areas we had slightly declined. In some areas it was statistically significant, in other areas it was not, but there was still a downward trend. Whereas we found that uh, just prior to the pandemic, only about 23.2% of adolescents were meeting their 60 minutes of physical activity per week. We looked at uh, meeting the guideline of muscle strengthening, only about 16.5% of adolescents were. And when we looked at children, they were doing slightly better at about a quarter of them uh, meeting daily physical activity requirements. And about half of them were actually meeting muscle strengthening requirements. Many of these kids were doing this with uh, PE or other sports participation. So when we look specifically at sports participation, about 56% of children and adolescents participate in sports. Physical education is thought to be the great equalizer to provide physical activity and, and be teaching fundamental movement patterns and physical literacy in schools. Unfortunately, even from a physical activity standpoint, only 3.8% of elementary schools, 7.9% of middle schools, and 2.1% of high schools are meeting the daily physical um, activity guidelines. And of those programs, only 11% of them are um, engaging in moderate to phys physical activity. And that was, and um, these were actually just schools that were offering daily physical education. Clearly we know that there are significant benefits to physical activity. So obviously in early childhood, we know that physically active children are one in 10 is likely to be obese. Um, they have higher test scores with up to 40% higher test scores. As they come into adolescence, they're less likely to engage in high risk behaviors such as smoking, drug use, pregnancy, and risky sex. 15% um, more likely to go to college as they transition into adulthood. Um, about seven to 8% have higher annual earnings with lower health costs. Um, they're more productive at work. Um, the they have a reduced risk of um, some of the comorbidities we see, such as heart disease, stroke, cancer, and diabetes. Um, and this really leads to them having a smaller morbidity um, with only a third of the rate of disability. 
Um, and there is this intergenerational cycle where we clearly know that active parents lead to active kids. Um, this is much more protective for mothers. So moms of um, moms who are active have kids that are two times more likely to be active. We look at trends in youth sports, and fortunately, all of the sports, um, these are some of the most common sports, have really been trending down. This was data looking at 2008 to 2013, and in fact, it showed that 2.6 million um, fewer kids were playing these sports over that five-year period. In about 2018, we started to stabilize, and we really were kind of optimistic that we were starting to start this upward trend of youth sports participation again. And unfortunately, we were faced with something that shut down sports completely, um, being the pandemic. We definitely know that there are socioeconomic drivers to early introduction of sports. Um, the most um, noticeable is really household income and it's the biggest driver of early participation with those families that have an annual combined income of a hundred thousand dollars or greater they usually have introduction of kids into sports at about 6.3 years versus those families who make thirty five thousand dollars or less it's closer to 8.1 years before they first are introduced to sports in addition we see differences in boys and girls we also see differences with race, race and ethnicity with caucasians having the earliest introduction to sport followed by african americans and then Hispanics. Um, parental marital status plays into this with married families um, having a much earlier introduction than those who are in from single family homes or who have parents who have never been married. Um, and then those kids who engage in daily uh, physical activity are much more likely to be introduced into sports at a younger age than those who are only participating in physical activity once a week. And so these are definitely some areas that we can look at as we start to kind of look at how we get kids back um, into being physically active. Um, coming out of the pandemic, just like we've seen even with how health disparities are, there are definitely disparities in physical activity and youth sports as well. Um, recreation options for lower income kids were already starting to be minimized prior to the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, most of these uh, youth rec leagues and community based leagues just didn't have the resources to be able to put all the mitigation measures in place um, to get kids back uh, playing sooner than some of the club teams where you're paying for your kids to play. Wealth definitely buffers a child's loss of free hours um, of hours of free play in practices and in games. So we look at those groups of families who have a combined total income of $100,000 per year um, versus those of less than $50,000 per year. And those kids at the higher um, income areas are participating in two hours more per week than those kids at the, at the lower incomes. And then there's also racial differences. So prior to the pandemic, um, black youth were participating in sports um, more hours per week than white youth. And the post pandemic, um, everyone has seen a decline in the number of hours, but white youth um, have had less, much less of a decline than black youth. And they're actually now um, participating in less hours per week um, than the white youth. We look at also, um, so specifically in the Southwest region, um, one of the most alarming things is that we've seen about 25% of kids who prior to the pandemic were participating in sports three or more days per week have now completely lost interest in participating in sports. And so how do we get those kids re-engaged and back being physically active? Um, on average, throughout the pandemic, um, children have spent 6.5 less hours per week on sports. Um, game time has decreased by almost 60%, um, and practice time has dropped by over half. Um, and then there's been this huge shift to individual sports. So I don't know if any of you have tried to buy a bicycle um, <laughs> during the pandemic, um, but buying a good mountain bike, there's a wait list of one to three years. Um, and I was victim to that myself when we tried to get my husband a new mountain bike that we were still waiting for um, that we tried to get at Christmas time. And so bicycling went from the 16th most popular sport to actually the third most popular sport. Um, there's definitely um, areas where parents are more comfortable in letting their kids participate. Um, there is also a study looking at um, what parents are concerned about going back and parents are still concerned about either them getting sick with um, COVID or their child getting sick from COVID. Um, but there's still, even despite that, um, we've seen an uptick in the number of kids who are getting back to participating in sports. Um, you can see the individual and pickup sports um, 
families are much more comfortable and that's been even through the pandemic. The red bar is actually data from May of 2019. The dark blue bar is June of 2019 and the light blue bar is a uh, September of 2019. This was just, um, data was just released in April and it kind of mirrored this where individual pickup sports uh, families are very comfortable with participating in. Um, definitely we're seeing a little bit more comfort with about half of the families who um, filled out the survey being comfortable with travel or elite club sports. Um, but definitely neighborhood pickup up games and then even intramural and interscholastic sports at school. Um, and this is waxing a little bit as we've seen sort of fluctuations with uh, levels of COVID in the community as well. And so how do we go from, you know, these empty fields now to getting these kids back to free play? You know, free play is really important. And so um, even from the standpoint of, you know, we don't necessarily need to organize practice, but we need to have opportunities for these kids to be able to be playing with each other and being active. And so, you know, we joke sometimes, but, you know, Bo knew a lot of things, you know, he's one of the first professional athletes who, or at least most prominent athletes who played on multiple um, professional teams. And so how do we get back to, to really understanding that these kids need to be sport sampling and need to be involved in many sports um, and they don't need to be participating in one sport, you know, throughout the whole year. And in fact, those kids typically burn out much, much, much sooner before they get to even the collegiate level or have injured themselves. And so, you know, I think we need to go back and we need to ask our customer and who is the customer here? The customer is really the kids, although I think we've lost sight of that in this uh, club sport world where parents and financially are the drivers. Um, but that's where we're losing a lot of these kids as well. And so the number one rule in business is, you know, your customer and really the person participating is the child. Um, and if you look at so sports sociology papers, less than 1% actually examine youth sports from the child's perspective, yet it's youth sports and we're not talking to the youth. Um, nine out of 10 children actually say fun is the main reason they participate in sports and they gave 81 different reasons of how of why sports are fun. What's interesting is that winning actually ranked in the bottom half um, and it was even lower in one of the lowest ratings by girls. Um, and what's, you know, what many of us who have kids or who sort of live in this world know is that children really don't obsess over the results. You know, I think about my own daughter who's an ice skater and I'm still like, you know, she competes and she gets done and I'm like, oh, you know, could have done these things or she did this differently. And she gets off the ice and she's like, yeah, she's like, I skated really good today. It's the best I've skated and I'm going to go to practice and we'll see what happens next time. But um, she's already over it. And, you know, I'm still thinking about it later in the evening, but by dinner time, you know, it's the, the last thing that's on her mind and she's moved on and, you know, is just ready to kind of go back to practice and work hard and, and perform well. And so, you know, it's really alarming because when you talk to the kids, six of 10 kids or 60% of kids quit because they lost interest. And so why are they losing interest? You know, they definitely don't lose interest in video games and video games give kids what they want. And so when we look at what kids say is the most fun about sports, it's really number one was trying your best. Number two is when the coach treats the player with respect. So looking at coaching and coaching education, to make sure our coaches are providing good opportunities for kids that they um, enjoy. Number three, getting playing time. And so the kids want to be part of the action. Number four, playing well together as a team. Um, and so they're there for the socio, um, socio, sociologic parts of the game and that social interaction getting along with teammates, more of that social interaction and then exercising being active. And so, you know, these are all the reasons that all of us should be physically active and participate in sports. When you looked at the least fun, you know, in that bottom half, winning was number 48, playing in tournaments, 63. Number 66 was practicing with specialty trainers and coaches. Number 67, earning medals or trophies. Number 73, traveling to new places to play. And number 81, getting pictures taken. And what's funny is these are all things that, you know, parents talk about. These are all the things the parents told about. They're like, oh, we're going to this new place for this tournament, or they get to have this tournament in this cool place. You know, they get medals, trophies. We take pictures of them all the time. It's funny. There's just like a pile of <laughs> medals and trophies in my house that really doesn't do anything after, after the event. It just sits there and collects dust. And so those are really not the things that, you know, they enjoyed about it or that were interesting to them. What's really even more interesting is when you interview parents, you know, parents actually, their goals for sports participation are not unlike the goals for the kids. Um, you know, they want 
a good mental health experience. They want the kids to have the physical health benefits. They want them to have fun. Um, they want them to have social skills and peer relationships. And they ranked competition last as well. And so it's really, you know, what is the driver that just keeps motivating this? Because if, you know, parents are true to what they're answering of what's most important, then it, it aligns a lot with what's important for the kids. And so um, the Aspen Institute in their, in their, um, uh, Building Healthy Athletes um, program really has these questionnaires, which I think are great and, um, you know, can take up time when patients are waiting in the, in the waiting room um, that can be started even in infancy for, you know, their well child checks. And it really can serve as drivers for what conversations need to happen in the room. And so, you know, the first one is for the young athletes and it's really about building an athlete for life. And so, you know, you can read these. It's a very busy slide, but I want to just include them. And it just talks about, you know, encouraging skill development and giving opportunities to kids to have places that they can move, finding safe places for them in the community, encouraging them to seek preschools that have active learning um, that really focus on encouraging learning through play, um, which is the best way kids learn anyways. Um, and, you know, encouraging them or providing them with lists of toys that encourage movement or encourage learning these fundamental movement skills like throwing, you know, balls are cheap. You can get them at the dollar store. Um, you can kick it, you can throw it, you can roll it, um, you know, having them roll over, having them do somersaults, like all of these things are really important to learn how to move in all the planes that our body moves is, moves in three dimensions. And then teaching families about something called the American development um, model principles. And this is really where I use the framework for the, for the United States Olympic Committee. Um, because I really think that it's helpful to start at an early age, emphasizing what is important and what programs these parents should be looking for that will be good for their kids. So we look at getting kids off the couch and into the game. This is sort of in that toddler to like early school age. And these are, you know, making sure that parents are aware how many hours, of, you know, an hour a day they should be physically active, you know, looking for that fifth vital sign. Encouraging parents to regularly engage in physical, you know, having their kids in, engage in, in physical activity and sports and for them to be active too. You know, there's, like we talked about, if they're active, their kids tend to be active. Um, and then asking having them ask their child what sports they want to learn. You know, we always navigate to the easy things like that low hanging fruit, like soccer is available, gymnastics is available. Um, but you know, there are 120 different sports and there is opportunities almost everywhere. And there's youth development opportunities where there are cheap and, and, you know, affordable ways for families to like get their kids engaged because they want to build these sports, you know, things that you don't think about all the time, like handball or fencing, you know, these are sports that are out there and available for kids. And so ask them what they're interested in. Sometimes they may have seen something they're like, that would be really cool to do. And if they're, if they have that interest, then they're more engaged in doing it and they have more fun. Um, and then advocating with schools to have PE and recess test scores are higher. So it's not all about just how much we can cram in their little brains, but giving them that outlet, um, um, to be able to be physically active and engage and have them have better focus concentration in the classroom. Um, you know, for the kids who are physically, who are engaged in sports at this age, it's also important for parents to take that step back and, and be like, am I in a program that meets the goals that I have for my child and that my child has for themselves? You know, ask the kid why they want to play sports. If they're like, I just want to have fun and I want to hang out with some, my friends, um, then give them those opportunities. You know, even if coaches are pushing you to like let them play year round and, and push them onto these like club teams, it may take them away from their friends. It may take them away from, you know, having fun and drive them to things that they're not developmentally ready for um, and to make that commitment. Ask them what sports interest them. Encourage unstructured or loosely structured play. So practice for young kids really isn't, um, you know, organized. It's a lot of playing games and just them learning through experimenting um, and then seeking uh, programs that promote multi-sport multi participation. You know, we are in, a, in an area where we have weather that does not permit, you know, um, does not stop us from participating year round. And so we have these coaches that are driving this mindset that your kid has to play year round in order to be competitive, to be to make the high school team. And they have all these examples of how that's happened and then for them to be able to play collegiately. And the reality is when you, you know, survey collegiate athletes and even Olympic athletes, they didn't sport specialize when they were young. They were sport sampling. They played different sports and complementary sports and, and had fun sort of developing different skills and different uh, fundamental movement patterns. And so those are really important if we want to look at how we maintain that physical activity for life. Um, and that there should be a practice to game ratio of really two to one. Um, 
and, and providing kids with equal playing time. They want to be part of the action. When they're not part of the action, they're going to quit and leave because they just, they're not interested anymore because it's not giving them what they want. Um, and look for clubs that really seek um, or, you know, community-based rec programs that are getting feedback from the kids and the parents um, to build those programs that really um, drive that and that promote physical literacy. So I want to just spend a couple of minutes to sort of look at something they call the athletic development model. So what this is, is it's a framework that was decide, devi, or designed by the U.S. Olympic Committee, and it came out of USA Hockey. Um, and it really is five stages for proper athletic development that focuses on allowing kids to discover, learn, and play. Um, it creates universal access for opportunity for all athletes. And so you'll see, you know, um, like U.S. figure skating and um, U.S. hockey. Uh, they're probably the two that have kind of developed this uh, the best. And so they provide free lessons for kids to sample and to learn and see if they like the sport, um, you know, before they actually get engaged in the sport. They provide equipment um, so that kids can participate. And so some of those barriers um, that are financial barriers are sort of um, in those early stages when they're young are eliminated to allow them to participate. Um, providing developmentally appropriate activities to emphasize motor and fundamental skills and then allowing them to have multi-sport participation. They want to make it fun, engaging, and progressively challenging as they get older um, because when they're ready to accept and enjoy those challenges and looking for quality coaching at all levels. And so the outcomes that they wanted to really drive with this is to grow both the general athlete population and the pool of elite athletes from which future U.S. Olympians and Paralympians, Paralympians are selected um, to develop fundamental movement skills that transfer between sports and to provide an appropriate avenue to fulfill an individual's athletic potential and to create a generation ultimately that loves sport and physical activity and transfers that passion to the next generation. So it gives back. So stage one is really the discovery of key concepts and motor skills to learn how the sport is played. Um, and so this is usually like years zero to 12 as far as experience go. The goal here is to have fun. This is like free play, open gym, PE at school. And, the, and then they really want to learn those fundamental movement patterns and the rules of the game. Stage two is really where they're engaged in the sport. They've had experience with the sport, but they want to explore more organized training options. And so this is where they kind of understand, you know, understand the rules and the techniques of the sport um, from a from a psychological, uh, physiologic and um, standpoint, they're able to really kind of take those and, and combine those technical skills and tactical skills to really start to kind of, um, you know, learn uh, sort of how to train for that sport. Um, and this is where they start to have a little bit more competition with rec competition and then also organized league play. Um, and then Really what drives moving into this stage from stage one is the athlete's readiness and motivation. They've got to be motivated to do this. They want to sort of, you know, start kind of training a little bit and, and have more structure to their participation. And that is fun for them at that point. So stage three is really where you transition to the, um, the train and compete phase. Um, and so this is really going to be a program that meets their interests, goals, and their needs. And so this is where they really want to start to maximize their potential. Um, so they begin to focus on particular sports. They are probably still going to multi-sport, but it's really for cross-training for the main sports that they're interested in. And that may still be more than one still needs to be fun and they really are seeking at this point opportunities to further their development skills and so this is where they might get like private coaches or you know if they're in baseball they might you know seek out a pitching coach because they really enjoy pitching and they want to you know hone that skill in um and then also there needs to be some focus training for the coaches um to kind of give give them you know help them to be able to let these kids reach their potential there's usually a consistent training schedule so that you know they can clearly tell you i participate this many hours a week you know and then this is my competition season. And they really start to have, you know, more club competitions. They move into that middle and high school range they have, you know, between schools and, and different communities. Um, and some of them who are, you know, in sports that aren't school-based will start to compete in local and then kind of move into regional national competitions as their skills um, kind of progress to that level. And then we get into stage four, which is um, kind of really in the high school age group. And so this is where kind of there's a, a divide where either the kids kind of progress down to excel for high performance. Like they're like, I love sports. This is what I want to do. I want to focus on this sport for, you know, to, to achieve like high performance. And so this is where competitions, they seek out, you know, kind of at their skill level to, you know, and to, and to challenge them, but also to make them better. 
Um, and then they're kind of competing at that elite um, and international competitions at this point. And they're usually single sport focused. Um, they do cross train. They, have, they are able to make that commitment from a psychological perspective to ongoing and annual or long term training program. And then there's the other group that decides, you know what, I love participating in sports, but I do this for fun and I don't need to have that elite competition drive. I just want to participate and be successful in what I do. I want to set goals for myself um, and meet those goals. And so they enjoy their time of being just healthy and being involved in physical activity. Um, and so, you know, these are usually the kids who are like, I'm going to play through high school. And when I get done, I'm playing because I love to play with my friends and I like, you know, to have a little bit of competition, but I don't need to like be competing at that next level. You know, this is, this is where, you know, I'm going to kind of finish. Um, and then many times, you know, they still finish out with their club, but they're like, I'm just going to, you know, I'll probably play intramurals in, in college because I love to participate and I like to still be athletic, but I don't need to be, you know, dedicating my life to training and, um, and doing what those that are trying to achieve those high levels are doing. And then lastly is really that, that mentorship and, and giving back. And so this is where, you know, the, we've done a good job. You realize that like, this is important and you want to kind of trans, translate this back to other kids. And so oftentimes where they become coaches or they're working with um, these sports programs in a management pers perspective. Um, and so this is, and then continuing to participate even, you know, on a competitive level with master's programs or, um, or other areas. And so um, lastly, just in the last few minutes, I think one of the things that parents sometimes struggle with is like finding a sport that would be good for their kid. Their kid's like, I don't really know what I want to do, um, but they know that there are certain things that are important. And so kind of a little cool tool is called the Healthy Sport Index. And this was created by um, the with Project Play with the Aspen Institute in, in conjunction with um, the Hospital for Special Surgery. And so what they did is they um, really put three areas they felt were important, those being physical activity, safety, and psychosocial aspects of sport. Um, and it's a dial where you can dial in what you think is important. And they looked at the 10 most popular high school sports for boys and then for girls. And what it does is based on your priorities of what's important, it kind of realigns that list um, from one to 10. And then overall, it also gives you the characteristics of each sport if you look individually. And then um, you can also compare sports. So um, you can, and, and it gives recommendations on companion sports. And so you can kind of do those side by side com um, comparisons, um, but also just look at what played into giving them that ranking and what the health related data is, you know, what are the risks to injury, what are the catastrophic risks to injury, um, to kind of help guide and make those decisions. And so I'm going to actually take us there um, really quickly. And so we'll kind of jump over to there and stop share for just a second and we'll get a new share here. Um, and so this is basically what it looks like when you go there. And so it's like, find the best sport for you. Basically, here's your little dial. So you've got physical activity. You can move the bar to low emphasis or high emphasis. And you can see how it changes sort of your little bar graph over here. Um, and then, you know, safety is really important. You're like, I really don't want them to get, you know, hurt. I want them to not have risk of catastrophic injury or head injury, which plays into that as well. Um, and then, you know, I am also really worried about, I just want them to have like a good experience. So those are going to kind of be equal there. Um, but I'm not as worried about them being as physically active. I want them to be able to have that social engagement. And so then your results basically, um, you know, give you that, those results based on sort of where you filled out that chart. And so, you know, for boys, girls, boys, it would be swimming with that profile. Tennis would be that profile and it kind of numbers them all the way down. And so you can see this includes softball, cross country, soccer, track and field, volleyball, basketball, um, and baseball and wrestling, um, and then football, lacrosse, and cheerleading. And so then you can actually pick the individual sports. And so, um, you know, here we'll just, we'll take girls soccer. So you can click on soccer. And then basically what it does is it takes you, it says overall, it got a rating of fifth out of 10. So this was of the sports just overall in general. Um, and then basically it talks about sort of how it got there. So for physical activity, it was second out of 10. So it's a pretty physically demanding um, activity. 
looks how much uh, time is spent in vigorous activity versus lying down, sitting or standing and walking. Um, and so you have that little pie chart. Um, and then uh, for safety, it was really 10 out of 10, um, which clearly we know the injury rate for soccer is pretty high, um, particularly for girls. Um, and so, you know, and then the concussion rate is fairly high too. And so they were 10 out of 10 for concussion. Injury rate um, was, this is out of 1,000 athlete exposures, so 26.6. Um, and then looking at time loss for injury and things like that. And it shows you where they ranked out of the other sports. Um, and then psychosocial, they were third out of 10. So there's a lot of social benefits why a lot of people enjoy playing soccer. Um, and so the, psych the social aspects, they look at sort of just personal social skills, cognitive skills, goal setting, initiative, health, negative experiences. So some of those things that we want our kids to learn through their sports participation. And then it also looks at um, substance abuse. So, you know, cigarette use, 8.7% of high school soccer players, binge drinking was pretty high. They were eight out of 10 with 20.3 marijuana use, fifth out of uh, the 10 sports. And then academic achievement, uh, cutting class, unfortunately, um, you know, it's relatively low for them, seventh out of 10. Um, a and A minus students, six out of 10. So, you know, pretty academically uh, driven students. And then graduating from college, they were fourth out of 10 with 75% of uh, soccer athletes um, in high school will graduate from college. Um, and then we look at the psychological health. So self-esteem, fatalism, self-efficacy, loneliness, self-degradation, and then social support. Um, overall, um, you know, they ranked, I think, second out of the 10. And so then in addition to that, when you come down to the bottom, you can compare the sport. So obviously we knew soccer was fifth out of 10. We saw its profile. So let's say, you know, our kid, our daughter is thinking about potentially doing soccer and she also likes tennis and she's thinking maybe softball might be interesting. And so you can compare those individually. And so here's, you know, the comparison soccer versus softball. Softball was eight out of 10. Physical activity, definitely much less physically demanding. So if, you know, she's not really into running a lot and doing a lot of vigorous activity, softball may be a better choice versus, um, you know, also safety, safer sport, less injury risk, um, and then still gets great psychosocial uh, benefits. And so um, it's just, it's kind of a nice tool. And then there's tennis basically here. So tennis is sort of middle of the road, definitely the safest sport. Um, and then looking at psychosocial. Um, and so those things, I think it's just a nice little tool that basically um, gives you kind of the opportunity uh, to help guide parents or to let them look at it and just let them play around with it um, with the kids, which I think comes in very handy. Um, and so in summary, um, you know, I just think it's very important that we talk with parents about their goals for physical activity for their children at every well child check, really helping to provide resources to raise physically literate children and encourage parents to be physically active with their children. Um, have parents ask their children, you know, ask the, ask the consumer what their goals are for sports and physical activity, and then really keep those in mind. Um, because I think sometimes we, even as parents, lose sight of that very quickly about why we started our kids in sports and what we think is important for them to get out of it and encourage parents to be involved in physical activity or sport opportunities that meet the child's goals and their goals, um, as long as they're in line with each other. And then encouraging parents to follow an athlete development model, um, you know, not giving into that. It's very hard as a parent um, <laughs> to very quickly, you know, be sort of just, you know, overwhelmed by all of the input that you're getting from coaches and other people, um, you know, that are really driven sometimes by the wrong motivations. And this has become, unfortunately, the sports world has really become a financially driven um, institution. And it's really left a lot of kids um, not having the opportunity to participate because they just can't afford uh, to play in a lot of these um, clubs and leagues. And so I think it's um, important that we take that step back and really kind of drive these kids to stay in these community and youth rec leagues. Um, and then I just provided some resources for all of you that you'll have access to, and then I'm happy to take questions during the question and answer session. Thank you for your attention. All right, so if there are any uh, questions regarding that, um, so this this talk was actually recorded um, before all the events that have happened at the Olympics this week, particularly with Simone Biles, and I think it's really important. Um, it just drives the importance of understanding the athlete development model and really keeping the kid at the center of you know what they're doing because I I think it, you know it is not something that is unique to gymnastics by any means. You know, um, Michael Phelps has come out this week and talked about sort of things in swimming, and um, and so it's it's just across the board. It's really, you know, become this kind of financially driven environment. And we've lost sight, I think, of, of why we've actually want our kids to participate in sports and how we want them to be lifelong athletes and physically active. And so I think um, just looking at some of those things are important. Um, if anyone else wants to jump on on the panel to um, kind of go through here. Um, 
There was um, one question about recommendations or limitations for those with hypermobility syndromes. Um, and separately, what do you foresee as the ripple effect of NCAA following athletes to be paid? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so just the, the question about hypermobility syndromes, um, you know, I, I think all of us actually, Dr. Hall and I particularly have a lot of kids with hypermobility and EDS in our clinic. It's not saying that we want more, but we do have a lot of them. <laughs> Unfortunately, they get injured a lot. Um, and so, um, I, I think one of the things that I talk with those families a lot about is just the balance between strength and flexibility. Um, you know, I had one kid and, and I think talking to them, I actually just had a kid the other day who has horrible, horrible ankle instability and shoulder instability and talking about, you know, he really wants to play basketball and, you know, basketball is a very ankle demanding sport and his ankles right now at the state that they're in will just not tolerate that. And so, you know, we talked about even looking at other sports that he's not as familiar with, like fencing or, um, and then just talked about like right now working on muscle strengthening and balancing that, um, flexibility with muscle strengthening. And so doing things like swimming and stationary bike, um, to build up that strength, to hopefully get him to a point where we might be able to with bracing and with, um, you know, his own inherent strength, hopefully compensating for that, some back playing basketball, which is what he really wants to do. Um, but also encouraged him to look at, you know, other sports that are not as popular. And so that was his homework that I gave him after that visit. Um, I've had other people, you know, a lot of our hypermobility athletes migrate to sports that are um, good for lots of flexibility, like swimming and gymnastics and diving um, and dancing. And so, um, you know, what I really talk to them about is doing a good strength and conditioning program in addition to what they're being offered at their club, I think is important there. Um, and then uh, the ripple effect of NCAA uh, allowing athletes to be paid. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. We just have this financially driven model in athletics. It's not to say that I, you know, I don't, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. I definitely think, and maybe actually, you know, Dr. Hall being a former collegiate athlete can like speak to this. I definitely think that we take advantage of our collegiate athletes a lot. Um, and they commit a lot of time to what they're doing to their sport at the detriment of them being able to have a job, you know, between school and sports that is two full-time jobs that they're doing. Um, and so I think them being able to have some financial resources is important. Um, and so I, I, I think looking at that, um, I don't, you know, it's hard to say what the ripple effect is going to be on that, but I, I do think that there is some financial support besides just, you know, many of our collegiate athletes, athletes are not on a full ride scholarship. They're on partial scholarship. You know, there are still expenses that they have to, to have. Um, and some of them are on no scholarship and are playing. And so I think we need to look at that, particularly when you look at like D2 and D3 schools, especially, um, they are all academic athletes. And so, and it's a big commitment. I ran track my freshman year in college for a little while. <laughs> I was like, this is a lot being a science major and having labs and trying to get cross country practice in and running like 30 plus miles a week, which Dr. Hall addressed is, you know, we need to be doing that. That's really when my coach and I had our separate ways. But so I think, um, I, you know, I think that there has to be a balance there. Um, I think that there is some need for that. And I don't know, Dr. Hall, if you have any other kind of opinions with your experience with soccer and being a collegiate athlete as well. Yeah, I, I actually uh, just saw one example that would be good, just, just food for thought. So the number one rated uh, quarterback uh, is a junior in Texas. And he, uh, so just to clarify, the NCAA ruling is for name, image, and likeness. So not uh, just paid to play, but uh, name, image, and likeness. Now this junior in high school has a million dollar offer to use his name, image, and likeness. But Texas, the state of Texas does not allow you to use that name, image, and likeness as a high school uh, athlete. So his dilemma is, does he forfeit his senior season to collect that million dollar offer that's being provided by a private company. I don't know that there's a right answer, but that is not a ramification or ripple effect that I was expecting whatsoever. And I think we will continue to see examples like this. Um, and I, yeah, I don't really have uh, much of a comment on it, but I think it's something just to kind of, you know, uh, digest a little bit uh, is as well, you know, this, I don't know this athlete's financial situation, but, um, I'm sure there will be other athletes who don't have, uh, a financial situation or, um, one that's, um, been, um, kind of in a good position at home, uh, 
to where, I mean, I even have kids on, on teams we have here in Arizona that are struggling for food. And so if they were in that same position, I think uh, it would be a quite easy decision. So, you know, it's interesting to say the least. Yeah, and I mean, and looking at some of those things, I mean, just in regards to kind of that, you know, athlete development model, but then also injury risk, you know, if you take a junior out of, you know, his high school senior season, and you bump him already up, you know, where he's, you know, going to be playing at a higher level and stuff, is he, you know, really developmentally, you know, even from a mental perspective there, or, you know, is that decision more driven as exactly like Dr. Hall mentioned, there are a lot of socioeconomic factors that play into you know, why many of our athletes have made decisions that they have made. And it's not necessarily because, you know, I mean, you know, our it, Olympic athletes are paid the same way, essentially. It's like mm -hmm. name, you know, likeness and stuff. And so, you know, a lot of things are driven there, you know, from that perspective. And is that the right perspective? We're really not focusing on, you know, the benefits of sports participation, the athletic, you know, ability and things like that, and them participating to stay healthy. It's become, you know, sort of this, this, whole other business of sports, um, which I think is, is what the challenge is. Um, I actually don't know the answer to the next question. Do we have the same rule, Brandon? Do you know, or similar? I, rules? I, I, I never even thought of it <laughs> until I read this story. Um, so I don't know. Does anybody else know? I'm not aware of, I wouldn't be surprised if we do or we'll see, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll look it up. We'll look it yeah. up. We'll let you know. We'll look it up and find out. All right. All right. Any other questions? All right. So we'll go ahead and move on. So um, our next speaker um, is Dr. Brian Kelly. He's going to give a talk on back pain in youth athletes. Um, and then we will um, have question and answer after that. He's based, um, he's kind of split between Scottsdale and the West Valley um, and also does a little bit of main campus. And then he and Dr. Hall actually kind of lead our ultrasound guided injections with do which Dr. Vaughn had um, alluded to earlier in his talk, so. Good morning. My name is Brian Kelly and I'm one of the sports medicine physicians at Phoenix Children's Hospital. Today, I have the pleasure of talking about back pain in youth athletes. I have no disclosures. Here's the outline for today's talk, as well as the objectives. We're going to first go over the different causes of back pain. Then we'll briefly discuss the anatomy and the epidemiology, specifically who gets it. Then we'll talk about risk factors for developing back pain, as well as the evaluation and physical exam findings of athletes with back pain. Then we'll get to the meat of today's talk. We'll talk about the different injury patterns of the posterior and anterior column, as well as the imaging studies, treatment options, and return to sport considerations for these different injury patterns. So let's first talk about the different causes of back pain. Back pain can be from acute trauma, overuse injuries, congenital anomalies, inflammation, infection, or tumors. The focus of today's talk will be on overuse injuries, specifically of the lumbar spine. We will also discuss different congenital anomalies that, if present, can predispose an athlete to developing back pain. The anatomy of the spine includes the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine. There are 31 articulating vertebrae with fibrocartilaginous disc in between each vertebrae. In addition, there is fascia, ligament, and muscle connections. The cervical and lumbar spine have a natural lordosis, and the thoracic spine has a natural kyphosis. The anterior column of the spine consists of the vertebral body, the intervertebral disc, and the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. The posterior column includes the neural arch, bilateral facet joints, two transverse processes, and the spinous process. Next, we're gonna talk about who gets back pain. If you look at all the pediatric and adolescent athletes, at least 15% of them will complain of back pain at some point in their career. However, the rates and incidents vary by sport. Back pain is very, very common in artistic sports. Specifically, looking at gymnasts, approximately 43% of high school gymnasts will report having an injury or developing low back pain at some point in their career. In one study, it was reported that 5.9 up to 32.8% of gymnasts 
developed spondylolysis at some point in their athletic career. In a study by McKaylee out of Boston Children's, they reported 11 to 18% of dancers will have a low back injury or low back pain at some point in their career. Lastly, looking at figure skaters, approximately a third, whether it was male or female, developed some sort of low back pain or an injury uh, during their time of skating. Next, next, let's look at the risk factors for developing back pain. No matter if you're an athlete or not an athlete, strength is very, very important for all your normal daily activities, but it is specifically important for your athletic activities. And if you have low strength, specifically in the core or hip extensors, then it is a risk factor for developing back pain. Another risk factor for developing back pain is increased lumbar lordosis. It is thought that athletes with an increased lordosis put more pressure on the posterior elements of the spine and therefore can develop back pain with their athletic activities. Another risk factor uh, for our athletes is skeletal maturation, specifically times of rapid growth such as adolescence can predispose athletes to, develop in, to developing injuries, especially back pain. Another risk factor is time spent in sport or the volume of time spent in sport. The more you train, the more competitions, the more games, more practices, et cetera, the higher, you, the higher risk you are to de developing uh, back pain. Next, we'll touch on the evaluation and physical exam findings. So when taking a history of a patient with back pain, you wanna ask, is this an acute uh, incidence of back pain or has this been gradual pain that's developed over weeks, months, or even years? You wanna figure out the exact location where the back pain is. Is it more midline? Is it more paraspinal? And you want to talk about the duration of the back pain. Is it something that just lasts seconds, does it last hours, or does it last all day and never go away? You want to see if the back pain radiates. Does it go down the leg? Does it go up the spine? You want to discuss exacerbating factors with the athlete. Is it worse with activity? Does it get um, better with rest or sleeping? And then you want to talk about uh, previous treatments that they tried, such as over-the-counter pain medicines, rest, or physical therapy. Uh, when evaluating a patient with back pain, um, you want to look at their height, look at their bite and score, check their flexibility, look at the skin, check their range of motion, such as flexion and extension. You want to do a very good neurological exam. So strength, sensation, deep tendon reflexes. Then look at their different uh, biomechanics and hip and pelvic uh, movement, see if there's any dysfunction. When doing your biomechanical evaluation, you could do simple things in the clinic, such as a single leg squat, test gluteal strength, core strength, abdominal strength, hip flexor strength. You could look for tightness, um, the hip flexors, as well as tightness of the hamstrings. Next, let's talk about the different injury patterns. We'll first start with posterior column injuries. Uh, the first uh, type of injuries I like to discuss would be spondylolysis. Uh, spondylolysis is a stress fracture involving the pars interarticularis and the posterior column of the spine. It is secondary to repetitive loading of the pars from the facet process above while in lumbar hyperextension. If you look at the general pedi pediatric population, uh, it is accepted that about four to five percent will develop spondylolysis at some point. However, if you look at the athletic population, it is estimated up to 47 percent of those with back pain will develop spondylolysis. There are other risk factors that are known to increase um, 
your risk of developing spondylolysis, such as uh, spina bifida occulta, which carries a 3.7 fold increase odds ratio for developing spondylolysis. If you look at spondylolysis in the athlete population, its highest percentages occur actually in throwing athletes, such as baseball players, uh, javelin, uh, and there's also a high uh, incidence in artistic gymnasts as well as rowers. The most common location of spondylolysis is at L5. It could be bilateral in 80% of cases and multi-level in 4% of cases. When taking a history, um, uh, these patients generally have back pain that's related to our activity and is exacerbated with their activity. Generally don't have pain with sitting and they don't have pain at night. Uh, when you examine them, they have significant pain with hyperextension or with a test called the stork test, as shown here on the right. And generally, dural tension signs are, are absent in patients with uh, spondylolysis. The classic finding of spondylolysis on plain radiographs is the Scotty dog, where on the oblique film uh, shows the collar of the dog, as in this cartoon, and then on this plain film. However, this is very insensitive to identifying early fractures. If spondylolysis becomes uh, chronic, you can develop spondylolisthesis. Uh, spondylolisthesis is the forward slippage of one vertebrae on the caudal segment. It is most often seen at L5, S1, and is secondary to bilateral spondylolysis at a single level. Here's a plain film uh, showing uh, spondylolysis at the L5, S1 uh, segment here. Uh, when considering imaging for spondylolysis, there are other imaging modalities besides plain films. One of these would be a spec bone scan. It is the most sensitive. However, it also has the most amount of radiation for um, uh, the type of test, but it will pick up early spondylolysis as well as late spondylolysis due to the high sensitivity of this test. Another modality is MRI. MRI has uh, demonstrated very good sensitivity, uh, especially with the demonstration of pedicle edema representing an acute phase response or acute phase fracture uh, early in the disease process. However, the added benefit of this type of study is that there's no radiation. Another imaging modality is CT scan. It is very sensitive. However, there's a significant amount of radiation with this type of study. It is best used to demonstrate details of fracture as early, progressive, or terminal. It is often reserved if there is a problem with healing, such as a painful uh, non-union. Our more recent type of imaging modality has been EOS X-ray imaging. Uh, this presides low dose uh, radiation to image a body part, such as a spine. In fact, it has only about a third the dose of radiation compared to your typical plain film. Uh, EOS can be helpful for a surgery planning, like in a patient for uh, spondylolisthesis. Now let's talk about the different treatments for spondylolysis, and there is a uh, great debate in how you treat uh, a patient with spondylolysis. However, what is agreed upon is the goal is to eliminate pain and return the athlete to full function. There should be a period of rest from sports and there should be physical therapy at some point. However, what's debated is how long should we rest the athlete? When should we start physical therapy? Should we start it right away? Should we wait a couple weeks? Should we wait till the patient's pain-free? Should we brace the patient? 
Uh, if we do brace the patient, how long should we brace the patient? And then like the treatment in general, and then return to sport considerations. Is it based on pain? Is it based on time? Uh, lots of debate in this. Uh, uh, one of the debated topics that we talked about was bracing. An example of a brace used to treat spondylolysis is the Boston overlapping brace. The goal of this brace is to limit lumbar hyperextension, which is believed to be the injury factor. However, the brace has not been shown to improve overall long-term outcomes. Proponents for the brace have shown a shorter return to sports activities, often at four to six weeks, with continued wearing the brace for three to four months. Uh, there has been different modalities to show non-octave treatment to be successful. And successful non-octave treatment doesn't necessarily need to be a bony union. You could have a fibrous union and still have successful non-octave treatment as long as the patient is pain-free and going back to sports. In a big study by Klein et al. in 2009, they found that 84% of athletes did well with non-octave treatment in a one-year time period. Success was not associated with bony union. And in addition, they did a subgroup analysis comparing the clinical outcome of patients treated with a brace to patients treated without a brace. And there was no uh, clinically significant difference. So if the patient had the brace or did not have a brace, they basically did the same at about one year. Another posterior uh, column condition I'd like to discuss would be vertilati syndrome. This is a transitional vertebrae. It's usually located at L5. It creates a pseudoarthrosis at the sacral ala and is reported in four to 30% of the population. Uh, people with vertilati syndrome are usually symptom free and usually they discover that they have it as a kind of an incidental finding, like they get an x-ray for an abdominal pain, it shows that they have this. However, in athletes with repetitive lumbar hyperextension, this may aggravate the pseudoarthrosis found in Bertolotti syndrome. Treatment for this condition is initially conservative with relative rest, anti-inflammatory medicines, and a physical therapy program specifically paying attention to the spinal mechanics. If these initial conservative measures, conservative measures fail, you can consider steroid injections. A surgical resection of the pseudoarthrosis has been described, but it is rarely performed. Another condition of the posterior column is spinous process apophysitis. This is seen in athletes with repetitive hyperextension of the lumbar spine, especially in gymnasts, dancers, figure skaters, or artistic athletes. It is thought to be from repetitive impact and repetitive hyperextension. When you examine the patient, they have pain with uh, palpation at the spinous process, and they can have pain with hyperextension. This may mimic uh, spondylolysis in the, in the clinical setting. However, the pain is worse when you directly palpate the spinous process. Imaging for spinous process apophysitis, if you were to get an X-ray or CT scan, this usually shows no abnormality. Uh, spec scans would be expected to show increased uptake at the affected spinous processes as well as MRI would demonstrate increased activity at the involved spinous process apophysis. Treatment for this condition is usually six weeks of relative rest, and they're usually good. An athlete can go back as tolerated. If they fail relative rest, you can consider physical therapy. If physical therapy doesn't work, you can consider bracing. Um, this could be used for those refractory cases. On occasion, activity modification, physical therapy, other treatment modalities may be extended for months just depending on the athlete before they get back to sport. Next, we'll talk about anterior column injuries of the spine. 
So a herniated disc, um, this usually occurs when axial loads are sufficient to force the nucleus pulposus material past the annulus fibrosus. The nucleus pulposus material can mechanically compress an adjacent nerve root causing neurologic symptoms. The disc material in a herniated disc has been implicated as a cause of aging for chemically induced low back pain due to the irritative nature of the nucleus pulposus when it comes into contact with structures other than the annulus fibrosus. Herniated discs are most common in the general population in patients aged in the 30s and 50s. It rarely occurs in, ch in children. However, there is a reported incidence of 0.9%. In young athletes with back pain, one study did demonstrate disc involvement in 10% of cases, such as in gymnasts, weightlifters, football players, and rowers. In a patient with a herniated disc, they'll generally have low back pain. They will usually have a sitting intolerance. Uh, they can have ridiculous symptoms. And when you examine, pain is worse uh, with forward flexion. Also, when you examine them, they can have weakness or sensory losses or diminished deep tendon reflexes if there is a nerve root impingement. And the patient can have a positive straight leg test finding if there is a dural tension. Herniated discs are most commonly found at levels L4 and L5 and L5 and S1, which account for 90% of all cases. Uh, a bad complication of a herniated disc is caught equina syndrome. Uh, if a patient has bowel or bladder incontinence or saddle paresthesias, you need to consider cauda equina syndrome. And if this is present, you need to emergently referral, refer this patient for uh, surgical treatment. The initial treatment for a herniated disc though is conservative. Uh, relative rest, NSAIDs, physical therapy, this will take care of approximately 90% of patients with a herniated disc. Imaging considerations of patients with a herniated disc. Um, in general, plain films are very low yield. I only recommend it if there was a history of trauma just to rule out a fracture. If you are very concerned about a herniated disc, uh, MRI is the study of choice. Uh, definitely order it right away if there is neurologic compromise. Imaging can be used for planning surgical procedures as well as injections. Uh, here's an image, uh, specifically an MRI uh, taken from a case report from 2011, showing a nine-year-old uh, with a herniated disc at uh, L4, L5. Uh, so for persistent neurologic symptoms, uh, despite conservative management, surgery can be considered. So if they fail physical therapy, fail NSAIDs, and they still have neurological symptoms, then they can undergo disectomy or some other, some other neurologic, some other surgical procedure. However, low back pain itself, just persistent low back pain is not an indication for surgery. Uh, in a study out of a, in a study by a neurosurgery group, uh, they reported their uh, outcomes in cases uh, for herniated disc uh, surgery in the pediatric population. And what they found is that the majority of these patients, uh, about two thirds of them described themselves as competitive athletes. Uh, some of them did have motor deficits and sensory deficits, and the majority of them did have a positive straight leg test on exam, but two thirds of these patients who underwent surgery described themselves as competitive athletes. A return to sport considerations in patients with herniated disc. With conservative treatment, these athletes typically return in three to six months. If these patients undergo surgery, 
they can return and sometimes as early as two months, but sometimes as late as 12 months. Everyone's different and there's a, a wide range of, of, of times that athletes return from a surgical procedure. Another anterior column uh, injury of the spine is lumbar Schwarman's disease, also known as atypical, atypical Schwarman's disease. This is an end plane deformity with Schmoll's nodes. It occurs during a period of rapid growth. Excuse me. This results in end plate irregularities of the vertebrae. It can be seen in the upper lumbar, but is more common in the thoracic. This is typical Schwarman's, but it can be seen in the, the upper lumbar uh, vertebrae as well. Uh, typically, it affects males more than females. Uh, gymnasts are at high risk for developing this. When you see a patient with uh, lumbar Schwarman's disease that usually presents as a flexion-based complaint, it's usually quite painful. Exam can reveal a flat back as then compensating for the pain, though at times a kyphotic deformity in the lumbar spine with forward flexion is a setup for this. There are different imaging modalities that you could do for this condition that will reveal the diagnosis. X-ray, especially lateral pain radiographs, will show compressions of the end plate and Schmoll's nodes. This can also be seen on CT scan as well as MRI. So this is an example of a lateral film. And this uh, picture shows the uh, lateral MRI showing compressions of the end plate and Schmoll's nose. Treatment for this uh, condition is conservative with relative rest and anti-inflammatory medication. Temporary low dark bracing can be helpful in uh, refractory cases. Return to sports varies by athletes. Some will return in a couple months, some it will take longer. However, the athletes in greater pain with a kyphotic deformity may find it challenging to return to sports again, just due to their setup and, and their risk factors for recurring aggravation at those end plates. And next we'll talk about mechanical back pain as this is very, very common in our adolescent athlete population. This diagnosis can be made in up to 78% of adolescent athletes with back pain. Generally, it affects the low back. When you examine the patient, they're usually tender at the paraspinous muscles. All imaging studies uh, for patients with this condition will be normal. And there is no identified pathology uh, per se with any images. But on exam, they're, they're very painful usually to, to the lower back and the paraspinous muscles. Treatment is conservative with NSAIDs, relative rest from sport, and physical therapy. And the majority of them get better with this and can return to sport, usually in four to six weeks, maybe a couple months for some patients who are refractory. So to sum it up, here's our outline and objectives of what we talked about today. We did talk about the different causes of back pain and highlighted overuse and congenital anomalies that can uh, predispose patients to the back pain. Uh, we talked about the anatomy of the, the back, going over the differences in the anterior and posterior column. We talked about the epidemiology and who gets it, specifically it's high risk in the artistic athletes. We talked about different risk factors uh, that patients have, specifically strength, development, biomechanical factors, time in sport, as well as periods of, of growth or maturation. We talked about evaluation and physical exam findings, what to check for in clinic, looking at their range of motion, checking, at the, checking their neurostatus. Then we talked about different injury patterns of the posterior column, anterior column, in the anterior column. And then we touched on mechanical back pain as, very, as being very common in adolescent athletes. With regards to each of these injury patterns, 
we talked about imaging studies, x-rays, spec, CT, EOS, and MRI, as well as treatment measures to consider relative rest, NSAIDs, physical therapy, bracing, and in some cases, surgery. And we discussed return to, port, return to sport considerations for all these injuries. These are my references for the talk. And we can field questions at this time. Thank you. All right, if I can have the panelists jump back on and join us. Will the Dr. Kelly get here? There he is. There's Dr. Gately. Awesome. All right. Well, Dr. Uh, Kelly, thank you for such a great summary of um, back pain in, uh, in adolescent athletes. So um, are there, I don't see any questions yet. Is there any questions from the panelists to get started? Sure, I'll ask Brian a question. So a lot of times if we see patients in clinic, at least from my personal experience, parents are usually most worried about a disc. And so a lot of times they come in requesting an MRI even before x-rays at times. So I do my best to try to assuage those fears and hold off on the advanced imaging if we don't think it's necessary. But I don't know if you have any tips or tricks, especially for some of the primary care providers, if they're kind of faced with this challenge in their clinic. Yes, I, I get those questions or concerns as well. Um, if they have neurologic symptoms on, on physical exam, I definitely, you know, will move forward with MRI. But if their MRI, or sorry, if their physical exam is reassuring in clinic, um, I usually try to, to push for physical therapy uh, as the first uh, uh, line of treatment for getting advanced imaging. And I tell them, even if we were to get an MRI and to see a mild disc herniation, the treatment's going to be physical therapy anyway. So we might as well start with physical therapy first. I would say I, I very commonly handle those kind of the same as Dr. Kelly just mentioned um, with, you know, couching it in the fact that we're going to start with physical therapy. So it's really not going to change my management. So if, and a lot of times what I do is I give them the sort of like the safety idea that I'm going to see you back in six weeks, in four weeks of physical therapy, if you're not better, call me, we'll get the MRI. It still saves that additional visit. So we get it done before they come back to see me at six weeks. Um, and that obviously helps to alleviate also the, the insurance hurdle of, you know, they always want to see like four weeks of documented PT for most things, including back issues. So, um, and I just tell them, you know, even if we found that there was like a bulging disc, um, and I think the other thing is Dr. White in our practice, who does a lot of our adolescent um, scoliosis, but sees a ton of back, um, probably when I, you know, a long time ago, when I first started here, uh, gave me the best sort of thing of how to describe it to families. And so, you know, we do see disc pathology in kids, but it's not pathologic. It's really normal for them um, because their discs are very fluid. And so he always describes it to families as, you know, kid discs are like the fresh jelly donut that you just pick up from Krispy Kreme or, you know, rainbow donuts or wherever you like to get donuts from. And so their disc will squish and compress and squeeze out. And so sometimes you will see a bulging disc and that's totally normal. Whereas then a couple of days later, you repeat the MRI and it's not there anymore um, because they'll kind of, they're so fluid filled that they just kind of wax and wane on sort of that bulge and that, um, and that recoil um, versus adults are like the Chris, you know, the donut, the, the, the cream filled donut that got left out and it's there like the next morning and it's, you know, you compress it and it just sort of stays there a little bit. And so it's a different animal in kids versus adults. You know, we talk about this all the time. We do pediatric sports medicine for a reason because kids, you know, a lot of the pathology that we see in adults is not actually the same or treated the same in kids. And that's why it's important, you know, that kids are treated by kid doctors. And so this, I think the disc issue is another one of those. And so I tell them that, and I tell them, you know, if we, if we're, if we see a disc, we're going to send you to physical therapy anyways. And I agree with Brian, if there are neurologic symptoms, I think it warrants like getting that imaging a little bit earlier, but if there's not, then, then absolutely like trying to, you know, help them understand that, going to physical therapy is going to be kind of their best course. Cause that's what we would do. Even if we saw most things that we see on MRI. So I don't know if you have anything else to add, Randon. No, I just, I kind of asked, you know, what, what's your interest in having surgery? And then if, if they're, you know, they kind of step back and say, no, I don't want that. Then I say, okay, well then, you know, the, let's, let's go with what we know we're going to do anyway. And that's physical therapy. And sometimes when you put it in that contrast, it, it's more, uh, definitive. 
All right. Oh, perfect. Um, oh yes. Yeah, another, um, another physician who's kind of in the, in I think the, he's a radiologist actually. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. Actually. Yeah, yeah. you are. Um, so yeah, so he basically just mentioned that he agrees because this girl almost always um, look like disc bulges. And so absolutely. It's good to have that. <laughs> have that confirmation. Thank you <laughs> from the people who look at the imaging all the time. Um, perfect. Uh, any other any other questions from anyone else in the audience for Dr. Kelly? Any other comments from the panelists? All right. Well, we'll just keep moving along since we're just a smidge behind anyways. Um, so we're going to actually, we're going to have a little transition point um, just after this. So I'm going to actually duck out. So um, you'll lose me. I have, I have to drive to Pace and stay and pick up some children who've um, been at camp all week. So it'll be a little smelly, but um, um, so I'm going to actually sign off and Dr. Hall is going to actually take over and kind of introduce everyone after I introduce Kayla. So I'll introduce her in just a second and then do the last three speakers. Um, so um, with that, um, I'm going to um, also kind of use Kayla's introduction to introduce, you know, kind of a newer part of our practice that maybe not all of you are completely aware of. Uh, we did open sports physical therapy as part of our practice in 2018. Um, we have have two locations currently in the valley one actually in north phoenix um, just off of state route 51 it's essentially tatum and bell area um, and then the other location is at Mercy Gilbert. It's actually across the street from our Mercy Gilbert office that we just opened in January. Um, so both of those offices have been open since 2018. Kayla's been with us from the beginning. Um, so Kayla's actually at our North Phoenix office. Um, her, um, she's Kayla Zinger. She actually came um, to us with a lot of experience in upper extremity, um, being sort of uh, in an office under one of the leading sort of uh, upper extremity kind of physical therapists in the Valley, um, arguably. And so, and she's also a former collegiate softball player. So she can really relate to our kids. And one of the things that I would just say about our sports PT um, program is that it really is a very unique niche that we filled in the community that didn't exist before. So our office, our, our sports PT locations are geared towards just taking care of um, adolescent and youth sports athletes. And so they get to P do PT with their peers, which I think a lot of them love. We have a very high patient satisfaction and parent satisfaction rate of almost 100% at both of our clinics. And so the families just really love the experience. Um, and so if you are by one of those locations or if you um, have a family that's willing to drive, it is definitely, I think, worth it. During the summer, I have lots of my families from actually um, Peoria and Surprise actually drive to our location uh, because of the experience is just very different. And then obviously all the precautions we're taking at the hospital through the pandemic are carried over there because they're part of the hospital institution as well. Um, and so I think it's just a really great experience. The other exciting thing that I will mention regarding this is that we also have um, a Southwest Valley location that hopefully will be open this winter. Um, we're shooting for December. Um, and that is going to be across the highway. So across the um, I-10 from the Avondale uh, facility that we're actually building um, in the um, America, the sports complex that's there. We actually have sports PT that's going to be um, in one of those um, office suites that's there. So that's very exciting. Um, we are actually already kind of building that location out. And then we have a North Phoenix location, a Northwest Phoenix location that will be opening um, just off of um, 83rd Avenue and the 101 loop up in the Northwest Valley. So right before 83rd Avenue turns in, or 82nd Avenue turns into um, Lake Pleasant Parkway. So that will be actually later um, in 2022, um, but those are very exciting. And so we want to just let you know, those are on the, on the cusp. Um, so we're very excited to have, be growing our sports PT program that's been very successful. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Kayla Zinger. She is, as I mentioned, one of our physical therapists that our patients love, and she's going to give a talk very near and dear to her heart with uh, her experience with throwing on pain with throwing when it's not the shoulder's fault. Hello and welcome to my presentation. My name is Kayla Zinger and I'm one of the physical therapists in the PCH sports med department. Uh, my topic today is pain with throwing when it's not the shoulder's fault. And by that, I just mean that the root cause of the thrower's pain is not coming from a shoulder specific diagnosis. I have no financial disclaimers. Um, these are our objectives and there's gonna be a lab video that covers some of these uh, later on. So I'm gonna do my best to cover all the bases as efficiently as possible. And I apologize for any other baseball puns that may occur during this presentation. So it should come as no surprise to anyone that when we say throwers, we almost always mean pitchers. And you'll see maybe why that's the case in just a little bit. 
Um, but it's still such a problem that MLB came out with what they call the pitch smart guidelines and uh, grouped them into these ages. I put stars next to these two because this is where we tend to see uh, the most patients from in our pediatric clinic. Um, but across the board, the recommendations are the same for these couple of things. And there's no such throwing restrictions yet from USA Softball. If you wanted to take a look at the more specific um, age group guidelines, then here is the link that you can follow. And while I was doing my research uh, to kind of see what um, information might be available to uh, families when uh, talking about biomechanics and uh, maximizing performance, I came across these couple little pearls. Um, there's no way that we're going to be able to convince any baseball player or their parent that focusing on increasing their velocity is a bad call. But we should uh, keep in mind that there are few differences in optimal mechanics between youth players and more developed players, except of course that youth players generate less force and they're less consistent. There is a high, um, there, there's a strong link between high velocity and elbow injury, but a weak link to performance with um, high velocity. So keep that in mind if you need to throw that out there for your families. Um, here are the six phases of baseball pitching, which we're going to go into greater detail here in the next few slides. So the information that I've picked out for us uh, comes from this article uh, talking about kinematics and uh, different muscle uh, activation at different points. And starting with the windup, which is unique to each player, uh, there's no statistical difference between the windup or the stretch on mechanics once the front foot lands. But the most important aspect of this part of baseball pitching is their balance and their ability to uh, control their balance in that stance leg at the very beginning of the pitch. It kind of helps set the rest of it up. Uh, next phase is early cocking. And the most observable thing that we can see um, in the clinic is that their hand is on top of the baseball. We're going to go into this a little more detail in the lab part. The next phase, late cocking. So um, making sure that their throwing arm reaches that 90 degree abduction or armpit angle is important to uh, make sure that the rest of the mechanics flow efficiently. And um, we also want to make sure that there's not a W, which you can see better in this picture. So his arm is above that horizontal line. And again, that just makes sure that the uh, acceleration throughout the rest of the phases uh, happens more efficiently using their core and trunk muscles and not just relying on their arm. And in this picture, you can also see that the pelvis is starting to rotate towards home plate, which is uh, coiling the system to deliver more energy to the ball. So the acceleration phase has the fastest movement in all of sports. It's violent internal rotation, but despite whatever arm slot the pitcher may be throwing it, they need to maintain that 90 degree armpit angle. And if Randy Johnson can do it, then you can do it too. Um, and another important thing with the acceleration phase is that that forward trunk position helps deliver energy to the ball through the ground. So, um, you might be able to tell in this picture, but he's using more trunk muscles on the opposite side of his drawing arm in order to help that energy transfer. So we see greater um, activation on the contralateral trunk side than the throwing side. And the deceleration phase is all, almost exclusively eccentric uh, shoulder muscle activation. Um, and the follow through is really only a problem if you see that it's not happening in your pitcher. Um, it helps dissipate the energy from their throwing arm, but it should essentially end with the pitcher in a fielding position. Um, and we will see, I'll demonstrate this a little bit later in the lab. I know some of you are thinking, but my thrower is not a baseball pitcher and that's totally okay. Throwing five phases, you just get rid of the windup. And essentially it works the same for softball overhand mechanics as it does for baseball. And softball pitching is a completely separate presentation. So um, we're taking a look at the incidence of injuries in high school softball and baseball players. 
and you may recognize a local name or two in this article. Essentially, um, the injury rates are about the same, but uh, softball players tend to injure at a higher incidence during games compared to baseball players. But softball has the same injury rate practice to games as, I'm um, sorry, softball players have the same injury rate from practice to their games, and baseball has the same injury rate from practice to their games. Across the board, though, most of their injuries are what they consider mild, so missing seven days or less, um, majority upper extremity involvement, and pitchers are injured at a higher incidence than position players. And across all positions, all both baseball and softball, the rate of injury was the highest in the first month of the season. And maybe even a fewer of you are thinking, but what about quarterbacks? Why are, do we never address football throwing? So here we go. Uh, here there's four phases of football throwing. So you might see some similarities uh, to the baseball pitching phases. But this article will, uh, I think, adequately explain why we don't end up talking about shoulder pain with throwers in football. And it's because ex almost exclusively their injuries come from trauma. So sprains and contusions and fractures and subluxations, a uh, very few percentage of them in this article anyway, out of 133 injuries uh, come from what we would call overuse or repetitive motion um, type uh, mechanics. So. Uh, despite who your thrower is or what age they are or what sport they play, I think it's really important to include some kind of functional screen in your assessment. Um, the planks being, can they hold it for that long? Is there a different side to side in the side plank? You can actually get a good idea also of um, scapular strength in that side plank and forward plank position with that upper extremity a closed chain position. Is there any scapular winging? Um, the single leg bridge, you can do however many times you need to do it, but uh, essentially you want the opposite leg straight out in front of them. You want to instruct them just to perform a bridge with keeping that other leg straight out. Um, and then the big differences I see here are uh, glute weakness side to side and also um, using momentum to create the motion as opposed to being stable and using uh, their musculature to achieve the end um, or terminal hip extension. Um, the overhead squat, I use not just for the obvious things of, is there a, a weight preference side to side? Are they raising their heels up in the back? Are they showing me any kind of valgus? What is their hip mobility like? But in that overhead position, you can also get an idea of what does their trunk extension look like? Can they get a uh, full end range shoulder flexion um, side to side? Is there a difference there? Are they leaning forward? Um, which in the single leg squat with the hands on hips, I'm more looking for, can they balance? Uh, what is their hip strength uh, to knee strength ratio? Are they twisting their trunk over that side? Are they twisting to it, away from it? And um, obviously what kind of valgus uh, are we looking at and how deep, again, side to side, can they achieve the same depth of knee flexion once they're at the bottom and how good are they at controlling that throughout? Um, and these are all factors that therapists can affect with your thrower. So essentially strength power of the athlete and their mechanics. So um, when we do the lab part, we're going to do um, mostly mechanical stuff with the throwing, but we're, I threw in a few exercises there that you can implement into a program, and it incorporates not just uh, isolating their upper extremity, but involving their core and lower body as well. All right, welcome to our clinic. So we're going to do the lab part of the presentation next. I have a couple helpers with me. Jace is one of them, and you'll meet Lily in just a second. Um, Jace is going to show us a baseball pitching mechanics. Uh, we're going to do good mechanics, and we're going to do bad mechanics, so that you can see uh, what we're looking for in the clinic. Uh, this can We have the opportunity to have the net and the baseballs in the space, um, but you can do this just as easily 
without all this and just do what we call dry throws or dry runs. And we'll just demonstrate a couple of those without any of the extra stuff. Um, so this lab is gonna be from the back view and we're gonna show a couple things from the back view. We're gonna do a side view and see a couple things there and then we're gonna do a front view. So Jace is our baseball pitcher and Lily is gonna be our softball thrower. You ready? All right. All right, let's do it. Okay, so from the back view, uh, there's a couple things that we need to be looking out for. Uh, the main thing in this view is that making sure that his arm gets up to a 90 degree level. Jace, will you just show us that real quick? So we want his arm to be about there. And then um, when he throws, making sure that his forearm is above the horizontal plane. So if you show us horizontal, we wanna be just slightly above that when we're in this uh, late cocking to early cocking phase of his throw. Um, let's do maybe one more, Jace, and show that arm position. Good, all right. And then the other thing that we can see from this back view is his landing foot position. So we wanna make sure that he's landing uh, fairly straight on to where he is throwing. He's not too closed or too far to the right or too open too far to the left. That can alter his mechanics. So um, on this next pitch, we'll kind of pay, pay more attention where his foot lands, uh, hopefully towards his catcher. Yep. Um, those are the three main things that you can see from this uh, rear view with the pitchers. And then uh, from the side view, we'll just do a couple um, slow, dry uh, pitches and show things that are bad mechanics. All right, we are in side view now. So there's a couple um, other things that we can see from this view. Uh, the main thing still is that the arm needs to be at 90 degrees throughout the acceleration phase. Go ahead and show us that, Jace. So the acceleration view is really hard to see because it is the fastest movement in all of sports. Um, but there's a few uh, keys that you can see even before they get to that point. So will you show us what a W looks like? That's what happens when the forearm is below the horizontal plane in that late cocking phase right before acceleration phase. So that could cause them to uh, have an altered arm slot when they're throwing. Um, so in this view, that W position is pretty easy to see before the acceleration phase. Um, we won't have them throw like that because that's gonna, gonna mess them up potentially. Um, and then one other thing with throwing in general, we'll demonstrate this a little more with Lily next, but um, the palm needs to be on top of the ball and not underneath the ball when they're throwing. So especially pitchers that have small hands, they may show you that their uh, palm underneath the ball when they're in that early to late cocking phase. But let's do one more correctly without the W, please. <laughs> All right, excellent. All right, now we're in a front view and um, still the, the main thing with all phases of throwing, no matter which direction you're looking at them, is that their arm is maintaining that 90 degree abduction angle throughout the throw. Um, this is a little easier to see through the acceleration phase from this view, um, but more importantly, and especially with pitchers, we wanna make sure that when they're in their follow through, their release to follow through phase, um, that their trunk position is flexed and over their landing leg to kind of distribute that energy to the ball and that they're not resisting themselves in the landing. So um, show us a regular one, Jace. So he gets nicely flexed and over his landing leg, he has a, a step or two in follow through. Um, for pitchers, it's important for them to get to a fielding position fairly quickly uh, once they've thrown, because who knows, um, but Let's see where you don't do a nice trunk follow through. You don't have to throw the ball if you don't want, <laughs> but you're gonna resist. 
So his leg stiffens up, he kind of pushes back against himself, his trunk is more upright. Um, and again, this might be in uh, less developed, weaker pitchers. They're not using their bodies, they're not using their core, their hips, um, and their contralateral trunk muscles to uh, distribute the energy into the pitch. They're resisting it um, from, with their upper half. So um, we'll see that also a little more with uh, Miss Lily's throwing, but let's do one more good one. All right. <laughs> All right, and this is Miss Lily, and she is gonna demonstrate our softball throwing, which um, overhand mechanics are the same for baseball and softball. It doesn't matter just the ball, and softball is a little bigger. Um, so girls that naturally have maybe smaller hands, they may have more trouble with that ball up, ball down. Uh, but Miss Lily's gonna show us. Again, from the back view, we'll do a couple from the side view and from the front view so that we can get a good idea all around of what overhand throwing mechanics should look like. You ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, um, so again, same thing. We just wanna make sure the arm's at 90 degree angle. She's not under, she's not over. That is a the most efficient um, arm angle for uh, throwers of both baseball and softball and also uh, that W. So we're still trying to avoid the W position, but show us one more good one, Miss Lily. All right, so from this back view, you can almost see the ball point in your direction, and that is a good indication that she's getting her hand on top of the ball. So let's see, one more. If you cannot see the ball from this back angle, their hand is in the wrong position. So that is an uh, uh, indication that you can give them that verbal correction. Um, and let's move on to the side view. All right, here we are in side view. Um, we're going to look at the same things that we did with Jace, but um, since we're not doing pitching mechanics, this is more of a fluid uh, kind of mechanic. Good, so she's still getting her arm up to 90 degrees. We're still getting our hand on top of the ball. Uh, let's do one where you put your hand underneath the ball and you don't have to throw it. Woo! <laughs> so that uh, is more catapulting. And again, you might see this with less developed players, players with smaller hands, uh, difficulty gripping the ball. So they will put their palm underneath the ball in order to uh, hold on to it for a little bit longer. But this will result in uh, dysfunctional uh, arm mechanics kind of over using the muscles in the front and not letting the body do any of the work. So let's do a normal one. And then can you get into that W position? Same as what we did for Jace. Yep. So it's kind of a hand underneath like a scarecrow almost looking position and that's something that is again it makes them late with their mechanics it uh, alters their body's ability to distribute the energy into the ball so they end up overusing their arm to get the velocity instead of using their trunk and leg muscles all right let's do one normal one all right and in the front view um same idea as with the trunk position so especially position players um, would have a tendency to fight the release so they're going to push off um, and stiffen up their front leg um, show us a normal one lily okay so she follows through um, her upper half kind of falls forward over her landing leg which she's giving um, energy to the ball in the release but Let's not do a ball and let's just do a dry throw of you like pushing back against your landing foot. Yep, so her trunk's upright, kind of throws off her um, upper body mechanics, uh, releasing high. Um, but this, again, isn't uncommon in players that uh, have less core and uh, lower body strength to deliver to the ball. So they uh, are trying to overuse their arm muscles to make up for all of that um, distance and speed. So let's do another normal one. All 
All right, good. Uh, the only other thing I would uh, point out is that when they're in that uh, late cocking, early cocking phase, their uh, shoulders should be uh, flat to parallel. So they should be pointing their front shoulder, that is their glove hand, um, to their target. And then once they get into that acceleration phase, that's where you see the um, opening up of the shoulders and then the hip muscles too. Let's do one more, Miss Lily. All right, very nice. All right, so this is traditional side plank, but we've added the body blade for upper body um, coordination as well. So this incorporates um, the functional screening, deficit finding um, thing that we did earlier. Um, so we're gonna do both sides. So the idea is that he stays in a straight line and keeps that going for about 30 seconds. All right, take a break. Yep, so get that elbow tucked a little bit, there you go. Yeah, so straight line with the side plank, working those uh, oblique muscles, and we're adding in the um, upper body external rotation rhythmic state as well. So I love the side plank for adding into pictures. It's a good position. All right, take a break, Jace. And then another thing we like to do with our pictures is side plank position with a row. Again, just incorporating that trunk, uh, glute, hip abduction, uh, strengthening with an upper body activity. All right, good. Perfect. And on the other side. And you can see where people are <laughs> weak with this pretty easy. Go ahead and tuck that elbow a little bit. Yeah. And then just to your side. Good. Good. Maybe one more. Good. All right. And since this is an endurance activity, uh, we're going to want to do a fairly high number of repetitions of that to kind of get all that um, aerobic musculature up and online. Okay, Miss Lily is demonstrating a multi-directional lunge. So we're gonna go forward to the side and then back. And then we're gonna alternate to the other side, making sure we're getting both um, sides of the glutes, um, the glute mats, glute med, um, and the core stabilizers are all super important in any kind of overhand uh, throwing or mechanics. So we wanna make sure the landing leg and the push-off leg are getting equal amounts of work in all three directions. Yep. Nice job. Good. Good, and then you can also kind of see some uh, valgus knee positioning in this exercise too that you can uh, correct and give, yeah, nice job, verbal cueing for. And then I'm going to demonstrate uh, the single leg uh, hip hinge with a row. Again, trying to incorporate upper body, lower body, trunk, core, stabilization, balance, all of it into one uh, combined motion. So you want to put a tiny bit of bend in your knee. You're hinging forward, rowing up using your shoulder blade muscles, and then standing back up, um, getting a lot of glute med and glute max. And then the weight being in the one side is kind of encouraging that abdominal uh, recruitment on the other side. So um, just three exercises that we can use to kind of combine core, trunk, lower body, upper body, all into one uh, exercise so that we're using uh, the thrower's total body for throwing and not just their arm. All right, thank you so much for your time and attention um, for the presentation today. I hope that mostly all of you can get something, at least something out of it. Um, not just our PT friends that are in the clinic doing it, but you've seen our clinic now. So um, if you have any questions, I think that that should be coming up soon. And uh, thank you again so much. All right, great. So thank you, Kayla. That was awesome. Um, we really appreciate it. I think it's really nice to be able to see some of those things demonstrated in clinic. So we appreciate the lab portion of it. I think that was fantastic. Um, are there any questions even from the panel for Kayla or um, we'll just give people in the audience a couple of minutes to kind of uh, get their questions kind of typed up? I have one uh, question or one thing that I've seen 
is a, a little difference by position. So um, I'm curious if, if this is true, but like I've seen kind of a different throwing style from short and second with kind of a more shorter kind of snap get the ball over trying to be quick about their throw rather than, you know, someone thrown from the outfield with getting the ball turned around. And um, in the particular case I'm thinking about uh, it, it was a patient who she was reporting like a little numbness or tingling in her arm when she would throw. And I'm curious if, if you see that with that type of uh, kind of throwing mechanism um, in the, in that particular position. Um, yeah, so I think timing does have a lot to do with those um, midfield positions. So um, they have to get rid of the ball very quickly. So they kind of um, hurry through some of those uh, early stages of the throwing process to get to the release point as fast as they can, especially in softball. It's a smaller field. Um, the base paths are shorter. Um, you have much less time to kind of get your feet under you and get your arm back there. So um I think if you're seeing that just every once in a while, or if the parents are reporting um, that they just see it occasionally, it's not that big a deal, but you definitely shouldn't be training that way or um, practicing those um, kind of hurried up mechanics on a regular basis, because that is what would um, cause them to kind of uh, hinge off of their like anterior aspect of their shoulder as they're trying to like whip their arm forward as fast as they can. I think this is a great question. I think we always, you know, we focus really a lot on overhead throwing um, and not as much on underhand throwing, which uh, Kayla will appreciate answering this anyways. But one of the people in the audience asked, are there similar injuries with underhand throwing in softball, um, such as the pitching mechanics for softball, um, which are different and um, just kind of what you've seen and experienced there? Um, so it's not the same uh, rate as like elbow injuries. There's a uh, baseball for sure is goes above and beyond elbow injury rates. Um, interestingly enough, one of the um, articles that I had read to prepare for this uh, took that high school population and broke it down by position. And um, they saw that the highest uh, rates of shoulder injury and in softball players was in the first month and like not really elbow injuries after that. But with baseball players, they had the highest rates of elbow injury in the third month of playing, which I think not that that um, answers the underhand question, but like I kind of mentioned in the presentation, that's a totally different um, set of mechanics for that. And um, you still have to use your, your body. You still have to use that energy transferal. Um, and with softball players, they can have up to like five or six different types of pitches um, where I don't think in baseball, hardly anybody that I, I know throws that many different kinds of pitches. Um, so it's uh, more about the spin that you're putting on the ball from underneath or from the side as opposed to what you can uh, deliver to it from the top of the ball in the underhand softball pitching mechanics. So uh, all of the stresses are gonna be different. I know there were um, still impingement kind of injuries in softball pitchers, but it's more from like their bicep being way too active from trying to like pull from underneath and up on the ball um, as opposed to uh, like that speed of trying to go from the mound to the plate. Like that part doesn't necessarily uh, factor in as much as it does with the baseball mechanics. So uh, maybe someday I'll do an underhand <laughs> mechanics presentation. That would be fun. No, that's great. And I'll just add to that. I actually just put together a sports epi talk for another national conference. So this is like fresh on my brain. I can give you the exact epidemiology, but um, so the, uh, so it's interesting actually with softball mechanics. So um, people have looked at the Rio database and compared softball players to baseball players. Um, and there was a study that was actually just published in 2019. Um, and what they found is actually that unlike baseball, where the highest overuse, particularly injuries, like what Kayla was, you know, kind of describing and, and looking at those mechanics is highest in baseball pitch 
pitchers, it is not the same in softball players. So softball pitchers actually have less injury rates than actually the rest of the team who's overhead throwing. Um, and so those overhead throwing overuse injuries, at least with an overuse injury, which is mostly what you see in sort of throwing sports, um, is, is in there. And so, so, and when you look at, um, the definitely the, 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 even just injury across, um, softball versus baseball. So even just for overhead throwing, um, when you look at the, um, rates of elbow injury, it's half that of a baseball player and a softball player. So elbow injuries are significantly less, um, in softball players than in baseball players, but shoulder injuries actually are the same and may even be a little bit higher, um, in softball players versus baseball players. And so it is, um, I think some of this also plays a little bit into just um, uh, female body mechanics. If we could sort of get into women's, uh, you know, frame, especially as you go th um, through that growth period versus uh, the male frame um, and those things. And so it definitely, the injury, um, particularly with the ovaries injuries are a little bit different, but softball players are actually like one of the lower injury rates versus just the overhead athlete of the softball player. Um, so it's kind of interesting. It's very different from baseball, um, but definitely injury rates for shoulder injuries are very high in softball players. Um, and that is with pitchers as well too. So I think that plays into it a little bit. So all right, I'm gonna actually now um, duck out. I'm gonna actually turn this over to uh, Dr. Hall and he's gonna like kind of close things out and introduce the last few speakers and moderate sessions, so. All right, well, we'll get uh, jumped on to the next um, talk if there's no other questions. I think the next up is Dr. Heather Menzer, who's one of our other uh, orthopedic surgeons specializing in sports medicine. And then her talk is on uh, tibial eminence uh, fractures, uh, knee injuries in adolescent athlete. So we'll get that going. Good afternoon. My topic is tib tibial eminence fractures. Another name for this is tibial spine fractures. I'm Heather Menzer. I'm one of the orthopedic sports surgeons at Phoenix Children's Hospital. So a few objectives for today, we're first going to identify radiographic features of tibial eminence fractures. We're going to review tibial eminence fracture classification, and hopefully you'll understand some treatment options of these fractures. I have no disclosures related to this presentation. A brief outline of our talk today. So I'll go over kind of the background, the anatomy, mechanism of injury, some important diagnostic workup options, uh, some things to help prior to the referral or things that we do once we see these patients. Treatment options, I'll give some case examples, and then I'll go over my preferred surgical technique, though there are many. And finally, I'll go over the, the outcome of these patients, kind of what to expect and the rehabilitation uh, for them to return to their desired activities. First, the anatomy of tibial eminence fracture. So there's two names, eminence and spine. They both mean the same thing. Neither of them are right or wrong. It's basically the bony attachment of the ACL onto the tibia. So ACL stands for anterior cruciate ligament. I feel this is a good kind of cross section um, of the tibia. So this is anterior, this is posterior. We have the medial meniscus, lateral meniscus. The anterior cruciate ligament is the one in front. It controls the translation and rotation of the tibia and femur in relation to, in relation to one another. And so these injuries behave very similarly to ACL tears, but it's an injury to this bony attachment um, of the ACL. So here is where it attaches. These are the bony attachments. Um, the intercondylar eminence is what we call it. Um, and uh, another common term is spine, just like we talked about. So here's kind of the front view. And I thought this picture was very relevant because it gives you more of an idea so here's the ACL coming down. This is what it would look like fractured. Um, when I talk to patients about these injuries, I really compare it sometimes to pulling weeds. Sometimes you pull a weed and it breaks off. Um, that's similar to an ACL ligament injury. Um, when you actually get the root and you pull it up and all of the root mechanism comes out, that's kind of like what a tibial spine fracture is. It basically keeps the entire ACL or the entire weed plant uh, together and the whole root system comes up. So that's what's similar to a fracture. I feel like patients sometimes understand it a little bit better um, with that example. This is just an x-ray 
and there's kind of two prominences there. Um, and that's, that's the area that we're talking about. That's the area that we're looking at um, when we're looking at x-rays diagnosing this injury. In terms of the epidemiology, uh, tibial spine fractures, like I mentioned, is basically the equivalent to an ACL tear. The incidence is two to 5% in a pediatric uh, population of knee injuries specifically. And in terms of the age, normally these patients are skeletally immature, although not all the time. I have seen mature patients um, close to 20 with this injury um, and even some adults, uh, but the common ages are eight to 14 years old. The mechanism is similar to an ACL tear. The knee is uh, typically in hyperextension or for force flexion on a planted foot. Usually there's a valgus moment or rotational force on the tibia. So essentially it's a twisting injury. It could be non-contact or contact, but just like ACL tears, it tends to be a, um, a pivoting type injury that is non-contact. Um, risk fact factors are contact sports. Um, you can have some recreational sports too. Uh, more traumatic events, and I've seen all of these, football, soccer, skiing, snowboarding, motocross, um, even in young females, motor vehicle collision. So all of these things can provide a twisting moment across the knee. And if growth plates are still open, sometimes that that's the weakest spot and it tends to fracture versus tear the ligament. Symptoms can be an effusion. So that means big swelling. When their knee swells up like a water balloon, you know that sometimes there's internal uh, trauma. Um, pain, uh, often patients cannot wear, bear weight. Uh, sometimes they can, so don't be fooled by that. There's typically an unstable Lachman. That's the main test that we do to test um, stability of the anterior cruciate ligament. Basically, this behaves just like that um, since that, uh, since that protective um, restraint is disrupted. Patients often complain of loss of motion uh, they have tender joint lines, and they sometimes can be very difficult to evaluate just because they're in so much pain and so swollen. There is a classification for these fractures. It's the modified Myers and McKeever classification. Um, type 1 is when there's a fracture, but it's non-displaced. Uh, type 2 is when there's kind of a posterior hinge, so when it looks like a, a diving board. This classification, I didn't say before, um, it's based off of lateral x-rays. Um, and so when there's this diving board, so the ACL is attached, it pulls up, but it didn't completely disrupt in the back. There's a hinge. Type three is when it's completely disrupted and there's different stages of type three. So if there's some rotation, it adds an extra component. And type four is displaced, rotated, and comminuted. Um, this becomes important when we're talking about treatment options for these injuries. Uh, in terms of the workup, um, the first thing is you wanna get x-rays. This is an AP x-ray, a lateral x-ray and an oblique. Um, sometimes it can be very challenging to see on an AP. This is the, the same patient, but really you can see kind of a lucency involving that tibial spine region here. But if you only got one view, sometimes this can be missed. Um, it's the side view that really can see that this is actually a displaced tibial spine fracture. There's no posterior hinge. This is an oblique view. Um, so sometimes a third view is helpful, um, but at least these, these two views are very important for that diagnosis. Advanced imaging is sometimes recommended. I think that uh, depending on surgeon preferences, um, CT or MRI is very useful. They don't have to be performed. My preference is to obtain advanced imaging just because I feel like it provides me a map for surgery. Um, it also can uh, show us different injuries um, inside the knee. If they have a meniscus tear or if there's any other cartilage lesion, it just helps me uh, predict uh, more accurately what I'm to expect in surgery and I can be more prepared. A CT scan really gives us great information about the fracture pattern and the displacement. But what I found extremely helpful is an MRI because it tells us the soft tissue involvement. Usually there's 15 to up to 40% or near 40 of associated uh, pathologies. This is usually um, a meniscus tear, cartilage lesion, um, other ligament injury, osteochondral fracture, and so I think it's, I think that this is very, very helpful um, because it does change um, sometimes the post-operative management or like I said, what I'm prepared 
to do in surgery. The other thing that I feel like it, it helps um, is to identify uh, entrapped intermeniscal ligament that sits in the front of the knee. Um, and sometimes even with those hinged um, fractures, we may be able to get it closed or reduced, but if there's a soft tissue in a position there, it would actually drive me to a more surgical treatment right away versus attempting non-operative treatment. So I think that this MRI scan is for me the way to go. I don't feel like it's necessary for me to obtain both. I usually can get what I need out of um, the one advanced imaging. Here's an example of a CT scan. These are just the recon views. Um, I think sometimes um, looking through the CT scans are, um, on these types of presentations can be uh, challenging, but here we see a skeletally immature patient. You can see their growth plates open. This is the front view, the, um, the AP view, um, the coronal, uh, coronal view, um, coronal view, excuse me. Um, here's the patella, here's the, the tibial tubercle. Uh, so femur, tibia, fibula. And then right here, this line is the one that's not supposed to be there. That's actually the tibial spine fracture. This is just kind of a rotated view. You could see it pulled up like a diving board. Um, here's a sagittal MRI scan. So here's the front of the knee is to the left. The back of the knee is to the right. Femur's up on top, tibia's below. The patella you'll see as I scroll through some of these, scroll through some of these images in the front. Um, this dark ligament here is the PCL and the anterior cruciate ligament you'll see coming down eventually. Right here, you could start to see this displaced fragment. And if I, as I scroll through, you can start to see the anterior cruciate ligament fibers here. They appear strained, but there's no disruption and they're attached to this kind of bony fragment right here. Um, and as I continue to scroll down, you see something lifted up. Um, I feel like the bony part of the injury is more difficult to see on the MRI. Like I said, I feel like the study is very useful. Um, for, for this planning. And I'll show you why on the coronal, coronal view shortly. This white in here is the effusion from, from the injury. And one thing that I think is interesting is um, just like I said, this is very similar to an ACL tear. We see this bone bruise pattern. So on an MRI, this dark gray color is the normal appearance of bone on this sequence. And when you see this white uh, pattern here that's bone bruising or contusion sometimes on the radiology reports is read as impaction fracture. Um, but when you see this lesion, you know to look for an injury uh, to an ACL. It means that this part of the femur and this part of the tibia rotated in order to impact each other. So we're looking for um, a force that crossed the knee that was a rotation enough to provide some type of injury uh, to that ACL or ACL attachment. This is the coronal I was talking about, and I feel like this highlights one of the important things. So there was no meniscus tear on this, on this patient's MRI. This is the coronal view, so looking at the front, um, but you can actually see that here's that fractured piece, and on this view, this is right here is the intermeniscal ligament, um, and it's actually entrapped underneath. So it actually blocks the reduction of that little diving board coming down. And so if we were to extend this patient's leg, um, there's actually a block to that reduction. It wouldn't heal very well. And so I think that this is a, a good surgical and example of surgical indication. In terms of treatment options, there's always a non-operative treatment. We reserve this for patients who have non-displaced fractures. Surgeries don't make healing happen faster. They just help them heal in the correct position. So if you have a fracture, but it's not displaced, then we can treat it closed. That's often in either an immobilizer brace or a cast. Um, some of the type two injury. So the one that's the diving board that has a hinge, if you can reduce it, usually that's just by extending their leg and keeping it at an extension, then that can be treated non-operatively too. Um, I see several type two injuries that cannot be reduced. Um, or when I get the MRI, I do see soft tissue interposition. So um, a lot of type two injuries I fix. And anytime that piece is displaced, it also drives me to surgery. The risk of non-operative treatment is that patients can get stiff. They can develop residual knee laxity. So if it heals in a poor position, then you have redundancy that kind of folds back onto the ACL. Um, and so they, they continue to experience it. So maybe it will appear intact um, or the fibers may appear intact, but it's loose. And so it's still, it's ineffective at protecting that rotation um, in their knee or the translation. Um, you can get a non-union or a malunion. 
Um, you can still develop atrophy in the quadricep muscles or other thigh muscles. You can have retropatellar knee pain, um, or it can disrupt the, the tibial physis. In terms of treatment options, again, we kind of mentioned the indication, um, but unreducible type two injuries um, or any displaced uh, injury. In terms of the techniques, there's, um, you can either do it with a scope or open. And for me, I'm a sports surgeon. I prefer things arthroscop uh, arthroscopic fixation. Um, so that's what I'll kind of focus on, but I'll give some examples of open treatment too, and I have a few papers to review. Um, basically both can be acceptable. It kind of depends who's doing the surgery. Um, the person should do what's best in their hands and, and it's acceptable. Um, there's a lot of uh, discussion on the type of fixation, whether it should be screw or su suture fixation. Um, several studies quote that suture fixation is actually stronger, but it also takes the right technique. So um, again, I feel like both are, are okay treatment options. And then the last thing is that if it fails or if it's too disrupted, um, another treatment is an ACL reconstruction. And um, in, in adult patients, oftentimes that's what they get initially uh, for some of the risks such as arthrofibrosis, knee stiffness. Um, in my patient population, I tend to at least try. Um, and fix, fix the, the fracture. And if for some reason they were to have an unfavorable outcome that always leaves open an ACL reconstruction in the future. Um, so the risk of surgical treatment, both using a screw or suture fixation is that patients with this injury can get very stiff. So it's extremely important to counsel families and sometimes lead them up to a possible second surgery even uh, to help get them moving. I felt like with, I feel like with um, early motion and some post-operative um, uh, interventions and, and setting that expectation, it's actually helped prevent a lot of arthrofibrosis in my practice. So, um, but it is uh, probably the most reported complication of this injury, but also of the surgery. And if you remember the, on the non-operative side, it can still be a risk factor for non-operative treatment. So it's not limited to surgical treatment. It's mostly as a result of this type of injury. Um, and again, it cannot heal or it can heal incorrectly. Um, with suture fixation, uh, I think the benefit for me is that there's no hardware irritation, no impingement. There's no need for a second uh, surgery to go take that out if that becomes a problem. Um, you can get an anatomic re reduction with suture fixation. Um, you can have residual laxity with both. Um, and with the suture fixation, I feel like it allows for um, early range of motion. Um, here are some, um, some papers. This first one is basically to justify um, the treatment options of non-operative versus surgical fixation. And this paper uh, went through um, and uh, compared post-operative knee laxity and basically recommended that arthroscopic um, guided or open reduction uh, seemed to be a worthwhile procedure for displaced fractures. Um, for uh, this paper um, in the Journal of Arthroscopy also uh, is basically a good justification for treating these injuries with suture fixation. Um, so in their conclusion and looking back at this age population with this injury, um, treating ACL avulsion fractures with suture fixation restored the length of the ACL, it stabilized fragments, um, while promoting kind of that early motion, um, which allows people to have a decreased chance of arthrofibrosis um, following the surgery. This is a systemic um, review of going over tibial eminence fractures. Uh, surgical patients report less instability, they're higher functioning, um, very few require ACL reconstruction, and uh, suture fixation was associated with improved clinical outcomes. So that's something that's, um, you know, very applicable to my practice and I like it. Um, I like that uh, it's justified. Um, and then here's a paper comparing open versus arthroscopic treatment of these injuries. And this paper uh, basically states that whether you treat it arthroscopic or open, you can have favorable outcomes. So it's um, best that the surgeon treating these patients do what it, they're most comfortable with. And, and this was very similar um, uh, te technique and com 
uh, outcome comparison justifying both arthroscopic or suture fixation. So here's an example of a diagnostic arthroscopy. Once we get in there, oftentimes when I first put the arthroscope in, into the knee, there's a large hemarthrosis. It's very bloody. It takes a lot while to kind of um, irrigate uh, and, and have good visibility within the knee. But once that hematoma is gone, um, we usually can go see the fracture. So I uh, didn't include all of the diagnostic pictures of here. I focused um, onto the ACL um, and tibial spine area. So this is the anterior cruciate ligament. This is the intercondylar um, notch right here. The medial side of the knee is over on this side. This is the lateral side. And I find almost all, not all, but almost all have the anterior horn and root of the lateral meniscus attached to this fragment. So I feel it's very important um, to make sure that this is in, in an anatomic position. And the other interesting finding on this is you can see that intermeniscal ligament from the medial side over lateral kind of entrapped between the fracture fragments. So this is not set, I mean, this is very uh, little displacement and you could be fooled on an X-ray without having an MRI showing the importance of um, this entrapment with the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus attached to the fragment. Um, here's just a uh, zoomed in view. This is the medial compartment, lateral, so medial meniscus, lateral meniscus, and you can see a fracture line here. So at the back, it's not significantly displaced, but in the front, um, you can see how that, if it healed in this position, you would have a malunion um, and possibly, possibly some residual laxity in that ACL. Um, here's a video of the same thing. So this is just a probe. You can see the, the lateral meniscus uh, coming down and attaching at the base there of the ACL. There's a probe kind of pushing up. Um, at this point, I think there's, yep, there's that intermeniscal ligament. The probe is going under the intermeniscal ligament. It's entrapped in that frag fragment, um, but you can very clearly see, um, you know, the, the, uh, fracture there kind of sitting up. So I hope this uh, provides just a little bit better of a view of the importance of, of you know, early diagnosis of this injury and, and seeing kind of the potential um, need for operative, operative treatment. So this is a good justification. Uh, kind of zoom forward in this. I think it, I try and get in here. This is an arthroscopic shaver. And in order to provide that anatomic reduction, it really takes uh, clearing a lot of the fracture hematoma from the fracture site. Um, there's me lifting up with the arthroscopic shaver so you can kind of see the inside of a fracture um, on a, a very close up zoomed in <laughs> view. So when I treat these, I do suture fixation. Um, this is the ACL, here's the notch, here's that meniscus coming in. And this is the result of the suture fixation. I have some examples in a, in a video afterwards, but this is just in brief um, how I pull this down. The intermeniscal ligaments preserved on top, the lateral meniscus ends up being fixed when the tibial spine fracture is fixed, um, and it does, does pretty well. Here's uh, some examples of screw fixation. Since this age population is skeletally immature, I feel like this just, you know, to me, this just looks painful, but if you talk to a trauma surgeon, I suppose that they would think that these look fantastic. Um, here's the tibial spine, there's the fracture, there's a screw across. So anytime you have screws going across the growth plate, for me, I think that that's something that I try to avoid. It's not always avoidable, but I try to. You'll see some of these screws have washers and that helps this bone area is very spongy. Um, and so it's very easy to over tension and pretty soon, you know, the screws past the fracture site and you still have a displaced fracture and a screw in one side of it. So um, for me, I feel like this, the suture technique is more reliable in my hands. Um, but here's some example, like I said, of the screw. Um, for me in these skeletally mature patients, a second surgery would be necessary to remove it, um, which would help decrease the hardware um, impingement and also uh, removing the, the hardware across of their, their growth plates across their physis. So here's the first case, a nine-year-old female. She was in a motocross collision. She twisted her knee, had pain, effusion, could not bear weight. And basically all those symptoms that I had talked about before, large effusion, swelling, bruising, pain, loss of motion. And this is her um, x-rays. So AP, lateral and oblique views, you can see you can appreciate kind of this large, um, um, this large 
fracture right here. It's completely displaced and kind of rotated. Um, and these pictures down here um, were actually her <laughs> the after fixation. Um, but let me just go over her her cases, uh, her arthroscopic images as well. So this is her ACL. She actually had a had a tear of her ACL. It wasn't complete, but it was near complete. Um, I think this was just a very high energy mechanism. And um, that rotation um, uh, caused significant disruption of her medial joint space. So this is a probe. Um, this is a patient that I actually had to go in and change and do an open reduction because with the arthroscopic reduction, I, I couldn't quite get it perfectly. Um, this is um, this is that tear. Um, this is me trying to get it. This is her uh, meniscus. Um, but this is the best that I could do uh, with an arthroscopic fixation since that piece was so far into her medial joint that I ended up opening and kind of uh, getting the best I could um, reduction. I still did a suture fixation. The reason I included this patient is one, you sometimes need to combine the two. I still used, um, I did not, I ended up transitioning to an open approach from an arthroscopic approach, but I still use the suture fixation. Um, in the end, um, her po these are her post-op x-rays. She did very well, but three months later, um, her incisions had healed, she had no pain, but her motion was 15 degrees to 100 degrees. So she was 15 degree flexed. Um, in other words, she had an extensor lag. She couldn't get her leg all the way straight and she could only bend it to a little bit past a seated position. Um, her knee was stable, um, but that's what we call arthrofibrosis. So she had a very stiff knee. Um, we had discussed with them about going back in to treat her arthrofibrosis. She had significant scarring um, that I had to take out. So this is all pictures of removing scar tissue. That's what scar tissue looks like in a scope. Um, and I forgot to mention with her, I tried to do a miracle surgery and actually put some sutures directly repairing the, the ACL. So this second look ended up being quite interesting and fascinating because in a nine-year-old, apparently their ACL healed with that fixation. And then this is what her joint line looked. Um, there was that minimal step off, but she's starting to form some fiber cartilage. So she ended up doing great. She got her motion back, um, had a stable knee, no pain. And they were very, very anxious to go back to motocross very quickly. Um, this is this case too. A 12-year-old female, um, she was pushed playing tag. Her knee twisted and felt a pop. She had pain and effusion. Um, this is her imaging. So not quite as extreme. Again, on the, end, the AP view, you can see that there's something going on here, but it's not convincing that it's displaced. Here's her open physis. This is the lateral view. And this is one of those where the posterior hinge is intact. Um, but I felt like this was still too much of a step off. This is an oblique view. Um, it doesn't really provide me that much information about um, the, the step off. Um, I didn't include her advanced imaging um, in uh, lieu of timing, but this is, this is the arthroscopic uh, picture. So here's that step off. Um, here's the fracture line on the medial side. This is lateral. Again, that lateral meniscus is attached to that ACL um, uh, uh, or attached to the, the, the avulsed fragment. Um, and then, so again, Here's her diagnostic arthroscopy, very similar to the one that we had before, meniscus attached. Um, and there's that going on that side. Medial compartment looked good and trapped in her meniscal ligament. Um, this is suture fixation. I've modified this slightly in the technique that I'll review with you, but here's the ACL. This is that, that uh, meniscus coming down. Sutures are actually uh, crossing um, crossing in front of the anterior cruciate ligament there and pulled down into the fracture base. I'll go over this again um, in a moment, but here's a result of that technique. This is just kind of a little uh, um, grasper that I was using as a probe to kind of go around and make sure that everything was tight, um, but everything was reduced as anatomically as I could get and that the ACL was stable. This is that patient's post-operative imaging. So no longer did she have a diving board up front. Um, there's no hardware across her joint line. Um, her physis are preserved and she also went on to do pretty well. She did not get stiff and eventually this healed and she went back to sports. So this will be reviewing my arthroscopic technique.
uh, this patient was actually older and he had a chronic uh, displaced injury, but um, he ended up doing very well. So this is what a chronic injury looks like. This is the displaced tibial spine fracture. Once I was able to kind of clean up the scar tissue, I would call this a malunion um, or a nonunion. I don't recall how long it had been since his injury, um, but it tried to heal. It just continued. Uh, he continued to have knee instability and he also had an extension um, lag because of the just that that displacement. So this is once I cleaned that up, this is the fracture base, a lateral meniscus, medial meniscus. So what I typically do is I pass two sutures through the base of the ACL. Um, I use this technique using a suture passer through a spinal needle. I grab it, the front of the knee, and ultimately I use just like a needle and thread, pull the thread through the knee um, using a suture. I do this twice. So there's me grasping it, the suture coming out. So now I have two suture strands uh, coming through the base of the anterior cruciate ligament near the fracture. The second part of it is I drill tunnels through the tibia. So this is just like a guide pin. This does go through the fat physis, but it's a very small, um, small hole. And if I really wanted to, I could come and put it right up, right up above it. But this is just a drill. This right here is where I aim for when I'm putting in the guide pin. And once I have that in and in a position that I like, I put another type of a suture passer through this and I pull, um, I loop uh, this grasper through and I pull some of the sutures across. So what I try and do is I try and keep one of the strands um, medial to lateral. And then on the other strand, I actually cross it now in front of the ACL. So you'll see that shortly. And I feel like that that provides a lot of compression across the ACL. So there's two sutures going through that tunnel. I repeat it on the other side of the base of the fracture. Um, there's the suture passer. There's my sutures pulling down into the tunnel and you'll see that the white strand is just kind of like a U whereas the blue is like an X across the front of the anterior cruciate ligament. And then I tie these, these are different tunnels. And ultimately um, what I do is I tie them over a bony bridge. So once those two sutures ends on each hole come out of the tibia, I tie them off of, um, through, uh, through, once I tension it and make sure that the reduction is appropriate, I tie a knot. And then to really secure it, I put it into what's called a knotless ink, suture anchor. Um, and so let me see, is this a video? It's not. So this is just kind of the final product. So here, the, the, there's those holes um, that I put through, the drill holes uh, that I placed using the guide pin. Um, there's the suture that crosses in front of the ACL. There's the second one that goes through. And it basically just takes that hinge and pulls it down. It works very well in displaced fractures as well. Um, so like I talked about, the sutures are tied over a bone bridge and then the knotless anchor backs it up for more compression and fixation. It's so important to do early range of motion. So I trust this technique very much. I typically allow them to go zero to 90 degrees immediately. Um, I, and I tend to have them weight bearers tolerated in the brace. And I feel like that that advanced treatment early on helps them uh, get it moving and prevent the arthrofibrosis. Most patients are pretty cautious. So um, especially in that first two week period. And I feel like the more I let them do the better because um, usually if I ask them to move zero to 90 degrees, then they'll come back and most of them will be a little bit less than that. And that's okay with me as long as they're moving. And then we get them moving any more, uh, a lot more aggressively after that, that two weeks. Um, I do zero to 90 um, just initially to kind of let that fracture uh, start the healing process. I monitor these patients with x-rays. So every time they come until it's healed, I get a, um, at least AP and lateral x-rays. And then I let them start uh, progressing their activities by jogging, running when there's a radiographic union. So in summary, um, the physical exam is important. If you have a, uh, basically any injury that has an effusion, I would start with an x-ray because if it is a tibial spine, it'll kind of direct you. Um, but for me, I prefer an MRI over a CT scan. A CT scan is not wrong. In terms of treatment options, if it's a displaced injury, you can do an open or an arthroscopic technique. And um, my preferred technique is using um, a suture fixation um, and uh, post-operative early weight bearing and motion is super important in terms of their post-operative um, outcomes uh, and reducing swelling. Uh, follow it with x-rays and allow them to begin 
uh, jogging when they have full motion and radiographic healing. And then once they start jogging, they can kind of pick up as tolerated. So in terms of going back to our objectives and reflecting on that, um, radiographic features of tibial eminence fractures, we talked about this as a fracture of the tibial attachment of the ACL. So those two little spines, you'll typically see them propped up, especially on the lateral x-ray. The fracture classification we reviewed is the Meyer and McKeever classification, though what's more important than the name of the classification is that whether it's displaced or non-displaced. Any displaced injuries that cannot be reduced into an anatomic position, I do surgery on. And then in terms of understanding the treatment options of these tibial eminence fractures, um, we are happy to take it from you anytime. We refer to orthopedic sports medicine for management. We can be the ones that decide operative or non-operative, um, but usually surgical treatments necessary for the displaced tibial spine fractures. Here's a list of my references. Um, I hope that this was informative. If you have any questions about that, um, about the injury or the technique, um, please feel free to reach out or email me. Um, thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Menzer. I think um, it's, it's interesting. A lot of times we will see these surgical um, descriptions being given, and, and when you're not a surgeon, you can't quite... Um, really understand the images and views. And so I think it's it's quite helpful to, uh, you did a really nice job making it clear to us there. So um, I'm not sure if I see you on here, but- um, I'm oh, on here. Yeah. All right, perfect. So, <laughs> I, didn't, um, I didn't have my camera on yet, but um, <laughs> I'm on. I didn't, I was just waiting for a question. I wasn't gonna turn it on unless I had a question. But, oh, but no, yeah, no, no, I'm here. No question. Uh, um, I, we don't have any questions here, but, um, uh, curious, you know, uh, Dr. Vaughn, um, your thoughts, do you do, you do things similarly? Um, how do you, how do you uh, compare to that? Uh, I think it's a great lecture. I think Dr. Menzer did a fantastic job going over everything. We do, we do that very similar. I, I didn't find a whole lot of discrepancies in, in uh, what we do. A couple of questions just more for stimulating discussion. Um, Arthrofibrosis is a big concern, as you mentioned, um, and so I appreciate you mention your post-operative protocol. How soon do you get them into physical therapy is maybe a, a first question. And then also, when you get them back to sports, you kind of mentioned running. When do you let them go back to contact or competitive sports, maybe soccer, that type of thing? And when you do, is bracing part of that or not part of that? So for me... Once I, once I start jogging at that radiographic union mark, I kind of let them advance from there. I think in terms of just injury prevention, it's important to kind of, I, I think it's a different surgery than say an ACL reconstruction. So I don't necessarily wait until six months, um, but I do think it takes stronger to get their agility back. But I, as soon as I start them jogging, I let them kind of build and then it'll be more on their own timeline. I'm not a huge bracer. Um, I don't really use a brace uh, post-op um, after that first um, two to six week um, phase. Once they're done with that, then, then for me, they won't be in a brace anymore. So I, I get them moving quickly. Um, I, I don't, I haven't seen the evidence that shows that a brace is helpful in prevention of recurrent instability. So I let them fly um, and hope that they rehabilitate and start to trust their, trust themselves, trust their muscles. Um, and that will, and that will guide them. So that's my approach. Nice. I, I would say for, I know we differ a little bit on ACL bracing, but on tibial spine, <laughs> yeah. similar. I, I don't brace them after about six weeks. Uh, back on arthrofibrosis, that's, that's a concern, uh, you know, and I think we find that more common with kids, uh, even kids with ACLs where they're really young, they tend to have a higher risk of arthrofibrosis. What, um, besides getting their motion going soon, when do you feel like, hey, I need to go in there and maybe lice the adhesions or take them back to surgery? Is it more kind of, are they progressing or not? Or is there kind of a cutoff for you where you say, hey, I, I think this patient's, we need to go and help them by getting rid of that scar tissue. I wait, I start to plant the seed. If they're pretty stiff around the two month mark, I really start to, I, I speak about it a lot in clinic. So I start to prepare them. I usually give them a solid three months to really get it back and, 
and get their effort. And by that time, I feel like the fracture has also time to heal. Um, I, but I treat it very similarly as my ACL. So I typically give them about three months. And in this, it's just ideal as well, because then the fracture should have gone on to union by that point, And I can be more, a little bit more aggressive with my um, license of adhesions. Can I ask you one more question? I don't feel like yeah, you're absolutely. Getting or anything, but, <laughs> so so many <laughs> asked questions. <laughs> yeah, no, what um what's been your experience with non-operative treatment? Uh, in a sense, mm-hmm. you know, certainly a non-displaced fracture, we're going to be able to treat non-operatively. Um, as far as like a type two, or in other words, one that's maybe hinged up a little bit. Uh, they talk about maybe taking them to the OR or just going to radiology. I think maybe more of the OR and trying to straighten them and putting them in a cast if they're if it's if you can get it reduced. How often have you found that to be possible? I think I've only found it like once when I've ever taken somebody to the operating room and straightened their leg and we got an X-ray and like wow it actually reduced it. It seems pretty rare and I, to me and maybe it's because soft tissue stuck in between or maybe the just bone doesn't want to go back in place. Have you found that to be possible at times? I- I agree with you. I don't find that possible. I think I fix most type twos. So for me, the only time they don't really get fixed is a clear type one. Um, I've I've never seen a type two really stay. I feel like this the the arthroscopic treatment and the suture fixation is comes with very little risk, and I think that it just has uh, better, more reassuring results. So I'm pretty quick to transition to a scope for those patients. I agree. I think putting the suture on it also allows you to get the knee moving. Yeah. It's a small procedure generally and in, in decreasing the risk of that arthrofibrosis, I think is huge. So anyway, like I said, great lecture. Uh, it was nice to see your technique and learn some things from you. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks, um, everyone. I, th- I think uh, one comment I'll make is the non-operative side. Uh, those aren't a cakewalk. You know, I think even the type ones kind of make you nervous. Um, and I think that uh, you're kind of watching it and, and it's not like as smooth as some of the other fractures we see. I think sometimes we're like, uh, did it, did it move a little bit? Um, are they getting a little laxity? Do they have extension lag? So, um, I am very cautious and very, um, apprehensive, even the, even the type ones, um, sometimes, uh, you know, can, can trip you up a little bit, but, um, I think what we'll do is jump on to the, the next um, section. I'm just going to make a couple of uh, comments, uh, as I know some people may have like an afternoon clinic to get to or something like that. Um, so uh, we've got um, Morgan Stanley coming up next with a, a, our talk on selection for ACL reconstruction in children and adolescents, a really uh, interesting topic. Uh, one of the things I think we... Um, you know, should just remind everybody because I'm not sure if everybody on here is from uh, Phoenix area. Uh, we we are um, based in uh, Phoenix, but cover the kind of the whole valley. We have six locations throughout uh, Phoenix, with another one opening up in a couple of years. Uh, we have both the operative and, and non-operative team, um, and uh, we have uh, surgery centers. Uh, three three uh, options for those, with another fourth coming in a couple of years. Uh, and, and our team does fracture care. We do concussion. We do all MSK uh, injuries. Uh, we do ultrasound guided injections. And then uh, the myriad of all sports uh, surgical uh, operations as well. Uh, we are, we've expanded to sports PT um, and then recently have expanded to uh, sports nutrition as well. Uh, so just a little uh, note about uh, our, our group and what we do uh, if you're not from the area. But next we'll, we'll go to um, uh, Morgan to get us going with ACL reconstruction selection. Hello, my name is Morgan. Um, I am a PA here in the ortho department and I have the pleasure of operating with both Dr. Vaughn and Dr. Menzer. And today I'm gonna be talking about graft options for ACL reconstruction in children and adolescents. So the objectives of this talk are going to be to review ACL anatomy and the basics of ACL injuries, discuss graft options for children and adolescents undergoing ACL reconstruction, and compare pros and cons of each graft, compare the graft failure rates, and discuss graft options based on age group. So the goal here is for you in the community to have a better understanding of what 
graft options are out there, what we offer, um, so that when you refer patients to us, you'll have a good idea of what type of surgery they may end up having and what their recovery is going to be like. So brief review of ACL anatomy. Um, the ACL runs from the medial side of the lateral femoral condyle over to the intercondylar eminence of the tibia. We have the medial meniscus, lateral meniscus, and the PCL running behind the ACL, crossing behind it. Um, and on the right side, there's a torn ACL, in case you don't know what that looks like. Um, the ACL is the primary st stabilizer of the knee joint, and it prevents anterior translation of the tibia relative to the femur. Some data about ACL injuries. Children and adolescents make up the largest demographic of patients who sustain ACL injuries. And the frequency of ACLs in this population is steadily increasing. And we believe the increase in ACL injuries is directly related to the increase in competitive sports participation, early sports special specialization, and year-round training in young athletes. Um, so just an important note that kids should be kids. They should be playing multiple sports. It's good for them and it can help prevent injury. They don't need to specialize early. And the rate of ACL reconstruction in children under 20 years old increased nearly threefold between 1990 and 2009 in the United States. And ACL reconstruction in patients under 15 increased 924% from 1994 to 2006. Um, the recommendation for young kids with ACL tears used to be non-operative treatment until they reach skeletal maturity. This is no longer the recommendation. These patients have continued instability. They have a very difficult time returning to sports without a functional ACL, um, and this puts them at risk for progressive cartilage damage and arthritic changes. So they have an ACL tear. They likely need surgery, especially if they're an athlete. Um, so the typical presentation of an ACL tear, um, usually non-contact injury with rotational force. Um, so twisting, cutting, pivoting, deceleration type movements, or a direct blow to the knee with valgus stress. So common mechanisms are a football player getting tackled from the side, um, soccer players being slide tackled, um, and patients often feel or hear a pop. They have an immediate pain, swelling, and most common complaint is instability. On physical exam, they will have a positive Lachman's test. This is done with the patient lying in supine position and the knee held at about 30 degrees of flexion. You're just gonna pull anterior force on the tibia. And um, when compared with the opposite side with the good knee, if you feel more than about two millimeters of anterior translation of the tibia, um, this is indicative of an ACL tear and they likely need an MRI. So diagnose, diagnostic study of choice is an MRI, and we love when patients are sent to us with an MRI already in hand. On the left side here, this is a normal ACL on MRI, so you can see these clearly defined ACL fibers spanning from the tibia to the femur. And on the right side, this is an acute tear where you can no longer see those um, well-defined ACL fibers. And treatment. So in patients with a partial tear, so less than 50% of the ACL fibers torn, um, they can do a trial of non-operative treatment with bracing and activity modifications. And some patients do do really well with this, um, but with a complete tear, surgical ACL reconstruction is going to be the definitive treatment. Um, and they can expect to return to competitive sports after about nine months. So we do clear our patients to begin jogging on flat surfaces at 12 weeks post-op. So they will be cleared to run at three months, but they likely will not be returning to their sport until about nine months. Um, and the, I hope the most important takeaway from this talk is that all graft have excellent functional outcomes with high patient satisfaction. Most of our patients are very happy after ACL surgery, regardless of what graft they choose. Um, but we do have our preferences on the grafts that we prefer. So the factors affecting graft choice um, leading into surgery, age and proximity to skeletal maturity, their activity level, what sport they play, and surgeon preference is the biggest one. So Dr. Vaughn and Dr. Menzer have both shifted their practice over the last couple of years towards performing primarily quad tendon autograft. Um, we're doing a lot less hamstrings and 
patellar tendon grafts and a lot more quad grafts recently. Um, and hopefully after this talk, you'll have a better understanding of why we prefer the quad tendon. The graft options we will be discussing are first off allograft cadaver tendons. I'm just going to briefly talk about why we don't use it. Um, and then our big three autograft options are hamstring, teller tendon, or BTB, bone tendon, bone, and quad tendon. And then at the end, I'm just going to talk briefly about IT band, which is a great option for our very small, um, very young patients. So allograft cadaver tendons. Um, are not recommended as the primary graft option in young patients and really anyone under 30 years old um, should not be given, be recommended that they have an allograft due to the high risk of graft failure. So studies have shown that the graft failure or retail rate is, retail rate is four times higher in the allograft group versus autograft in patients aged 10 to 19. Um, and we do occasionally use allograft to supplement our hamstring grafts if the hamstrings are just not big enough to create a new strong ACL. Um, but unfortunately, when we do supplement with cadaver tendons, this results in a 2.6 times higher risk of graft failure. So we try to avoid use of allograft as much as we can, but sometimes it is necessary. So first we will talk about the hamstring autograft. So when hamstring tendons are harvested to make the new ACL, um, a small incision is made on the medial side of the knee here, and the semitendinosus tendon and the gracilis tendon are harvested using a tendon stripper. Um, and then they are folded over, sutured, cleaned up, and put into the knee as the patient's new ACL. So bone tunnels are drilled in the femur and in the tibia. And then on the femur side, the graft is secured with a little metal button and on the tibia side, secured with a screw. And this is what the hamstring graft looks like after the tendons are harvested. So we can fold it over, fold each tendon over once to create a four standard graft, or if we have enough length, we can fold the semi-tendinosis tendon over three times and the gracilis tendon just folded over once. Um, to create a five strand autograft. And on the right side here, this was a 17 year old male who we did a five strand hamstring graft on. Dr. Ron and I did this just a few weeks ago. Um, this patient had great size hamstrings with great length. So we made um, a five strand graft that ended up being eight and a half millimeters in diameter, which is ideal. Um, and this is what it looks like inside his knee compared to the native ACL. Like I said, he was a 17 year old male. He had torn his opposite ACL back in 2019 and elected for a hamstring back then. He did really well. He was very happy with his choice. So he decided to go with hamstring when he tore his ACL on the opposite side. So pros of hamstring graft. Small incisions um, with relatively good cosmesis. They just have this one two to three centimeter incision, incision on the medial side of the knee where the tendons are harvested and that's where we drill our tibial bone tunnels and then these standard um, scope incisions. There's low risk of anterior knee pain, no risk of patella fracture. We'll talk about with quad and with BTB because we take a bone block from the patella. This does come with a small risk of patella fracture. We don't have that risk in an all soft tissue hamstring graft and it can be performed in any age group. So in young kids, we need to, sometimes we need to completely avoid their growth plates or par partially avoid their growth plates to minimize risk of growth abnormalities. So there are lots of technique options to um, avoid the physis if we need to. So this can be performed in adults and in very young kids. Cons of the hamstring autograft. The biggest disadvantage to hamstring is that we cannot control the size. We can't control the graft length or the graft diameter. You just get what you get after you harvest the hamstring tendons. And graft size matters. There have been multiple studies that show that a graft of more than eight millimeters in diameter significantly reduces the risk of graft failure. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes hamstring tendons are just really small in our young patients. It's often very difficult to obtain an eight millimeter graft. Sometimes we're lucky to get a seven or a seven and a half millimeter, even when it's five stranded. Um, 
And we do occasionally need to supplement with allograft as I discussed before, but this comes with a higher risk of graft failure. Um, no option for bone block in the tunnels. I said this is an all soft tissue graft, which is great for many reasons, but um, the other grafts have better um, strength, likely due to the bone on bone healing inside the tunnels. Um, and because we're taking the entire semitendinosus tendon and the entire gracilis tendon, um, this has potential for long term strength deficits in the hamstrings versus the other graft options, we're only taking a portion of the tendon. Um, Sensory deficits, this is a very common complaint in patients where we harvest the tendons, the incision is right in this area where the infrapatellar branch of the saphenous nerve runs. Um, so this nerve gets damaged and causes numbness and patients don't like it. And hamstrings do have the highest graft failure rate of about 13 to 16%. Next, we're gonna talk about patellar tendon or BTB bone, tendon, bone. So when the patellar tendon is harvested for a graft, take a bone block from the patella, then a bone block from the tibia, and then take the central portion of the patellar tendon to create their new ACL. Bone tunnels are drilled in the femur and in the tibia and secured with a screw on either end. This is just another picture of what that harvest looks like. Bone block from the patella, bone block from the tibia. And then, oops, and then this is what it looks like. Bone blocks on each end with the tendinous portion in the middle that becomes their new ACL. And this is what it looks like inside the knee. This is BTB graft compared with a native ACL. You can see it's a lot thicker than that hamstring graft that I showed you before. Um, and this is a great option for um, contact athletes because of that bone on bone healing in the tunnels. So. Historically, this has been the gold standard graft choice for contact athletes, but patients must be at or approaching skeletal maturity, so about age 14 and up, um, to have this graft. Because of those bone blocks, there's no option to avoid the growth plates with patellar tendon, um, so our young kids don't have this option. Pros, we can control the graft diameter depending on the patient size. We can choose how thick we want it to be. Um, it's a very thick, strong graft compared to the hamstrings. Um, like I discussed before, the bone-on-bone -bone healing in both tunnels has likely improved graft strength compared to the hamstrings. Um, and the graft failure rate is a lot lower than hamstrings at somewhere around 8%. Cons. The biggest disadvantage to the patellar tendon is anterior knee pain. This is a very, very common complaint, particularly pain with kneeling. Um, some patients just kind of avoid kneeling altogether after they've had this surgery. And this is not ideal for patients who are playing sports that require kneeling. Wrestlers, volleyball players, dancers, um, they can have a really hard time returning to sport. And as teenagers are getting older, getting into college age and starting to work, if they have a job that requires them to kneel, this can affect their daily life. So that's just something to take into consideration. Um, it is a much larger incision than the hamstring right on the front of their knee. Um, there is a risk of patella fracture up to about 1.3% due to that bone block taken from the patella. Um, weakness of the extensor mechanism due to taking a large portion of the patellar tendon. And length mismatch is a big one. So because there's bone blocks on both ends, the graft can either be too long or too short, which can make proper fixation difficult. So next we're gonna talk about quad and why we love it. So just brief anatomy overview of the quad tendon. So instead of taking the patellar tendon below the kneecap, we take the quad tendon above the patella. And this is an increasingly popular autographed option for ACL reconstruction. Like I discussed before, Dr. Vaughn and Dr. Menzer have both started doing this as their primary graft choice. Um, and Big reason why we love it is that you can control both the graft diameter and the graft length, which you can't do in the hamstrings or the patellar tendon. Um, and then we have the option for doing an all soft tissue graft or with a bone block. Um, so this can be performed in all ages. The younger patients can have the all soft tissue graft, or we can add a bone block for, for potential increased strength in the older patients who are at or approaching skeletal maturity. 
And this is what the tendon harvest looks like. So on the left here, this is with a bone block. This is the way that Dr. Menzer prefers to do it. So bone block taken from the patella and then the central one third of the quad tendon is harvested. So bone block with the tendinous portion. And then on the right here, this is the all soft tissue option. No bone block from the patella. This is the way that Dr. Vaughn prefers to do it. And then this is what the graft looks like after harvest. So bone block, and then the rest of the graft is soft tissue, and then an all soft tissue graft. So with the bone block, both ends are gonna be secured with a screw similar to BTB. Um, oops, on all soft tissue, the femoral side is gonna be secured with that button, and then the tibial side with the screw. And this is what the quad looks like inside the knee. It's thick and beautiful and we love it. And our patients have done really well. So pros, the reason why we like the quad tendon is that we believe that it has all the good properties that the patellar tendon has with some additional advantages. Um, so compare, when compared with BTB, it has similar post-operative -op extensor mechanism strength. Um, so studies have shown no difference in knee extensor strength at six months, eight months, or three years post-op in the quad versus BTB group. And it has a similar graft failure rate of five to nine percent. BTB was around eight, eight point five percent. And then improved strength of the graft itself. So the quad graft can withstand greater tensile loads than the patellar tendon graft. And we believe this is because the quad tendon is has about 20% greater collagen density than the patellar tendon does. Um, and then less harvest site pain and less anterior knee pain. Both of these things are huge. Um, and just pain complaints post-op are better anecdotally with our patients, um, better in the quad group versus the BTB group who just have long-term anterior knee pain. And pros compared with hamstring. Um, so like BTB, it's a larger, stronger graft than a hamstring. Um, and we have the ability to control both the diameter and length as discussed before. There's less laxity on clinical exam in the quad group versus hamstring. Um, and they, patients actually have improved knee flexion strength after surgery, which is a protective mechanism against instability and re-tear. Um, and is likely one of the reasons why the re-tear rate is lower than that in the hamstring group. Cons to the quad autograft, um, increased risk of arthrofibrosis and cyclops lesions. So some of our patients do um, develop significant scar tissue that limits their range of motion, need to be taken back to the operating room for lysis of adhesions and manipulation. Um, and this may be just because of the sheer size of the quad tendon. Um, and then in those patients who have the quad with the bone block, they do have that small 1.3% risk of patella fracture, similar to the, the BTB group. And here's just another picture of the quad graft compared to the native ACL. And I hope I sold you on why we like it. <laughs> and now I'll just briefly touch on the IT band autograft. So this is a great option for our very small, very young patients. Both Dr. Vaughn and Dr. Menzer have had a couple nine, 10 year old ACL tears in the last year um, and they've done well with the IT band autograph. So the IT band is harvested from the lateral side of the knee. It's kept intact distally at Gertie's tubercle and then um, harvested with a tendon stripper approximately sutured. And then you can see on this graphic, the IT band loops around, comes through the knee, underneath the femur, under the intermeniscal ligament, and then is sutured to the periosteum on the anterior side of the tibia. So um, the ideal patient is younger than 11 or 12 years old, prepubescent, small, just our really little kids that probably can't tolerate some of the pain with drilling bone tunnels in an in a ACL surgery. So pros, no bone, bone tunnel drilling necessary. This completely avoids growth plates. We don't have to worry about growth abnormalities in these really young kids um, and less pain, better tolerance. Um, and then cons. 
these patients do get a cosmetic defect in the lateral thigh in the area of the harvest. So because we're taking such a large portion of the IT band, there is just a divot in their lateral thigh and it's sometimes very obvious, especially if the patients are very small. But overall, our patients have done very well with this and it's a great option for young kids. And just, just wanna briefly review graft options by age group. So again, if you're referring a patient to us, you'll kind of know what options they're gonna be given. Um, so our very young patients, younger than 11-ish, IT band or a physial sparing hamstring are going to be the best options for them. The in between patients, 12 to 13 ish, who um, are not quite within that two years of skeletal maturity range, they should be offered all soft tissue options. So, hamstring, quad soft tissue, or IT band if it's maybe a very small 12 year old. Um, but overall, hamstring and, and quad are the best options for these patients. And then within two years of skeletal maturity and beyond, so around age 14 plus, hamstring, quad with or without bone block, um, and patellar tendon. So quad, really it'll just kind of depend A, which surgeon they're referred to. So like I said, Dr. Menzer prefers to do with a bone block, Dr. Vaughn prefers to do without, but they both can do both. So factors that will determine which one they're offered are you know age, whether they're a contact athlete and patient and surgeon preference. Um, and then yeah, the, the BTB is always a great option for these patients as well. And here are my sources. And that's it, here's my future athlete. Um, at the time that I recorded this, the Suns were up two to one in the finals. So I hope that we ended up winning um, and please feel free to contact me if there are any questions. Thank you. Well, we we left on a sad note there at the end of that at that the end of that talk for the. Uh, oh, that, that hurts. <laughs> uh, it hurts. So uh, painful. Yes, but that the pictures in that were were awesome. Thank you so much, Morgan. That was really uh, crystal clear as to uh, kind of what the options are and the benefits. Um, I did see a question here, but I wasn't sure if it was one hundred percent for the ACL or. Um, the uh, tibial spine. So the, the question was from uh, Dr. Saab, uh, what is return to play for PT that's treated successfully non-op? So I'm not sure um, if that's like a partial ACL uh, or uh, a tibial spine. That was up pretty early. So I think that was to Dr. Menzer's uh, lecture. Okay. So, so non- non-operative treatment for tibial spine. I, I basically do it the same way. So if they're immobilized, I typically keep them extended and mobilized for about a month. Um, then we get x-rays. And so my return to play is very similar when it's non-operative to an operative. So when I see radiographic union on the x-rays, then is when I let them start kind of jogging and returning to play. It's typically still around, you know, three, three plus months. The problem with that is it just takes it it's a little bit longer to get them moving. I feel it's a little bit higher risk of arthrofibrosis. So usually their first month is of immobilization. We check x-rays, we start getting them moving, it takes them a while to get it moving. And then I let them start advancing from there. You know, one question I have um, regarding the different graphs, I know um, we may not have the data, but I'm curious if you do know, are we seeing any difference in the motion lab in terms of um, improvement in, in strength and agility with uh, objective data difference between graft or at different time points at all? I, I'll, I'll start this one. Maybe, um, maybe Dr. Vaughn, you can kind of chime in. Um, so most of my patients that have gone through the motion lab have been quads. Um, and so I don't really have the comparison data between the earlier treatments with my, my patients. Um, but one thing I have noticed in the, in the motion lab is that people think that the quad's still going to, going to be so weak, given that we take part of the quad for quad tendon for the graft. And I haven't actually noticed that I still find that in reviewing these, the hamstring is still, still weaker than the quad. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping to kind of put that out there at some point, but I haven't actually investigated it um, officially yet. It's just kind of what a, a trend that I'm seeing. So I, I think it actually does pretty, 
you know, patients still see lots of weakness in that surgical side. Um, but I don't know that the, the quad harvest uh, correlates so much with quad weakness as it does just, um, you know, generalized weakness following ACL recovery and hamstrings still continue to be so weak following the surgery. Yeah, I'd agree. Uh, it's something that we're looking at now. We don't have any, we don't have the exact data on that yet, but my experience has been the uh, same as Dr. Menzer's is it really seems even with a quad graft that one, they get their quad strength or get their muscular strength back faster than they do on a hamstring. And most of my patients that have deficits after a quad tendon reconstruction, the deficits with the hamstring more common and which would indicate likely that they came in with a, a a weak hamstring pre-op, I would guess, or may that contribute to the tear. That's certainly not, not scientific data, but at the same time, it, it's a concern, and especially with the hamstrings offering additional resistance to that anterior translation of the tibia uh, that causes an ACL tear. So, um, but then also just recovering faster and, uh, you know, we're getting the muscular strength uh, back faster. And, and I think most people know this, but one benefit I think that we have to our, pro, our sports program at uh, PCH is having that motion lab. So around six months. And then uh, again, for some of our patients at a year out, we're having the patients come in and uh, we're able to do three, 3D imaging and use a Biodex machine to check their strength uh, under comparative conditions and being able to determine, are they ready, not only time wise uh, to allow healing of that graft, but are they ready functionally and uh, that gives us a lot of information at that six months to say, are you ready or are there different muscular groups you need to train or different uh, balance or, uh, or strength training? So a, a real benefit, I think, to our program. And that can be used with any patient, you know, not just from our program, although I think that's primarily where we're doing it now. You know, one question um, I was curious about, and I'm sure it's just anecdotal or, um, you know, you we're not blinded to know who has what, but... Um, actually, for you, Kayla, um, do you see any differences, um, you know, and how the patients are mentally? Uh, do you feel like they, they seem to progress differently? I, I guess you don't really know that they don't, you know, you know what graph they have. So um, just curious if you see any differences there. Um, not typically by the time they get to the six month mark. Um, we try to incorporate some of their plyometrics and jumping, starting with double leg and then advancing to single leg just after the four month. So by the time they get to that six month gate lab that everybody's doing the plyometric things comparably and equally. Um, I did have one of the IT band graphs and he kind of had some odd swelling just in the lateral aspect of his leg. But other than that, he has done amazing because he preserved both the quads and the hamstring strength that he had coming in um, to therapy. Um, the quad graft kids tend to have a little bit of a hiccup when they start running, like when we're starting to progress more of that closed kinetic chain, um, either split stance squatting or single leg squatting. Um, they complain a little bit more of that like um, muscle related weakness um, and pain with those things. So they just experience a little more like anterior, anterior medial knee pain, trying to get through some of those strength um, pieces of the program. But um, by the time we get to the plyometric part, it seems like everybody's doing those things a little more uh, comparably just across the board, depending on, you know, their athletic ability before and. Cool. Good information. Thank you. All right. Well, why don't we finish this up with our uh, newest addition to the program, Dr. Gately here. Um, we're going to talk about, I believe, um, common derm dermatologic conditions in wrestling. Um, if uh, people have to uh, dip off uh, for whatever reason, just remember to keep a lookout on your email for the survey that'll be sent out uh, so that you can get your CME. But um, we will uh, stick around afterwards or whoever can if there's any questions um, for Dr. Gately, but also for the rest of the, 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 the talks, um, we can all answer for each other. So um, with that, we'll get going and, and finish off the day. 
Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Gately. I am one of the primary care sports medicine physicians here at Phoenix Children's. And today we're gonna to talk about some dermatologic infections in high school wrestlers. So the primary goals today are to discuss some of the common skin infections seen in wrestlers, review some of the treatment strategies, discuss return to play guidelines specifically for high school athletes because collegiate athletes have their own set of return to play guidelines, and then talk a little bit about how we can prevent these infections in our wrestlers, because that's really the key to decreasing some of these outbreaks. So here are a couple pictures of high school wrestling that I found online. And as you can see here, compared to other sports, wrestling has a very high amount of direct skin to skin contact, both by the nature of the sport itself and by the uniforms that they wear. And this high amount of physical contact between athletes puts them at increased risk for skin infections compared to other sports like cross country. So in addition to that physical contact between athletes, other risks of infectious disease in sport include any shared equipment. So athletes who share pads, towels, water bottles, or even who walk around barefoot in locker rooms or changing rooms, any contact with certain athletic surfaces like mats or weight room equipment, and these are not insignificant issues for our athletes. One study showed that um, skin and soft tissue infections were associated with 10 to 15% of time loss injuries among collegiate athletes, which is a pretty significant amount. So this was a study done that was looking at the incident rate of skin infections by high school sport from the 2009-2010 school year through the 2013-2014 school year. And this study was published in the journal of the American Academy of Dermatology. So in this study, they found that boys wrestling, as you can see in this table here, certainly had the highest number of infections, and then it had the highest incidence rate of skin infections as well. And that rate and overall number was significantly higher than the next highest sport, which was boys football. So this is definitely a problem among wrestlers, both male and female, although they just looked at boys wrestling for this study. So hopefully this information in the talk will be relevant to you, either in your primary care practice or certainly if you're an athletic trainer seeing these athletes on a daily basis. The next graph kind of breaks down which type of infections that they saw in these sports. So you can see that in things like soccer or volleyball, it was 100% bacterial infections. However, if you look down at that boys wrestling category, you're looking more at bacterial infections, tinea, herpes, molluscum, things that you're not necessarily seeing in the other sports. Arizona had its own outbreak of skin infections in 2014, and this outbreak was traced back to a wrestling tournament that had been held at a high school in January, where they hosted 24 schools with almost 170 wrestlers. From that tournament, 47 cases of skin lesions were identified, 37 of which were confirmed. You can see that the majority of the athletes either had impetigo or herpes gladiatorum. And this outbreak was linked to two wrestlers who reported participating in the tournament with uncovered active lesions, one of whom had herpes and one of whom had impetigo. So you can see that just two wrestlers showing up to a tournament can lead to a lot of different skin conditions in these athletes if we're not doing a good job diagnosing, treating, and holding athletes out when they need to be. This is just a picture of the NFHS form, um, and this is the release for a wrestler to participate with a skin lesion. So if you're a primary care provider, sports medicine provider, athletic trainer, you've probably come across this form. And essentially, if you're seeing someone in your clinic, um, you're going to put down what you think the diagnosis is, the location and number of lesions that they currently have, what medication they're on to treat it, and then when the treatment started and when they can return to participation. And the earliest date they can return to participation is not necessarily something you have to have memorized because the second half of that form goes through their minimum treatment guidelines before athletes can return based on what type of infection you think they have. So this is a pretty helpful part of the form um, and we use it pretty regularly for athletes. This is just some wise advice that I received um, when I had the honor of doing skin checks for a wrestling tournament for high schoolers. He said, if you wouldn't touch it without gloves, they can't participate. And that's a pretty good rule to live by in general if you're seeing athletes, especially wrestlers with skin conditions or infections. 
So we're going to start off with a case here and then we'll kind of move through the rest of the conditions and we'll end with some prevention strategies. So let's picture this scenario. It's Friday afternoon and you're seeing a 15 year old male wrestler in clinic for a rash. He says he's not having any fever or sore throat, but he has a really big meet tomorrow and he wants to know if he can participate. Based on the picture below, what would your diagnosis be and would you allow him to compete? So I'll let you take a look at this for a second. So this is a good picture of herpes gladiatorum. And you can see another picture of it in the top right slide or part of the slide. Herpes gladiatorum is a viral infection generally caused by HSV type one, primarily transmitted by skin to skin contact. The term herpes gladiatorum was originally coined in 1964, but it didn't become used widely until after a report in 1989, when a 28 day wrestling camp had an outbreak of herpes gladiatorum and was forced to close down early. How does herpes present? So anywhere from four to 11 days from the onset of exposure, the athlete will start to develop skin lesions. And generally these lesions look like small clusters of fluid filled vesicles on an erythematous base. So we'll go back here, which you can kind of see there and even better on this first picture. And these lesions are most commonly seen on the head, face, and neck. These vesicles will continue to develop anywhere from seven to 10 days before becoming dry. And the athletes can also report systemic symptoms like fever, sore throat, joint pain, as well as a prodromal period of pain or itching potentially. Herpes gladiatorum is commonly missed initially. So I've seen athletes before where they were diagnosed with impetigo and then when the treatment wasn't successful, they were then diagnosed with herpes and started on treatment. So sometimes these athletes are started on their appropriate treatment later. And if they continue to participate during that time, if we don't have the right diagnosis, that can contribute to spread among other athletes. It's also important to note that ocular involvement can occur. And if there's suspicion, these athletes should be immediately referred to ophthalmology for an evaluation because there is a risk of blindness associated with herpes. Uh, testing to confirm the diagnosis is not always necessary if the history and the clinical exam are consistent with herpes gladiatorum. So the primary treatment is valacyclovir, one gram twice a day for seven to 10 days. And then these athletes are held out of practice or competition for a significant amount of time. So an athlete with a primary infection has to be held out for at least 10 days. And then that number increases to 14 days if they've had any systemic symptoms like fever or lymphadenopathy. They can return to contact only after they've met that 10 or 14 day period of treatment. Plus they've had no new lesions for 48 hours and all of their old lesions are scabbed over. Once an athlete has had a primary herpes infection, they're at risk for recurrent outbreaks. Generally a recurrent infection is gonna be shorter in duration and there are fewer vesicles and systemic symptoms are less common as well. The treatment for this is valacyclovir 500 milligrams twice a day for seven days. And then the return to play is different as well. So these athletes can go back to practice or competition after five days of oral antiviral treatment. Again, as long as there's no new lesions and all of their current lesions are scabbed over. Some people may consider uh, prophylactically treating for herpes either during the wrestling season or during wrestling camps when outbreaks or transmission can occur. The dosing for prophylaxis would be valacyclovir 500 milligrams twice a day, just for the duration of the season or the duration of that camp. And this may help reduce the risk of an outbreak by decreasing the risk of virus transmission and acquisition between athletes. Another common infection we see in wrestlers is impetigo. So this is a highly contagious bacterial infection that's generally caused by staph or strep. It's primarily transmitted through skin to skin contact, but we can also see it transmitted from towels or shared sports equipment. Classically, we describe these as honey crusted lesions that appear in clusters, generally on the face or on the extremities. Impetigo can be treated with topical or oral treatment. So topical treatment includes mupirocin ointment three times a day. And generally this is reserved for infections with a small number of lesions in a localized area. Oral treatment can include Keflex, Kinda, Clinda, excuse me, or erythromycin, but it's important to note that even though topical treatment may be appropriate for impetigo, for a wrestler to return to play, they have to have 72 hours of oral treatment. So even if you're seeing them 
and it's an impetigo infection that doesn't have a lot of lesions, those athletes still need to be given an oral antibiotic in order to go back. Again, they can't have any actively draining lesions and all of their current lesions must be scabbed over with no new lesions in the prior 48 hours and all lesions should be covered with a bio-occlusive dressing. MRSA infections are another infection that we worry about in our athletes. And generally this will present as cellulitis or as a skin abscess. A lot of the time this can be confused with a spider or an insect bite initially, but they can lead to invasive disease like bacteremia or osteomyelitis. Some risk factors for MRSA infection include any breaks in the skin, so maybe associated with turf burns in football players or trauma like body shaving, close skin-to-skin -skin contact, and then sharing equipment or clothing. The treatment for a purulent MRSA infection, so an abscess, includes incision and drainage with a wound culture and then empiric antibiotic treatment until your culture results are available. So you can treat with either Bactrim or clindamycin plus topical mupirocin ointment until those culture results come back. In order to return to play from a MRSA infection, the athletes need to have finished at least 72 hours of antibiotic therapy with lesions resolving. They can't have any wet lesions and all lesions need to have well adhered scabs. Those scab dry lesions can then be covered with a bio-occlusive dressing to allow participation. Folliculitis is another condition you may come across either in clinic or in the training room. And this is an infection of the hair follicles that's often caused by staph aureus. Usually we see this in areas of high friction and perspiration, and it can be treated with Keflex or Dicloxacillin for seven to 14 days. In order to return to play with folliculitis again, the athlete needs to have been on oral antibiotics for at least 72 hours. All lesions need to be dry with a scab and they can't have had any new lesions for the preceding 48 hours. Tinea gladiatorum or ringworm is another really common infection seen in wrestlers. And this is a fungal infection due to dermatophytes. Again, primarily spread by skin to skin contact and it affects a really high proportion of high school wrestlers each season. Each season. It can be seen on the head where it's called tinea capitis or on the body where we call it tinea corporis. And in wrestlers, it can be difficult to diagnose because either it presents really early during skin checks where maybe it's hard to tell what it is, or it presents later and some of the lesions have been abraded during contact. So it may not have that classic ringworm appearance to it. Tinea corporis is ringworm that's seen on the body. And usually we describe it as a round erythematous scaly plaque that has raised borders and also sometimes has a central clearing in the middle. Treatment includes a topical antifungal for at least two weeks. And then that topical should be applied for an additional week after the lesion has resolved. And below you can see some options for your topical antifungals. Tinea capitis is seen on the head, and usually it's described as a patchy erythematous scale that can cause patches of alopecia or hair loss with this black dot appearance. And that black dot appearance occurs when hair shafts break off at the level of the scalp. So the treatment for tinea capitis or diffuse tinea corporis includes oral medication anywhere from two to eight weeks. There is a potential side effect of hepatotoxicity, so lab monitoring may be required for these athletes. And your treatment options include griseofulvin or terbenafine plus ketoconazole 2% shampoo for tinea capitis. In order to return to play, these athletes again need 72 hours of treatment prior to participation for tinea corporis, and they need 14 days of oral treatment for tinea capitis. Once the lesion is no longer considered contagious, it can be covered with a bio-occlusive dressing and the athlete can be allowed to participate. Molluscum is another common viral infection we can see in wrestlers. It's often asymptomatic, but occasionally it can cause pain or itching. And again, it's primarily spread by skin-to-skin -skin contact, generally seen on the trunk, the face, and the extremities. And they usually look like small flesh-colored or pinkish papules with this central umbilication or depression. There are multiple ways to treat molluscum, but for wrestlers specifically, the treatment needs to include curatage. And then after the lesion is curatage, it can be covered with a bio-occlusive dressing and the athlete can participate immediately. Baruchae or warts are another infection that we can see in athletes. And these are caused by the HPV virus. They're generally painless, although plantar warts can be painful. 
and they most commonly occur on the hands, the feet, and around the nails. Warts are differentiated from calluses or corns by the presence of black dots, which are blood vessels, when they're pared down. So when you are describing these warts, plantar warts are sharp, well-defined lesions with a smooth collar of thickened keratin, like you can see on this picture in the top right. And Bruge vulgaris are firm, rough papules or nodules, and these are generally seen on the fingers. Risk factors for transmitting or getting warts include sharing equipment and then common shower areas, especially if athletes aren't wearing sandals or flip-flops. There are multiple treatment options for warts, so they can be treated with cryotherapy with liquid nitrogen, salicylic acid or tretinoin, and even surgical or laser removal. There are no limitations on participation for high school athletes with warts. If it looks like the wart may be prone to bleeding, then it should be covered up. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about scabies and head lice. So these are less commonly seen than some of the other infections we've talked about, but they can certainly still occur. So both scabies and head lice are caused by ectoparasites, which are parasites that live on or in the skin. And they're transmitted by skin-to-skin -skin contact, as well as by infested fomites like towels or bedding. These things can be difficult to diagnose and treat because the symptoms may not present for three to four weeks. So this is a picture of a little human itch mite on the top right. And basically what happens in scabies is these mites sort of burrow under the skin. And then as they move along, you'll get this papular pruritic rash. So it's a very itchy rash that's often seen in the web spaces of fingers and toes. And again, you may see burrowing tracks in the skin. Treatment includes topical permethrin cream for the athlete and also for everyone else who lives in the home who was probably exposed. Head lice is generally diagnosed when an athlete complains about intense itching and hair covered parts of the body like the head. And to diagnose lice, you really need a direct visualization of living lice, which you can see in this picture on the lower left. And these are a picture of adult lice on a comb or of nits, which are unhatched eggs. So the bottom right picture, the one that looks like darker brown sesame seeds here, those are unhatched eggs or nits. And then this clear coating here is after the nits have hatched what it looks like. The treatment for lice includes over-the-counter medicated shampoo, either with permethrin or pyrethrin. And sometimes a second application may be needed anywhere from about nine to 10 days after the initial application. For both of these conditions, athletes and their families need to make sure that they're cleaning their bedding, their towels, and any other infested fomites. You wanna wash at warm to hot water temperatures with regular laundry detergent, and then just make sure you're drying everything well. These athletes can return to play after 24 hours of appropriate treatment. Conjunctivitis is another condition we may see in wrestlers, and it's either a bacteria a viral or bacterial infection of the conjunctiva, but it can also be caused by allergies or sometimes by certain chemicals that irritate the eye. They can be easily transmitted between athletes and a bacterial infection is generally associated with discharge. So if you look at the eye on our right here, you can see some drainage. So that's more likely to be a bacterial conjunctivitis than viral. Athletes may also report feeling a gritty or a foreign body sensation, like something is in the eye and they may have itching, pain, or photophobia, which is light sensitivity. The treatment for conjunctivitis, if it's bacterial in nature, includes topical ophthalmic antibiotics, generally either drops or ointment. And return to play can occur after an athlete has had 24 hours of treatment, and also they have no discharge from the eye. This is a graph from Andy Peterson's article about infectious disease and contact sports, and it breaks down the guidelines for participation pretty well based on whether the athlete is in college, which would be under this NCAA column, or whether the athlete is in high school, which is under this NFHS column. So if you don't wanna to refer to that skin lesion form that we talked about initially, this may be a good graph to refer to because it lets you know when athletes can return to play and what kind of treatment they need. Now we're gonna talk briefly about prevention because that's probably the biggest issue with a lot of these infections. And we really need to be educating these athletes about personal hygiene. So making sure that they're washing their hands regularly, that they're showering immediately after practices or competitions, 
that they're washing their uniforms and their practice gear every single day. And certainly that they avoid sharing things like water bottles, mouth guards, towels, or helmets, as we know that those can be transmitters for some of these infections. They also shouldn't be sharing soap, sponges, razors, or hair trimmers. And then daily skin checks before practice, ideally by an athletic trainer, but even by a coach, just to make sure that, that if there is a suspicious skin lesion, we can get it checked out appropriately by a healthcare provider before they continue to participate. We also really wanna make sure that athletic departments are cleaning their facilities and equipment regularly. So wrestling mats should be sanitized and disinfected before and after use. And I was talking to a mom recently who has two high school wrestling athletes. And she mentioned that during this past season, because um, cleaning protocols were so much more stringent during COVID, or maybe not more stringent, but were being followed more closely, they seem to have a decreased rate of skin infections in these wrestlers. So we know that these things can help. I think it's just hard to stick to for an entire season, even though it's really important. We also wanna make sure that athletes are wearing rubber soled flip-flops or sandals in communal showers. And we want to make sure that each potential skin disease or infection gets checked by a doctor or a healthcare professional. So the main take-home points of this talk are that most skin infections seen in athletes are spread by skin-to-skin -skin contact, although we know that some can be caused by shared equipment as well. For high school athletes, most of these infections will require at least 24 hours of treatment before return to practice or competition. Moist or draining lesions cannot be covered for practice or competition. And prevention is really the key to decreasing the spread of these infections. So the more that we can talk to our athletes and our coaches about how important it is to practice personal hygiene, but also to keep the area that we use and the equipment that we use clean, the better off we are. And hopefully we can decrease the rate of some of these skin infections in our wrestlers. So here are some of my references. If you guys wanted to do a little bit more reading on your own, and I hope that this was an informative talk for you. Thanks so much for your attention and I hope you have a great day. All right, well, we're coming down to the last Q&A. So thanks, Dr. Gately, that was perfect. Um, you know, I don't see any questions down at the bottom but I, I do have a question. Um, so I, I'm curious when in the real world you're, you're covering a wrestling tournament and um, you know, you're asked to look at something, you know, maybe this is regions or whatever, um, what, like, is this regulated by the AIA or what have you? Because what I found is sometimes, right, like they'll come with a note saying, hey, I'm cleared, right? And you know what the, the clearance truly is. And then, you know, you're kind of, um, you know, conflicting with another opinion. And so is there, it's, it's just more the physician is enforcing or the providers enforcing the um, rules that are already in place. They, they're not just making up what they feel is the right amount of times. Am I understanding this correctly? Are you referring to the doctor who writes the note to clear them? Right, that may not be consistent with the, the recommendation you gave. And, and I'm assuming these recommendations are coming from, I mean, they're, you know, recommendations coming from science, but they are adopted by whatever uh, athletic association. Um, it's not just kind of the physician deciding whether they want to follow that or not. Correct. All of those guidelines on that NFHS return to play form for a skin lesion should be followed. So like if I was covering a competition and someone came in with a clearance note, but it's obvious they have herpes and they've been on one day of treatment, I wouldn't let that kid participate. Right. And it's not that you're like, deciding on your own, you're, you're just enforcing what is already put in play. Correct. Yeah. Or if someone came with a note that had a diagnosis that maybe it doesn't look like that anymore, or especially if it seems like a moist or a draining lesion, then I would probably pull them from competition at that point. I really think that quote at the beginning is the best advice I may have ever gotten in fellowship about covering those tournaments. Because I think as physicians, you want to diagnose and figure out what everything is. But he kindly reminded me, you know, that's not really our job here. It's not a derm clinic, um, but more just to make sure that we're not transmitting these skin lesions between athletes if they look active. Any other thoughts in the group? 
where you guys had to see those pictures after lunch. <laughs> um, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any major questions. That was pretty, pretty clear cut. I think I just, uh, sometimes I struggle when, you know, you're like in, in postseason play, you know, and people are coming with these last minute questions and, and it's, you know, Hey, I, I'm supposed to win States this year. Um, but I'm out, you know, can I be cleared type of thing. And, and I think it's good for, you know, athletic trainers, athletic directors, everybody to kind of relay that, you know, it's, it's not like an individual decision. There there's criteria guidelines that we're, we're implementing um, to kind of make sure everybody's safe. So. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, if we don't have any other questions, it looks like um, we are done for the day. We'll send those emails out um, with the, uh, evaluations. Uh, thanks to all the speakers and uh, IT and Megan and everybody for uh, making this a successful uh, uh, conference. Um, and uh, hopefully, if you guys need anything from us, send us an email, give us a call. Uh, otherwise, go enjoy the day uh, and uh, we'll see you next year. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.